Hello everyone, this is Michael from Pixelogic's social media and marketing team. I want to introduce to you a small fun segment we'll be showing you throughout the ZBrush Summit this year called 2020 ZBrush Highlights. Throughout the day, we'll be showing you some of the most popular ZBrush creations from throughout the year from ZBrush Central, our Instagram, Facebook, and more, while telling you a little bit about the piece, the artists behind it, and where you can see more of that artist's work. Be sure to check out the link in each 2020 ZBrush highlight video to visit our exclusive ZBrush Central thread cataloging all of this year's highlights. Enjoy the summit! The Form 3 has helped bring people's wildest dreams to reality. But sometimes you need to dream bigger. We designed the Form 3L to bring the biggest dreams to life, so we wanted to put it to the ultimate test. Could we use the 3L to print our flagship 3D printer? Introducing Form 3L, so you can print a dream within a dream maker.
Introducing ZBrush Core Mini. ZBrush Core Mini is a free mini version of ZBrush Core designed to give artists young and old the ability to experience ZBrush's powerful digital sculpting. ZBrush Core Mini contains a mini set of tools, allowing for the focus to be on artistic creation rather than complex tool sets. Starting from either a sphere or a stone block, you can sculpt from your imagination using eight of the most popular ZBrush sculpting brushes. Experimentation is the key when using ZBrush Core Mini. Add to the surface of the model or cut into it using brushes such as clay buildup. Smooth out areas that are rough by simply holding shift or even use the snake hook brush to quickly pull out arms, legs, or even hair. After sculpting, you may want to share your design to the world or even export it for 3D printing. Choose a different material and color to give your model a different look, then click the Export Image button to export out a 2D image in various formats. For 3D printing, simply click the Export for 3D Printing button to export out a OBJ version of the mesh. After this is exported, you can open the file in your favorite slicer and print away. Now in addition to the items already mentioned, ZBrush Core Mini adds a new way to share your creations with others around the world. When clicking the Save As button, you'll be able to save your model as an Image 3D. The Image 3D GIF and Image 3D PNG formats allow you to save your files as standard GIF and PNG images. When these images are viewed in other applications, they will just be displayed as a 2D image. However, if you open these images inside of ZBrush Core Mini, model data will be extracted and the mesh will be loaded into the software. With this technology, you can now simply save out an image 3D file and post it on your favorite website or social media account. Other users of ZBrush Core Mini can now simply download the image and have access to the model. ZBrush Core Mini is not graphic card dependent. It's free to download and it's available for Windows and Mac OS. Download ZBrush Core Mini today and join the digital sculpting creation experience that is ZBrush. Hey guys! Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to the stream. Hello and welcome. Welcome to the stream. Good evening. Hello everyone. What is up, man? How you doing, brother? What's everybody doing? Hello, everybody. What's up, ZBrush friends? Hello from China. What's up? Saudi Arabia. All right. Awesome. I see we have new people Good to have you guys in here today we're going to be doing without much ado let's begin yes
Hello everyone, this is Michael from Pixelogic's social media and marketing team. I want to introduce to you a small fun segment we'll be showing you throughout the ZBrush Summit this year called 2020 ZBrush Highlights. Throughout the day, we'll be showing you some of the most popular ZBrush creations from throughout the year from ZBrush Central, our Instagram, Facebook, and more, while telling you a little bit about the piece, the artist behind it, and where you can see more of that artist's work. Be sure to check out the link in each 2020 ZBrush highlight video to visit our exclusive ZBrush Central thread cataloging all of this year's highlights. Enjoy the summit! The Form 3 has helped bring people's wildest dreams to reality. But sometimes you need to dream bigger. We designed the Form 3L to bring the biggest dreams to life, so we wanted to put it to the ultimate test. Could we use the 3L to print our flagship 3D printer? Introducing Form 3L, so you can print a dream within a dream maker.
Introducing ZBrush Core Mini. ZBrush Core Mini is a free mini version of ZBrush Core designed to give artists young and old the ability to experience ZBrush's powerful digital sculpting. ZBrush Core Mini contains a mini set of tools, allowing for the focus to be on artistic creation rather than complex tool sets. Starting from either a sphere or a stone block, you can sculpt from your imagination using eight of the most popular ZBrush sculpting brushes. Experimentation is the key when using ZBrush Core Mini. Add to the surface of the model or cut into it using brushes such as clay buildup. Smooth out areas that are rough by simply holding shift or even use the snake hook brush to quickly pull out arms, legs, or even hair. After sculpting, you may want to share your design to the world or even export it for 3D printing. Choose a different material and color to give your model a different look, then click the export image button to export out a 2D image in various formats. For 3D printing, simply click the Export for 3D Printing button to export out a OBJ version of the mesh. After this is exported, you can open the file in your favorite slicer and print away. Now in addition to the items already mentioned, ZBrush Core Mini adds a new way to share your creations with others around the world. When clicking the Save As button, you'll be able to save your model as an image 3D. The Image 3D GIF and Image 3D PNG formats allow you to save your files as standard GIF and PNG images. When these images are viewed in other applications, they will just be displayed as a 2D image. However, if you open these images inside of ZBrush Core Mini, model data will be extracted and the mesh will be loaded into the software. With this technology, you can now simply save out an image 3D file and post it on your favorite website or social media account. Other users of ZBrush Core Mini can now simply download the image and have access to the model. ZBrush Core Mini is not graphic card dependent. It's free to download and it's available for Windows and Mac OS. Download ZBrush Core Mini today and join the digital sculpting creation experience that is ZBrush. Hey guys! Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to the stream. Hello and welcome. Welcome to the stream. Good evening. Hello everyone. What is up, man? How you doing, brother? What's everybody doing? Hello, everybody. What's up, ZBrush friends? Konnawa, domo, Sorry, kun naruka desu. Hey, minasan, ohayou gozaimasu. Привет, привет всем. Hola. Hello from China. What's up? Saudi Arabia. All right. Awesome. Let's see, we have new people to have you guys in here today we're going to be doing without much ado let's begin yes
Here we go. <laughs> day day three. I got it. I got it. You got it. You got it already going. I got it. You know, by day four, I'll have the right hand going up at the right time and not this. <laughs> no. So, so should we tell them how you get that timer to run? Because this is, this is I find, hilarious. So okay. there's a little remote. Oh, here you go. The battery in it is dead. So Paul takes apart his key fab, steals yeah. the battery out of it, and uh -huh. puts it in there to get the timer going. Uh -huh. And then he has to put the battery back so we can go home. Mm -hmm. I just slept here last night. I mean, you I, didn't leave. You did not. I didn't leave. leave. I just. <laughs> well, technically, we didn't leave because we didn't leave out of our system for streaming. Per technically, so I was still in it the whole night too. So, you know, welcome everybody to day three, as Joseph said. Right today, oh boy! If you guys enjoyed yesterday and the sculpt off, you're going to enjoy today just as much, if not more. Right? We starting. We're starting the day off with the Mandalorian people. Okay, mm -hmm. Star Wars, Star Wars, Star Wars, Star Wars, right? We got the Hasbro team coming up. They're going to be sharing how they went through the process of creating the Razor Quest, Razor Crest, right? And also going through their Star Wars Black series. Mm -hmm. So we've got Paul and Tom from Hasbro. We're going to be following up uh, with Andrew Clement and his team showing their studio. Again, we're taking advantage of these webcams, man, it's, right? Yeah, you got to do this. Then it's going to be, I, I, I feel it's called, it's called Zebra's Top Tips, but I feel like it's the Joseph and Paul go crazy show along with our artists. So we have videos from our streamers, the tips our Zebra Masters, top sharing tips. tips. What? Go, you top go ahead. Tips. Top, top tips. tips. Top tips. So every tip is in 15 minutes or less until it involves me and Joseph because we both talk a lot. So, but. That's the last segment of that the today. So we've got three segments today, but that last segment is over three hours long. And if you guys were there yesterday, I, I saw a lot of people really enjoyed it. Trust me, now that we've got even more time today, we've got twice as many videos to share with you, which means twice as many tips, twice as many things going on, right? So this will be a lot of fun for sure. I also want to highlight because again, I don't know who's been watching these previous days. We get new people every day jumping in because not everyone like us can come every single day. So we've got, um, let me uh, let me pull it up here. Uh, Kyle, can you, uh, let me share my screen here for you. All right, I want to share, I want to share my live. screen now. Let's do it live for a minute here before we bring in the Hasbro boys here in 10 minutes. So we do have ZBrush on sale, okay? So it is a promotional summit special offer. Again, if you're not currently a user or you are a user and you're using professionally, but you don't have a license at home, this is the best time to do it. We don't put ZBrush on sale, really. This is the only time we would ever do something like that. And it's, and it's, uh, the summits is one, once a year, right? So mm -hmm. right now we're giving 20% off the Pretzel license, which again, we've given free upgrades for 20 plus years. We're going on year 21, okay? So you can also get in through subscription and we have a six month subscription and we have a month to month subscription. Now this is this 20% off is only for your first payment. Again, only, only for your first payment. I see the promotional codes already in there. You need a promotional coupon code to take advantage of this. So again, this is a six month one and this is month to month. Then I know we've got some ZBrush Core users. So, but if you're one even maybe get into ZBrush Core, it's 9.95 per month or right now, 20% off the perpetual license and it's 143.96. Right? And again, that's been given free upgrades since we released it, which my mind is in a big fog because of how many things we've released this year. I don't remember when we released ZBrush Core now. Was it last year? It's all a fog now. <laughs> ZBrush Core? Yeah. I, <laughs> when we released the 2021 version? No, just in period. No, it was no, it was like years ago, wasn't it? I don't yeah. even know anymore because I don't year, know either. It's been back to back to back to back to back to back to back. Yeah, updating, updating, updating. So it's like straps okay, on so, up, straps on straps. <laughs> so again, ZBrush Core special promotion offer, right? And for those that are already in ZBrush Core, take advantage of saving two hundred dollars right now to upgrade to the full version of ZBrush, okay? So for those ZBrush core users, you already are getting $100 off, but we're throwing another $100 
off for you for the ZBrush Summit. These, all these promotions end tomorrow, people. This is not gonna, you can't come back on like Friday and say, hey, can I still get the, the special? They, they all end tomorrow. So you have till tomorrow, 11.59 Los Angeles time. And again, for those that are just joining us, the times I always talk are Los Angeles time, Pacific Standard Time. When I say times for any of this, it's gonna be Los Angeles time. So make sure you check your time zones. Who's got people all around the world watching us right now? So make sure check those, okay? And then of course, there's always that ZBrush Core Mini, the brainchild of Joseph Drust. <laughs> yeah, there was a, there was a long this line Drust, this of others that Mini. also were yeah. looking for ZBrush Core Mini. I can't take this, credit for that. You are. I'm taking credit. I'm giving you and Dice K. Get you two were ones like we got to do this. This would be awesome. They were the two of the mm, front runners to get this out to you guys. So. Uh, hats off today. I'm wearing a hat today. I'm going to change up the head every day if I can. <laughs> every day, something different, right? <laughs> you had the hair yesterday. Today you oh, got a hat. You you wait until I'm what I bring tomorrow. Okay, you just wait, <laughs> especially during our presentation. Oh boy. So with that said, we've got a lot of presentations also still to come. Obviously, we're at the beginning of today. So you guys want to visit our calendar, and you can get reminders here. So this is the best place. I'm going to put this in chat to be reminded about any presentations because we will email you uh, 24 hours before the presentation, which almost all presentations are getting closer than 24 hours now, uh, or an hour before, okay? So this is your schedule where you guys can go and look at any of the presentations individually. Like for example, Joseph and I are gonna be making a special presentation tomorrow, making some more announcements about upcoming version of ZBrush. That presentation is tomorrow at 4.30 p.m. So the summit is a, starts at a different time tomorrow. It starts at 4 p.m. tomorrow, okay? Los Angeles time. But you can get a reminder right here, and if you guys go to this, it'll have your time zone with all these countdowns and the times. And when you get a remind me, we're, it's based upon your computer's time zone. So this is a great place for you so you don't miss out on any of the presentations. You definitely make sure you want to be part of, but I, I'm, why are you not just sitting in your chair for seven hours like me and Joseph? Like, why would you not do that? You should, right? Right, Dressed? Back yeah. me up on this, right? So again, promotional, okay? Take advantage of this while you can. Again, this ends tomorrow. There are coupon codes for the subscriptions. We're putting it in chat so you guys have it. I don't drink coffee, you're right. I don't. I don't. <laughs> Dress, how many cups have you had this morning? Uh, three. Three? Yeah. Are you serious? Yeah. Holy moly. I, how are you not bouncing off the wall right now? I can drink a cup of coffee and then go to sleep. No. Yeah, totally can. I don't, but isn't most people I talk to said, no, you can't. Wow. No. No, 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 no. No, thanks. No, thanks. No, thank you. I don't even <laughs> really drink any caffeine, in all honesty. The only time I have any caffeine would be maybe a tea. And I am, oh, there you go. I am having a tea as we go through this, just to keep the, the throat open, <clears throat> you know, and keep it going so I can be my normal loud and obnoxious things. And I haven't seen anybody complaining this year about my microphone because I'm not. <laughs> you're close enough, you're far enough away from it where it's not, <laughs> it's not as loud as normal. That's, that's because I just, I'm trying to, when I have the mic in my hand, I'm going to my David Dave Grohl. And it's like he eats the microphone when he sings, and it's like what I do. And I'm just like, yeah, I'm like Dave Grohl, kind of my inner Dave Grohl from Foo Fighters. Okay, don't worry about the red day about. Go ahead. Side tangent. I saw something about him uh, the other day, and he doesn't know how to read sheet music, supposedly. Dude, that guy's ridiculously talented, though. It's insane. You should yeah. watch documentaries on them if you've never. They have new music. I just heard on the way in today to work. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's one of my most favorite bands. Favorite. <laughs> If I could play music in this summit thing, that'd be one of my songs. You know, Just you know, over like, and over again. People come out in their own music. That I think mine would be fun. the mine would be the final countdown. I think that's, that's oh. where I'd go. Really? Wouldn't that be your exiting? It's music? exit and intro. It doesn't matter. <laughs> All right. <It's> both. <laughs> I know where you're going. Don't worry about the registration, people. We're uh, we're working on it. Uh, Dice K who is our colleague, will be with you guys in chat. Don't worry about it. We're not giving anything away right now until after this first presentation, okay? So hold on, just hold on a minute. It's, there's no, there's nothing to give away right now. So don't worry, you'll be able to, you'll be able to get in there, okay? So 
you know, we're, we're going to be starting off again. I got to show this. They're going to show it anyways, but darn, I just want you guys to get excited right now. <laughs> what are the details? What are the details? <laughs> oh, yeah. Look at that. Look at that. I know I, I still have been talking about this presentation for like, uh, it's been forever now. Like the, every day, this is what he does. We get in calls together and he pulls us up and he's like, look at this. Look oh, at this. Want. Well, look at the details. This is insane. <laughs> it's amazing. And there's only 13 hours left. Let me refresh to make sure this is the right time. Because these are, these are one-offs pretty much. 12 hours and 48 minutes for you to get one as well. And that's it. They're not going to, they're not, it's not like this is something they're going to put on the shelves to target people. Okay. No. This is for 40 year old toy. This is a 40 year old's toy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which really is, I like, you know, my wife goes, do you really, really need another one of those things? Where are you going to put it? This is why have your own office space people on the mantle, right on the kitchen oh, yeah. table. I'm you know, you out. have, you have Thanksgiving here in the U S instead of a cornucopia, you have a razor crest mm -hmm. right in the middle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna win that battle, buddy. Okay. <laughs> hey, by the way, Dress, where's your BB-8? It's it's hanging up in my house, but it's it's not in the main room. <laughs> <laughs> it's in a side room, but it, it's up. J Joseph made since we're in the Star Wars kick. Joseph made a full size BB-8, right? He 3D printed. He made it all in ZBrush. You made it light up it, too, right? Yeah, it took six. It took about six months for me to make that. Yeah, and he did the the the, the cables that shoot out of BB-8. Yep. So the minute Joseph's wife saw that, I was like, where are you, where are you going to put that? <laughs> <laughs> she I actually think... gave me the idea to suspend it from the ceiling, but it's cake. Oh, she did? So, yeah, that was. Oh, that was wow. Nice. Because I was like, I'm just going to put it on a stand in the middle of the living room. And she was like, oh, that would have been great. Yeah. That would have been great. None of the kids would have definitely knocked that over. No, not at all. <laughs> but the other thing, the other side thing with the BBA, this was before the, um, the movie came out. And so yeah. the first one. And so it was just all promotional stuff on them. And then so I did all this like lighting stuff um, with Raspberry Pis and had all this lighting effect and everything else. And so his eye, I had it doing like the Cylon thing. I had it doing like all these crazy blinks. Movie comes out. He has one red light out of all five of those. And that's it. That's all that happened in the entire movie. One light. And it just was on. <laughs> I spent all this time getting this, these lights to do all sorts of crazy stuff. And he had one light on mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, <laughs> the entire movie. Mm -hmm. Well, that leads me to, again, our presentations. We're starting off today with Hasbro and the Star Wars. So this is why we're on the Star Wars kick right now. Right? Then we're going to be uh, joining the team at Creative Character Engineering. And this is the team that they work on, like the boys. They work on TV shows. They work on movies. They use ZBrush to make even prosthetics. They make ZBrush to make costumes. They're all over the place. And then our ZBrush top tips, which is going to be over three hours today. We got twice as many videos to share. Okay, we got 12 videos today, 12 of them just full of tips from our artists, people like Maddie Spencer, people like Daniel Bell. Mike Thompson, Matt Thoreau, Steve Lord, Eamon Eckhart, Vinchar. Like, it's all over. the Guys, this is going to be awesome. And then, you know, we sprinkle always the crazy Paul and Joseph in this segment. And don't forget about tomorrow. Tomorrow we will be announcing the winners of the Sculpt Off. Okay? So tomorrow at 4 p.m. is when we kick off this streaming. Again, this is a p.m. time, Los Angeles time. And then, then, then the show begins where Joseph Dress is going to wow you all for an hour from 4.30 to 5.30. The tangents. With some new announcements. You know, everyone mark this down. Mark it down. And then we're going to roll right into more of Joseph Dress and Paul Gabry uh, in our ZBrush Top Tips. So look, you guys get us, just me and Joseph tomorrow for, what is this, from 4 to 7? Oh, How excited are you? How excited are you to have us for three and a half hours? <laughs> All right, man, that's going to be, well, it's even tonight too, today, you got it for like three, we're not going to end it too, there's no way, I, again, I don't see us ending it, sorry boys in the booth, really sorry, it's not going to happen, there's no way we're going to end at two o'clock today, <laughs> and then, speaking of the robots, we got Will Huff, who is using GBush to make life-size robots, right, this is where Joseph will be on his 10th cup of coffee, because coffee, he's mm -hmm. three hours in front of me, Right, but mm -hmm. this will wake him up because he's just like he just said all of his BB-8. That's exactly what Will Huff is doing. He's using yeah, ZBrush. It's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. And then we're gonna do some more toy stuff, which I love. 
Uh, I love me, love me some toys, right? So don't miss out on this, okay? We are going to be putting here in our Hasbro people here in a second. We're going to get rolling on them, okay? So again, visit this summit. Here, I'll put this link in here so you guys can have that. There you go. Let me put that in the old chat. So we're going to get the Hasbro guys in here. We're going to bring Paul and Tom in here, and we're going to get going on this Star Wars hour. I'm going to call it now, right? The Star Wars hour. We already started it off, right? So give us like 30 seconds to a minute here. We're going to bring in Tom and we're going to bring in Paul. All right. From Hasbro. This is going to be. Bam. Woo. Woo. <laughs> hey, guys. That. Hello, <laughs> boys. Hello Good there. To see you. Good to see you. Good to hear you. We got working mics. We got working video. We got working mics. I think so. Paul, you look dapper today. You get oh. you did a little comb and look good. Today. <laughs> he freshened oh. up. He cleans up nicely. Yeah. This, this yeah. whole thing? <laughs> you didn't have to do that for us, Paul. It's okay. Look, yeah. You know. It's all right. I like it. I like it. Well, everybody, this is obviously two of the gentlemen that are working in the Hasbro team, the part of the part of the modeling team. They worked on a lot of stuff at Hasbro. Uh, mm -hmm. so we've got Tom Rigo and Paul Bennett with us. Some of you might recognize Paul Bennett from last year's summit. Mm -hmm, he showed mm -hmm. you guys a great way of creating toy king and all the things that you guys would want to do with toys, moving around, manipulation, <laughs> right? Articulation. So boys, thank you for joining us today. Our pleasure. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Absolutely. This is we're excited. I've been hyping this up like no one's business. So no pressure. I've been hyping it up. No boy, pressure at all. Oh boy. Mm -hmm. I've been telling my my aunt. Did you pull the trigger? I, I, yeah. I've been telling my aunts, my uncles, my nieces, my daughter who doesn't care. You know, I just tell them, oh. you gotta watch, you gotta watch the Hasbro one. It's the Razor <laughs> Hello. What are you doing? Fantastic. I don't want to hear about my little pony right now. I want Razor Quest. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Awesome. Yeah. All right. So nice. are we gonna we're gonna be starting with Paul, right? For this and uh <clears throat> Getting going on that. You got your screen sharing all right. We're good to go over there. Should be, yeah. All right. So I'm going to hand it over now to you guys. So ladies and gentlemen, Paul and Tom from Hasbro. Thanks, guys. Thank you, okay. Paul. Ooh, yeah. look at that already. So starting Done. off with a bang. Done. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So like Paul's saying, um, we're going to talk a little bit about Hasbro toys, Star Wars toys specifically. And we wanted to start off with the vintage collection and specifically within the vintage collection, the Razor Crest, and really talk about how we implement ZBrush to help create stuff like this. Um, for stuff, for vehicles, like for the vintage collection, they are extremely engineering heavy. Um, and so a lot of times they end up getting made by our team in HFE, and then we are brought in to help sort of fill things out to make them a living space to get in some things in there that just help fill out the scene. And in the case of this particular item, um, we were asked to help create a lot of the different backpacks and things you see in the cargo bay, as well as our little uh, captives we see hanging from the ceiling, and then some other things as well. Uh, the bulkhead, which has the bedroom and the bathroom and then uh, the weapons cabinet which is currently closed we'll pop that open in a second and then of course the figures that go along with it figures are really our bread and butter for uh, Rhode Island sculpting and uh, with this particular item we've unlocked uh, several things for this um, so they're all kind of seen here there's also a stand that's included but I didn't I didn't I didn't want to show that here um, but yeah and so right now we're, we're standing, I think, 21, a little bit over 21 and a half thousand pre-orders on this, which is really amazing that so much support has been shown for this project. Um, so, yeah, we can go ahead and just dive right into where we were really strongly implementing ZBrush. And first of all, I, I, I like blasters. And so let's start with some blasters. Mm -hmm. This particular ship is going to come with... All of these blasters we see here, um, and it's all stuff we've seen in the reference from the Mandalorian. And um, we try to recreate this as faithfully as possible inside the weapons cabinet of the ship. And each of these just utilizes a pin going through the trigger guards to kind of hold them in place. And uh, some of these are for, you know, 
hardcore Star Wars fans might be familiar blasters. Uh, but again, it's all stuff we see in The Mandalorian. And um, so for implementing ZBrush with something like this, this is all fairly simple, you know, Z modeler stuff mixed together, blended together to, uh, to create these different blasters. And they all have to be created for, you know, the scale, the vintage scale. So a lot of things have to get a little bit beefed up for the size. So if you take, for instance, uh, this blaster here, we got to make sure that our trigger guards are thick enough and that different pass throughs for tooling um, are set where they need to be uh, to, to make it make it okay for manufacturing. So sometimes little things like these little gaps between the scope and the main blaster have to get thickened up. But I think we've, we've gone extremely film accurate on all of this, or at least we tried to, uh, to make all this happen. If we look at some of these other individual pieces here, if I just turn these on, there's a lot of stuff in the back <laughs> of the Razor Crest, uh, a lot of stuff we had to create for it. And these different backpacks, you know, it's just like, well, that's just a pile of junk, but they're sculpted with love. Really, really uh, a lot of work went into these to sort of help fill out that whole cargo bay area. Um, so a lot of stuff going on here. And again, just pretty standard sub tools being uh, merged together uh, with ZModeler or just traditional sculpting methods here in ZBrush, um, but all really tight to the reference. Unfortunately, I can't really show you the reference from Lucasfilm, but I can tell you this is very, very accurate to it. So then if we keep going, we can look How at some of How many artists our... do you think worked on all the weapons <laughs> and all the stuff that we're doing? Oh, well, I, I wonder. I wonder. Um, I know? think it was. It was about half a dozen, I want to say, okay. all together. And uh, specific contributions. I mean, th there may be one person in particular who might have maybe helped out on this particular blaster, uh, Mr. Paul Gabry. Yeah. So uh, thank you so much for your, your help with this and to all the, the vendors who helped us uh, create these. Uh, so Mr. Gabry did that, that one for us based off an, uh, an air pistol and then the Beretta M12 as well. So uh, those, are, those are Paul Gabry originals there. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll, it had to get done so quickly that um, we had to utilize more than a few vendors to help us out uh, with these, and everybody did a really awesome job to turn this around really quickly. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of different moving yeah, parts that, with this. That was oh. definitely an undertaking with with uh, the timing of this. It happened so quickly, and Paul was point on this one, and it just came out phenomenal. I know with uh, working with HFE as well, our our uh, partners in China, they they did a phenomenal job as well. It's yeah. it's a really impressive piece. Yeah, and this um, this initially was kicked off with uh, Mark Boudreau as our our tour designer on this, and um, he actually retired this year and then handed handed that project off to uh, Chris Reif, uh, who is who's new to Hasbro but mm -hmm. very long <laughs> in the tooth when it comes to Star Wars. Talk about uh, you're you're mentioning building your own BB-8. He's done his own R2 and you know moves around yeah, remote control and everything. It's fantastic, beautiful, and you know he's he's been very close to this industry for a long, long time. Uh, so we were happy to get him on board, and he's just done an amazing job. You know, taking up the reins from. Mr. Boudreau and uh, and really just delivering something really amazing for us uh, and just been a great partner. Uh, so another place where we use multiple vendors is uh, the different captives we have here, uh, sculpted from the reference that we see in that first episode of The Mandalorian, where we've got uh, you know we've got a, a Rodian here trapped in carbonite with all the little oozy bits coming out of him. This was all you know we we had a Black Series figure of the Rodian to start with, but the costume was a little different. Obviously, he's got a strange expression on his face. Um, and we, you know, planted him into this surface and then used a bunch of different weathering brushes to kind of go to work on that. This is a completely new carbonite crate for us, so we really tried to make it as screen accurate as we could, um, and also having the functionality of it snapping into the hook on the ceiling, which the hooks uh, actually slide along the ceiling of the Razor Crest as well. Oh, nice. Uh, which right. is pretty cool. Uh, so you're getting a lot of functionality with this particular thing, and it, it was it was quite a challenge to try and bring it all together. Uh, and then we have the star of that episode, uh, the Mithral character. Uh, we see him all frozen up and everything. Some good textures, uh, unique sculpt for that one. And then there's another male and a female captive. We don't really know much about them, but just what we saw in the reference, but we're including those as well. I was really excited to see when we got to that tier that we were actually getting this, so really cool that um, those get included. Little portable mini carbonite freezing chamber that he's got back there. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, you guys, and then, and you guys have reached all your tiers now, right? You've reached all five. Yeah, we knocked all of them out, and it just yeah. keeps going. I'm, I would be really surprised to see, you know, where we get by the end of the day. 
Um, well, you only got 12 hours, right? 12 yep. hours and 48 that's minutes right. left. That's right. That's right. And so here's another area where we... This is my favorite part. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Uh, I had one vendor helping me out making the bedroom and then another vendor helping me out with the bathroom. And uh, there was a lot of good emails back and forth about, you know, like, we got to we gotta make this the best, ba best bathroom we've ever done. The best you know? space bathroom ever made. <laughs> Absolutely. And so, I love the funnel. Yep. 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 And so they're Wait, trying that pops to... out too? You can actually pop that out as well. That It's assembled in. So, oh, okay. you know, a lot of these details we had to make sort of like relief sculpted because in the grand scheme of the entire project, you, you really do have to consider size of the particular thing and then how much how much money it's gonna cost in the tooling and try to think, well, we could have made this bathroom exactly like it's shown in the show, but then like how much, how much other things would have had to gotten sacrificed. Uh, and really because this bathroom is kind of tucked in this corner, we we did decide to sort of, <clears throat> well, let's let's sort of just make this a little more realistic for ourselves and 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 you know make some of this stuff relief sculpted so like the the bed is is sort of foreshortened but our our nip our uh, child figure here he fits he stands in this place and he also fits up in his little hammock so you can still get a lot of great uh, display and play options there uh, but this is a flexible piece so if you wanted to kind of move it around uh to pose it at a character's hands you you could technically do that uh, yeah so a lot of fun there and um then of course we have our figures that that will be coming with this as well and we've got our uh, mandalorian figure and he'll have a soft goods cape which is before previously we had done a pvc cape which is you get a lot more detail with pvc uh than you would with soft goods but the vintage collection does have a long uh standing you know history with soft goods and then with a soft goods cape he can actually sit down in the chair without a pvc cape kind of impeding mm -hmm. his ability to sit uh, which is going to be a great addition for us. And then an updated version of the child as well. So you see this little guy, he's so small. The child. Zoom in. The child. Baby so he's got a little slightly happier expression than we've seen so far on him, as well as the, it's going to be so small, but the little shifter knob we see in his right hand, uh, sort of a specific moment from season one uh, that also relates back to the ship. And his little soup bowl, which has a little ripple sculpted in it. Uh, and this is an all new metallic pram for us. And, <laughs> These, these prams are an interesting challenge in ZBrush, especially because you, you kind of have to figure out the spherical shape. How do you manufacture that? How do you break it up into different parts? How do you make it potentially something that could you know close up? Um, and so this one, the child will actually be able to sort of stand partially on this plinth and he can kind of stand in, in the curved surface of the egg, but standing on this blanket. But you could also pull the blanket out, lay him down and then close the top on it. Uh, and so you get a lot more play features there and it'll come with a little clear stand. Um, Speaking of manufacturing, do you guys know what process you, that you guys will be using for this? Are you going to be like injection or is it going to be molding? And it's yeah, primarily injection, injection molding. molding. Yeah. <clears throat> Most of this is probably yeah. going to be PVC with the exception of the clear stand. Um, that might be a, a different type of plastic for that. Um, yeah. Right. And then, of course, our off-world Jawa. He does not show his soft goods on right now, but uh, he'll have a soft goods robe over him, allowing him also to sit, which... Uh, there are some existing parts on this that are from an older Jawa that um, still felt were really, you know, great pieces to use. But we did add, you know, all the different off-world Jawa uh, aspects to him, the necklace and everything. His little kukri machete that he uses to slice open the egg. And then if you look closely at the egg, you know, sculpting the goo coming out of it was was a bit of a challenge. But uh, once that gets all colored up, the yolk will be kind of dribbling out all cool and uh, painted up in nice contrast to the mud. So when you um, say yeah. soft goods, just so everyone understands, you're, sure. you're talking so, about flexible stuff. Just yes, actual just, fabric. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Tailored and sewn to the specific figure um, to try and make it look, you know, as as realistic as you can with soft goods. It's it's something that does just add a lot of functionality to the to the figures themselves. It's gorgeous. I, and I yeah. see Tom's got one. Is that there's one physical? Yes. Tom's got one. <clears throat> we can go ahead and switch over there. Oh, yeah. yeah. Show Tom full. Oh, I oh, actually. Oh, 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 this thing's so big. That big that thing is. This Joseph, thing. Joseph, get your wife in there. Show her what you're gonna have on your. <laughs> this is why I need this. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we have. Oh, so you it's have one. You found one. This is awesome. Back. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. No, this thing. This thing is huge. It's um. This is our working model. It's still. It's not final. There are still a lot of things going. I can't even get in frame with this but um <laughs> there's so many panels that come off of this ship it's hard to i'm afraid to kind of pop everything off but it just comes apart just like in that first uh the episode where the jaw was just ripped the ship apart 
Um, we have the, you know, the uh, these different panels with the escape pod. This thing just, and I'm not even sure how all of this functions. Yeah, to be don't, honest with you, don't don't <laughs> don't feel like you need to take it apart. <laughs> Is he going to break no, it on it, screen? It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's we don't we don't we don't want you get an email from David. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. But uh, and you can see the scale of this thing, the little three and three quarter figure there. Yeah. This it has so many parts, so many different things, uh, so many features on this. I, it's impressive. We worked on the sail barge a couple of, well, last year, I guess it was, or a couple of years ago, and that was an undertaking as well. This this is just going another level as well. This is dude. That could have been like original piece. Star Wars. That's like a miniature, like miniature Star Wars, right? Because. The original Money yeah. of Falcon was 33 inches by like, if I remember right, like 30 inches in the original movie. If I remember mm -hmm. right. You're pretty much at your scale, right? You're, what is it, 30 it's, by 20? It's slightly smaller than life scale, but it's, we, we try to keep, and we do this normally with our vintage because if we really scaled everything to the exact size, it just wouldn't be feasible for a collector yeah. to have these giant ships, you know. But I think what we've done and, and where we settled on is is a nice uh, it feels right it's an appropriate size it's something that would sit nicely on the mantle and and uh it's really um just a fun display piece yeah. and again but there's so many honesty, interactive elements for the price you guys are asking for that that's insane only 350 bucks for something like normally something that large with that much detail is more in the thousands of dollars range honestly of collectibles yeah for, yeah for kid adults Right. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, this is, and that's and that's exactly who we're catering yeah. to is the kid adult. Are you but, do you have enough room, Tom, to kind of turn also and show them the front and the back a little bit? Is there enough room? I, I don't want to force you to have to do something you, you don't. No, I can yeah, I, I can rotate. I'm just gonna move out these out of the way just so we're not knocking these figures over. And so but when we first went to kick this off, you know, we we were actually fortunate enough to get the um, Lucasfilm file of the ship, the animation file, and so we had a pretty good look at, at you know what what we had to do and then we were involved fairly early sculpting was fairly involved early on to sort of help design sort of take that apart understand how what are the different levels of the ship where do things fit together where can we kind of push and pull things to sort of get that price down for people you know to where it can it can live in that sweet spot so to speak <clears throat> so that was it looks like it's got some got some heft to it too like oh yeah it is oh yeah. this thing yeah. is beefy is it, it is a beefy machine Someone yeah. just gave a really good idea. You guys could also uh, added a table as an additional thing. <laughs> part of it. Yeah, you you buy a whole section of so you can actually get a wall put into your house where there's an yeah. inset thing. I, where, think, <laughs> I think there probably needs to be a wife disclaimer for these too. Or you got Maybe yeah. The the stand that uh, Chris Reif designed for it, um, it does put it at kind of a, a swooping angle. So oh, it you does. actually it it sort of cheats yes, the you know you're not having to deal with the full width or the full length on your shelf. It actually can cheat the angle a little bit so that it it looks like it's in action, but it also saves you a little depth in the shelf space. Uh, and it, it's a great, it's a great result, guys. This is congratulations, man. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Honestly, it's amazing. Yeah. It's really nice. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's in, again in person. It's really impressive seeing all the panel work and all of the little greeblies in here. All the detail. It's going to be. This is so much to explore and discover on the on the surface of the ship and inside and everything. It's phenomenal. Yeah. So. What Tom this, doesn't know is that it's now has to stay right there in his office space from here on out. <laughs> Tom yep. I'll keep it. <laughs> you just made his day. <laughs> I'll find yeah. it. I'll find space and for so, it. To kind of take this back to, you know, well, how would how would we have done this in ZBrush? I mean, like it it, it would have mostly probably been Z Modeler. You know, Z Modeler would have been king here and trying to and trying to get the ship itself together. Um, and to that point, we still we still used a lot of you know Z modeler in the props that we were making for it. But um, and I'm I'm especially excited to kind of dive deeper into the newer features in Z modeler, the snap to surface, the extruding the edges, and all that stuff. That's going to be critical for us. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. All right. Yeah. You want to go back to your screen now, Paul? Sure. Wait, wait. Before you do that, can you show oh, the uh, did the Mandalorian have the soft uh, cloth stuff does on that it? just to show the yes he the does have the questions about yeah. that yeah. Yeah, there it is here, and you can it fit what fits well with the jetpack as well. That's the other benefit of having a soft goods yeah. cape. All right, I'm buying five. So, <laughs> woo! All right, five more sold. Sweet. <laughs> if only we got commissions. We need to Paul. We can get Paul. Yeah. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And so with this talk too, like compared to last year when I was focusing mostly on action figures, we wanted to really kind of try and stress the different ways that we use ZBrush to create product. And this is one of them. So, you know, creating vehicles, we use that all the time. The the Mission Fleet line we just launched this year, it's a little two and a half inch tall. Yeah. Mission Fleet figures that you know a little stylized. Um, all of those vehicles for that for that initial starting wave, we did those all in ZBrush. Um, <clears throat> so the Falcon, the X Wing, the Jedi Starfighter, the Speeders. Um, all the little jetpacks and little mini rig things that came out with that line. Um, that was all ZBrush. Tom, um, they want to see the baby Yoda. They want to see, yeah, they want to see the Yoda. child. Oh, hold on. Got to get that baby Yoda in. Absolutely. Ooh. There you go. Is yeah. it focused? There you go. <laughs> Shiny Pram. Yeah, he's, he's yeah. pretty small, too. He's adorable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 So anyway... Um, yeah. Awesome. That's awesome, guys. Really great. Cool. Cool. Yeah. So it's again available. <laughs> twelve more hours. Is that what yeah? Twelve hours and thirty-four yeah. minutes. I think that's and you can't buy everything. You can't buy Ooh. anything separately. It's all one big package. Twelve hours and twenty-three yeah. minutes now. Yeah. 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 This is a one and done, yep. just like the sale yep. board was. So. Yeah. Man. I actually, I did not Pretty actually fantastic. ever get a sale barge, and I totally regret it. I was like, oh, the box is so big. And now even if I didn't have an interest in keeping it, just looking at what they go for on eBay, it's just like, oh, it's so <laughs> stupid. <laughs> uh, yeah. So anyway, um, I love it. Uh, yeah. right. we have a couple other things we can talk about as well outside of the Razor Crest, or we can sit Absolutely. here the whole time and talk about this. But we do kind of want to blow this out and, and maybe include some of our vintage play sets in this discussion as well to kind of, it's a similar sort of vein, but it, it's where we, you know, we actually did do all that stuff in ZBrush, you know, from scratch on those. And uh, Tom was really heavily involved in in specifically the ones that I'm going to show here today, especially. Um, so we can kind of switch to that as well. And if anybody has any additional questions, I can always go back to the Razor Crest. Um, but let's. I'm literally getting text messages about this right now. <laughs> Whoa! What is this? Yeah. So with our vintage play sets, um, you know, we're always looking for kind of an opportunity to sort of open up a situation where you know there's a lot of opportunities with this. And the Tan of Hallway, you know, really, really showed that, really emphasized that even the set itself in the film was made in a way that, you know, you just turn a corner and it looks like an infinite hallway or it just keeps going around the same corner. And we kind of use that same mentality to create this vintage playset and the way it, the way the different parts snap together. And Tom, if you want to, you know, jump in on that at all and focus on where we want to look at, but just the way it comes together and goes apart, you could, you know, I've got a couple of different versions where you could put it together in different arrangements to kind of blow that out. And all that got, all that got tested early on in that concept stage where we kind of were, were involved in just blocking things out and then, you know, working with design to sort of like, okay, well, how, how many different ways do we want this to go together? What can we afford for the price point? Um, all that good stuff. Yeah. Do we lose Tom? No, I don't know. Oh, oh here we go. Okay. There we go. Yeah. So that, oh, I'm sorry. Do you guys lose me? Yeah. For a minute sorry. there, we lost you. Oh, okay. <laughs> so Sorry. No, I think they're just they're just taking him down when he's changing things and putting him back up. There we go. Yeah, that's probably good. Anyway, we jumped over to the Tanov playset and wanted to just talk a little bit about that, and especially like the functionality of you know, if you were to do multiple purchases, you know, you, you get rewarded with the ability to have this yeah. modularity to it. Right, and that that was the key thing. You know, seeing that scene, you know, the opening scene of uh, A New Hope, left that indelible mark. Where you know, it's, it's such a an iconic battle that you know we really wanted to try to <clears throat> get that really narrow enclosed hallway so you know trying to fit this into uh, a system where you could you know expand upon this thing infinitely they all all the parts you know just keep connecting together you can make a long hallway you can you know um, go around 90 degree corners and it really everything works together well and you know, so that was the the hope when we first came up with this. So we definitely took advantage of it within ZBrush and just really tried to figure out what the engineering was and how the parts needed to be broken apart. And um, so that was super helpful to be able to just, you know, uh, conceptualize this digitally and have it 
be a uh, fully functioning uh, modular system. So yeah, so we have the the opening doorways, um, the again, and then even that back hallway where you see those little walls jutting out. You know, that was trying to incorporate that scene where Leia is feeding R2 the Death Star plans. So we have that in there, and then you could actually enclose that hallway as well if you buy multiple sets. It's it's kind of nuts, but um, but yeah, there you go. It was it was a lot of fun kind of designing this thing and coming up with something that's uh, you know if you wanted just one purchase, I think it still reads really well as the town of hallway. But if you really were ambitious and wanted essentially to create a whole a ship, you know, and with a series of corridors, you could do that as well. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it was really fun to do. And so here again, Z Modeler would have been king. You know, it's and it, it was whoever sculpted this more than likely did it. Z Modeler, uh, and mm -hmm. it's you know when you we break it down into its simple parts, cylinders, rectangles, squares, all that good stuff. Um, but then the yeah. whole thing just comes together really nicely. Yeah, I would have remeshed that panel right there. Nice. Remesh. <laughs> Pro tips. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're gonna have a lot of them today. We're gonna have awesome. a lot of them today. Yeah, the thing with these is that you do have to really control the wall thicknesses. You can't, you can't go too thin in some areas. You can't go too thick, um, and we can get it really close with you know Z modeler and then just checking our measurements. Okay. What's your minimum? What's your minimum that you're requiring? Oh, one millimeter is always the gold yeah. standard, but yeah. a lot of these might be you know ABS parts. You might go just a tad thicker. Yeah, yeah the ABS we typically try to keep it to two, it's just for mm -hmm. structural integrity. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, you don't yeah. want these walls paper thin. Yeah. Yep. Even and then it's uh, knocking on the hands of a child. It's going to go into <laughs> adult child's hand. Yep. And then package is another thing that, you know, the, one of the unsung heroes is to try and get this into a certain size package can be quite a challenge. And you look at how it all kind of fits together. I mean, a lot of these parts are flat, but then some of them are curved. So uh, working so with, with that. Yeah, so Paul, when you're doing measurements in ZBrush, do you do you use a measuring cube? Do you use the transpose line for yourself personally the, when you're in Most of the time it's transpose on like figures and things because usually yeah. it's a weird organic shape. For something yeah. like this, I'd probably keep a cube in play pretty much all the time. Um, Same thing for you, Tom? Yeah. Same, yeah. Yeah. Pretty yeah. much. Yeah. And you know, everything would get made from that two millimeter cube. You just extrude it out, you know, and you make yourself a wall that that's that is that thickness and always keep double checking it. Um, yeah. Yeah, so anyway, uh, so yeah, we can actually switch out of Vintage Collection and go to Black Series if we want. And again, if anybody well, I have, has, I have Tom has it. Let's, yeah, Tom oh, yeah, yeah, I want to see the boom. Yeah. Moving too fast. Boom. <laughs> oh, so this oh, is yeah. like two sets, not even, not complete, put together. But you can see, you know, woo, <laughs> traveling there, the doorway. Dude, I'm telling that, you right now, one of my favorite Star Wars scenes is is Rogue One when he shows his power. Oh, absolutely. Come yeah. On. When Vader just I'm comes like, through yeah. the door like that. Ah, oh, so good. Yeah. That yeah. was so good. So this is how many pieces can this be? It, it's honestly infinitely. You could infinite. It, you could just keep connecting them. They, yeah, we've done a bunch of. I don't. know, I think the most I've seen has been six, but in theory, like I can see putting down a hallway of your house. Like having that <laughs> yeah. down the hallway. But it's nice too. It's narrow enough. It fits on the shelf. You know, it's, I think it's, you know, from a, uh, whatever, uh, display <laughs> presentation perspective, it works really well from that. And you could pop this, you know, I won't do it now, but you could pop this wall off, exposing this side, as Paul showed in the, the digital version of it. But it works, yeah, it works really well. It's a fun, yeah. fun little set, and there's so many different scenes you could do with this. I think it's been in three of the movies, right? Anyway, yeah. Rogue One, New Hope, and I think Ep Three, maybe. Yeah, a little bit correctly. at the end, I think. Yeah, yeah. have yeah. the droids' memory wiped. <gasps> yeah, there you go. <laughs> yep. And so, like, that's the beauty of our vintage collection is we love it so much is that you could, the figures are small enough that you can world build with them. You can, yeah. you can make vehicles. You can make playsets. If you try to do that. You know, we can do it limitedly with Black Series, but because the Black Series figure is six mm -hmm. inches, well, then your X wing would have to be, you know, huge. And so with Vintage, we we have that flexibility, and and that's that's one of the fun parts about working on that line. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So yeah. yeah, from here we can move on to wait. Do you want to do the Black Series now? Sure. 
Sure. All right. So how much time we got? Eleven forty-six right now. Okay, so yeah. we got some time yeah. yet. Yeah. So sort of to jump back to you know action figures are are like I said our bread and butter. Uh, we recently <laughs> and Tom, this is this is your baby, so I'll let you lead on this one. But this is one of our recent releases. Um, and if you want to go ahead and talk while I look at it and turn it around, let me know. Sure. If you want. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we got the opportunity to redo the Boba Fett figure that was uh, that we had previously done the F5 version. And so, you know, when we got the chance to do the Return of the Jedi version, it was like, oh, we got to do this from the ground up. It was really exciting. And it, you know, I think one of the things, one of the things I like about working in the toy industry or whatever is, you know, the opportunity to try to create something that, you know, you then give to the end user for them to, be creative for example if it's a kid where they would you know make their own adventures with the action figures or you see now on like instagram a lot of uh toy photographers uh, creating these amazing scenes that are like they look like movie stills and and you know so being able to give or try to make something that gives them the opportunity to uh express themselves and get these characters to emote and uh you know display action scenes or whatever um was is really fun so and what you know the overall goal to try to do with that is you know you're trying to create these little miniature figures but still engineer them so that they they move in such a way where they're fluid and you know they they move in a very lifelike manner and so one of the um uh the keys is trying to figure out all right where do we put the articulation how do we hide the articulation um so for example you know, a lot of times in the elbows, that can get ugly, especially if you go with like a uh, a double joint or whatever. Double so hinge. we really try to maximize our um, range of motion with the with the joints that we have, but still make it look, you know, as hidden as possible. So camouflage. Yeah, when you yeah. zoom out, yeah, you, you hopefully you don't see the discs in there, but they're there. So you started from scratch then with this. You didn't start with like an old. You you're just. Start right. from scratch, complete. Are you sculpting everything first and then doing your articulations for you? It's it's typical. I mean, the articulation is always in mind, but you typically sculpt it from. I mean, the the figure first. You you know, and then cut in the articulation uh, later on. But you're, it's always in the back of your mind as far as where you're going to put the joints. You know how, for example, like on the the short sleeve. You know, kind of lowering that to to uh to meet the the elbow joint things like that you're always looking for areas to break it and so i think even in the elbow joint it runs along that seam of that you know the, the seam along the the shirt the sleeve i should say and so it's you know strategically just looking for for different areas to to hide it so for example on the thighs the break is right above the pouch and that's again deliberate so that when you rotate the leg it, it looks normal. It doesn't it doesn't break the illusion, which is essentially what you're doing here is you're given the illusion that this is a little mini figure, mini, you know, humanoid in there. And and so and then even when you want that illusion to remain once you do articulate it right now in a neutral pose, that's one thing. But how does it look when you do bend, bend the elbow or the knees or whatever, move the head? And that's, you know, so. And we it's test really, all that stuff digitally. So like, you know, taking the yep. joint, actually bending the leg and, and seeing is that the best way it can be done. So you used a lollipop on both the elbows and the... Yep, single yes. knees, single yeah, elbows. They're, not, they're single, they're not double hinged. Yeah. Yep. Right. And then, and so, yeah. Tom, what what features do you use? What features of ZBrush do you use mostly to do him? I, for this one, it's, it's honestly, it's mostly just a lot of, uh, man... So <laughs> Anything and everything. Actually, you, you throw everything. I know, in. really. It's, it Wait. depends on, on which part. You know, if you're talking backpack, it would be the Z modeler. If you're talking, you know, the cloth, I just, um, a lot of it is just sometimes inflate a lot. Uh, uh, a lot of move, a lot of standard H -polish. brush. Yeah. It just yeah. standard brush, exactly. So and, for all the metal pieces, uh, you were using all, Z modeler for all the, like the helmet, backpack wrists uh for, no i wouldn't say for all but yeah for a lot of for a lot of the hard surfaces stuff so you know and we work with the vendor on this one too who did a, a phenomenal job on this thing and um 
And but, uh, yeah. this helmet too, this is, um, at this point, I think we uh, had, oh, that's we right. had worked on, you had, you'd gone to the archives and taken 3d scans of the actual Boba yes. Fett helmet to so create we the role play one. Right. We went to Skywalker ranch last year and we did a role play helmet and we had the opportunity to go in and scan the helmet, which was that was a, a great experience but then obviously having that asset now was like oh great now we have a perfect helmet to add to this figure and you know and it, it translated really well to uh one twelfth scale as well so um but again and that's again another thing that we have to constantly consider like you look at the stem on the antenna it's a little bit thickened up a, a bit but that's necessary in order to you know for manufacturing purposes and making sure that that is a stable um stem yeah and yeah, so if it's too thin the pvc yeah. just doesn't want to flow through that channel and you're going to get short shots and production issues where there's just a scrap rate where you have too many times it failed and so you have to inflate and in enlarge things that way so that you get a, a higher success rate yeah something really particular i i you know i, I love about our six inches we can do things like this where Basically, the mm. entire chest is a sleeve, and then underneath that is the harder components to allow for the sleeve mm. to be a flexible <laughs> PVC piece. And then these harder elements, you know, th they're more rigid PVC that, or even ABS in some cases, where you get a lot of range of motion out of it, and you can just and have again, that flexible yeah. piece over it. And that's going back to that idea as far as how do you hide this? How do you make this thing as functional as possible? without breaking that illusion without you know putting these really ugly gaps in there in order to make it i mean again if you had that shirt off that that would look hideous <laughs> and you know it, it would no longer look like boba fett it would just it would just look odd so yeah. but you know being able to do that and and get that done again digit this is not something we probably could have done when we used to traditionally sculpt either where this was all done by hand and wax and having that kind of control was just not possible back in the day. <clears throat> yeah. So the, again, the beauty of digital is just being able to ideate all this stuff and even from just from an engineering perspective and figure out what is possible and just continuing pushing the, the limits on that and just trying to, trying Does to make the best figures off? that we... Does this helmet come up? Uh, it oh, is yeah. well, glued on it on is this a separate figure. Yeah. Yes, it is a separate piece though, so it's there is a head under there. So we'll just so, you can someone wants see, to know. There you go. You, someone wants to know. Did you make the backpack sh rocket shoot? Yes, it, uh, it doesn't shoot. shoot. It is separate. There's no spring loaded mechanism no spring in there, but, but it does come out. For those that don't know, the bubble feather that has the shooting backpack is very rare, very very yes. rare, and it's worth yeah. a lot. So if you have one, you better protect it because it's rare. <laughs> Don't tell anybody you have. A couple hundred thousand. <laughs> How much? I think it was a couple hundred thousand. There was only there was very few. What happened was they, uh, so a child, you know, had an accident with a different uh, silent toy, raider, and then yeah. yeah, and so that happened while they were making the Boba Fett figure, and they yep. pulled it. So all yep. there were were prototypes done, similar to this prototype right here. So this is boom. So this switch switch Boba Fett. Times. Tom's got oh, man. Figure out. Yeah. So this is it right here. But yeah, again, he's yeah, he's got the the blast in his rocket as well. Yeah, that figure comes with a lot of great accessories that just because I didn't want to bog my ZBrush down with a bunch of high density meshes, uh, didn't want to put in there. Yeah. So the uh, the cape's not a soft material. This is all hard. No, this is this is sculpted. Yep. Yeah. But it's very flexible, so it's it can act like a soft. Yes, exactly. If he goes flying, he could. Anyway, um, yeah. So it's, you know, again, the idea of getting this thing to, you know, articulate and move and, and, exp and again, hide in the joints. So it, it's bending his knee, but it shouldn't be too obvious. Right. Yeah. So. And one, yeah, and this two, and three, and four. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, this this guy was a lot of fun. He's he's, you know, can't wait for people to have it in their hands. He When's it available? Pose. This one, I believe, it's in spring, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think it's April. I don't quote me on that. I have to double All check. Right. But yeah, 
but yeah, you can pre-order it now. It's it's a very cool figure. I'm I'm very happy with with this one. Um, and again, he's always been a, a great character, a fan favorite. And just yeah. again, having the opportunity to revisit this guy after uh, the F five one was was a lot of fun, and we got to, I think we got to do a lot of stuff, a new experience, uh, experiments with this that worked really well. So, yeah. and we don't we don't often get a chance to do Boba Fett because even if you don't change anything with a tool, the deco alone on it is you mm. know, nightmarishly expensive to do it correctly. So that's that's tough where you, you, you really have, once you get the chance to do one, you, you kind of have to go all in or, or just don't do it. So we try to, we try to go all in. Here's yeah. a couple of questions for you guys. I think that are good ones. Sure. Um, sure. Um, when you guys are making these, I know you guys have your own 3d printers in each of your office, right? I, I do at home. Yeah. And we have a yeah, maker bot right in the yeah. hallway. Yeah. Right. So do yeah. you guys, when you're making these, you, you print some amount for tests and make sure everything's working correct before you even send it to the full manufacturing? Yes. Right? If, especially, yes, exactly. Especially when it's something new that we're trying and, you know, in theory it's working and it's working digitally. For example, on the Stormtrooper that we did, we tried these new shoulder jo uh, pads and how they're attached. And so what I had them do was in um, the Form Labs printer, print it in the flexible material. And then just, you know, and then we get it together, we put it together and see if it works. And fortunately it did. And, and it, uh, you know, it's one of those things that, you, you know, having the opportunity to do that uh, and having materials in 3D printing that, that kind of replicate what you get in production is critical and essential. Because if not, you're flying blind and then it's, you know, it's a guess. And then you certainly don't want to guess and tool a full figure and then it not function the way you intended it to so then yeah. it's yeah that could be a nightmare so if you look on tom's shelf behind him up on that rack there are these orange figures standing in front of the, the yeah. black series boxes those are our tooling hard copy prints that those were printed on uh probably a perfactory machine per factory yeah we do it now mostly in form labs and that's the the model that gets printed out not only for us to just test these complex fig complex figures and how that they, they work and everything but also then that we get a duplicate of that and that becomes a paint master um, and then right. once that happens, everything goes to HFE and they, they kind of look at the patterns that we've created <clears throat> and use that as their master copies. So you guys have an original hand painting that you start with there and yeah. then you ship it to the manufacturing yeah. uh, place. And the, the, the oh, Razor no. Crest was kind of an extension of that too. That was a hand painted yeah. model. Yeah. yeah. Right. Although we are experimenting with digitally painting. So we, we send over the ZBrush files and then paint the digitally. Are you, what are you using? A Mamaki printer? About, well, yeah. We do yeah. use the Momaki, especially for the know? face printing. <laughs> <laughs> especially I'm just not printing. a pretty face, people. I've got information. <laughs> he does. Sources. The man knows things. <laughs> yeah. Here, here's a really good question, too, I think, for everybody like in the toy. They want to get in the toy industry, something like that, too. Do you guys have a good place to go learn about manufacturing do's and don'ts to have in consideration? Have, do you, do you, no. Where would you guys send people? We actually they come have, to us. A, yeah, they come to us. We have a great internship program because there really isn't anything out there from a schooling perspective that teaches, you know, the manufacturing ins and outs of action figure uh, production. So it's, it's, um, yeah, we, we, you know, we recruit from different schools and, but, and then we teach them here. We bring them in for an internship for a year, roughly, and some, for co-ops, we do it for a few months. But then, uh, yeah, well, then we hopefully. How do people that, apply yeah, to that? How do they apply to that? Uh, we, we have different schools. I know currently we're at uh, SCAD and Ringling that we recruit from. And so uh, they have different programs there. And, you know, there's an announcement made. And, and, uh, and then we kind of, uh, I think we, in each school, I think it's about 20, 20 students that we um, accept for the program for the, and then, and then from there, we, we offer internships and, and uh, temp positions. So uh, it's, it's, it's limited, but it's, you know, I think it's a, again, there, there really isn't, that I'm aware of anyway, any formal schooling for this kind of thing. Yeah, there are some toy design programs at different schools around the country and the world. Oh, you're but, right. Um, for the most part, as far as like what Tom and I do that, we, we're kind of just, we kind of just landed here, you know, we got in a, and now we're trying to teach people about it through the school programs. But um, it is something that even after a year, 
it's not really fair for us to expect, you know, somebody who's been with us for a year to handle a full figure like this Boba Fett. That that is somebody that has been with us more than ten years as a vendor. Right. So like that that takes a lot of time to work up to. And I, I would say anybody who is looking to try to get into this industry is, you know, get yourself some figures that you find, you know, exemplary or really you, know, you really think they're cool. Buy, you know, get the samples, you can buy a couple of them and then take them apart. Get yourself some digital calipers, see how they're made, like figure out why a joint works so well <laughs> by taking it apart and, and actually, you know, reverse, right, reverse engineering. engineering. It yep. And to to get like somebody like Tom Rye's attention, you know, it's anybody looking to recruit for a position is going to look for the thing, you know, the thing that we already do. It, it's it's one thing to see a portfolio where somebody has, you know, nice still lifes or or even animation stuff or video game stuff. But if you see somebody actually doing articulation, that's really exciting because it's like, oh, they clearly have an interest to this outside of it just being sort of a sister do you, career. Do you think that's a requirement for uh, if they want to get in the toy industry? Do you think that is a requirement for you guys who are going to hire that they need to show some articulated pieces that you get it? Um, no, I, I think that's something, again, with, with the programs that we have, that's where we start to teach them. We'll, we'll actually yeah. go down to the school and have little um, uh, classes that would, would demonstrate all this. We, you know, uh, yeah. So it's not something that's required. It, I think it's something that, you know, when we do that class, though, you need to have a basic fundamental understanding of what the principles are. And then from there, then we, you know continue to invest in and teach them the ins and outs because it is you know what i like to tell uh these guys is you know you can distill it down to any articulation two things it's either a sphere or a cylinder and so you know as long as your access points are in the center of those two objects then you know from there it's 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 just the nuance of you know where do you put the wrinkles how deep do you cut the the joints things like that that takes more time and each, and that's the other fun thing. Each project is, you know, its own beast and its own, it has, it presents its own set of challenges that it makes it fun and interesting. It's, it's like the, the next challenge, like, how do I make this guy come alive? How do I, you know, it's one thing to get the visual representation and the correct silhouette and all, all the details, right. But it's another to make it move and function uh, as intended and then, and doing it in a believable way again, without breaking that fantasy. Yeah. So is the intern programs only for students or do you guys have intern programs for adult child that want to get in? Mostly, yes. <laughs> that's, that's why I was mentioning, like if, if you're somebody who's not at a school and you want to try and get our attention through a portfolio, you would probably try to try to implement some things that that show you're a little further along than somebody who might be a student so if you if you can try right. to build some articulated stuff even if you only have an fdm printer or something like that just print it out test it you will learn a lot so like and and then start showing that stuff in your in your portfolio and show us a little gif of how your your knee joint will actually function and work um that okay. that one more that question would, before we move on Paul, sure i got one more question because this i think this is important to understand for people too that want to get in the toy industry i think sure. this is Sculpting really good is one thing, but how much time do you usually get to do like a figure? Let's say black <laughs> suit, Tom. How much time do you usually get? It's I try to give them four weeks, but it's usually three to four weeks. Yeah, is what what it is. So right, yeah. And so much, yeah. The the key thing I also want to stress is besides sculpting, you got to also be able to sculpt quickly too as well. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah they're uh, we're all under a lot of deadlines here and. And that's always a the prevailing factor as far as you know how quickly can we get it done and and so yeah that, that's a huge thing. Yeah. And All right, we got ten minutes. I'm gonna give it back to you, Paul. Okay. So then maybe we ought to go out with a bang on this one then. The uh, okay. Moment. Okay. Okay. We weren't already doing a bunch of bangs. No, yeah, I thought we started so. with the bang. Pop, 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 bang. But um, <laughs> we just announced today that we're doing the Black Series role play Mandalorian helmet, uh, oh. which is really freaking exciting. Um, and it it's that's just such an awesome design. And this is something that Tom, you know, you know, you were you were the one who's cranking away on this one. Uh, cool. So again, you can leave this one if if you want to jump in and talk about any details. But um, role play items are another challenge, you know, outside of just action figures or you know vintage vehicles where you know there's safety concerns and wearability and how much does it look like the prop versus you know all the different things that we can kind of add into it um and then of course the inside of the helmet is something you know that, that got designed specific for this thing which is pretty cool 
Right. So the inside was taken, you know, we didn't really have much to go off of there. So when you look at, uh, there's a, an episode, I forget which one, where he gets his chest armor damaged and he, he flips it over and there's all this circuitry, you know, behind it. And so we kind of used that design language and brought that into the interior of the helmet. And then those little rectangles are little foam paddings. Um, so they're, you know, they're meant to be soft cushiony uh, material. So this is, um, yeah, so this was, was pretty fun to kind of, kind of work all that out and squeeze as much detail into there as possible. And then the, you can kind of see there on the left, the battery compartment, this thing lights up. The actual interior of it has some LEDs that light up so you can see it uh, a little more closely. You can see all of that detail as well as the flashlight that he uses in, I believe it's the second episode um, or I forget which one now. Which but, is um, tricky because it, he, d you don't really see it until all of a sudden it's on his head. So it's like, where did that come from? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you guys are allowing this to come apart for this too? That people will be able to take this apart or are you just... Yeah, you, you can have it with the flashlight on or you can have yes. it without. Okay. Yep. In fact, I don't. And then, um, so yeah, so we were fortunate enough to uh, get some files from Lucasfilm as well for the the prop. And so, can show so you we that. see... Yeah, utilize that to convert that to a so, so that's directly from Lucasfilm. Oh, it is. This is this. So this yes. is what you got, and this is where you start with. So yep, yep. This is the in this, this case is the anyway. Scan. What about the interior? Sure. Because he barely he pretty much never takes his helmet off. So what did yeah, they give you right. for that? N nothing, pretty much. No, I mean, no. not. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just it's it was just a shell. Yeah, I think there was some padding in there. Some foam, raw foam padding for the actor, but I don't yeah. think it was yeah. actually filled out with detail yet. No, I right. don't. I don't see a yeah. point in it. Yeah. And then sometimes so, yeah, that, with reflective objects, you just don't get a clean scan from something that is really mm -hmm. reflective. So you kind of have to, you then supplement with whatever 2D you get from the licensor to help, you know, fill out, fill out the details and the sharpness right. and the crispness of things. Is this so going to be crowdfunded as well? No, this no, is no, this. This is available for pre-order, I think, today? I think it says coming soon, but it, it will be. Yeah, it, it, says, be. it says coming soon right now. Yeah. Right, Jurassic, I you want to put it in the chat? I already, I already did. It's already right. in there. I, yeah. <laughs> and so the looking exclusive the exclusive to this audience, I believe it's 430 is what I heard. OK. That it goes up for pre-order. So. Yeah. And so talking about safety, on whenever we, wear, we have role play helmets, we have to work in some kind of ventilation not just you know you say well the bottom's open can't they breathe and it's like well i mean we've all been dealing with it masks gets... for the last seven or eight months i think we all know the answer to that now so trying to put in a little more <laughs> ventilation into this and so the, the the actual visor itself is slightly offset from the frame the metallic frame so that you get pass-throughs where the air can actually flow uh, and there's a little bit a little bit on the back side as well this has got more natural venting lines put in it here but um, right. some venting front and back for comfort. Yeah, so, so these are always this, really exciting. Yep, yeah, sorry. Yeah, in this process, oh, too, yeah. we'll then end up 3D printing a helmet, which I have here, where we can yeah, you know, there it is. put it in, and then we, we bring it around the office, and, and we find people with the biggest heads, and we just see if it fits <laughs> them. <laughs> that's kind of the goal. <laughs> that, that's only half joking. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's wow, the goal. Looks great. We we want to make it as uh, accessible to everyone as possible. So that's what this is, and we go in and test it out and see how it goes. But then what we have here is uh, the this is a early sample production sample. So this is the finish that we're getting on this figure, on this figure, on this helmet, and um, yeah, it's it's pretty close to. Yeah. What's in the show? Our designer on this was uh, Sam Smith, and he Sam really Smith, went through yeah. a lot of trouble to make sure we try and get that finish because that metallic paint is very tricky, <laughs> and that's you know it, it lived somewhere between you know vac metal and um, a metallic spray paint, so we had to kind of dial in exactly what that finish was, which I think it came out really well. Well, if I'm not mistaken, this is a vac metal finish is, yeah. with yeah with a an overspray on it. Yeah. If I'm wrong. Sam and it's what a a ABS, <laughs> and its main point ABS. What's the actual material? Yeah, uh, yes, yep, ABS for the most. And part. What did you print? Uh, what did you print the other one on? What printer did you? Do you know what printer was? 
I think it's in SLA 7000, I think. Okay. I think. Um, yeah. Anyway. But yeah, this this is a, again, you can see, the, I don't have batteries in this one, but I don't know if, how well you can see, because we do have lights that would light up oh, the inside go. of that. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. So, but yeah, this yeah. is, it's a gorgeous. Oh, Tom, they want you to put it on. Tom, they want you to put it on. Absolutely. Hold on. <laughs> Are you going to do it? <laughs> Oh, okay, no. you can never take it off. You know that, that, right? Thing. That was a trick. <laughs> <laughs> it, that is we can the still way. hear you in it. Just keep it on. Just keep it on. We can still hear you. Go. Go. I'll keep it on. That's the best mask for the outbreak right now. Hey, oh, that's man. a good mask. There you go. I actually saw someone wearing one of our Boba Fett helmets as a mask. <laughs> nice. <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it fits great. It's. It yeah, it looks well. like it moves good. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so this is... I love it. <laughs> the Regalorian. I love that. Somebody <laughs> just put that in the chat. <laughs> uh, nice. Uh, I love it. Cool. So, yeah, yeah when you're sculpting is... something like this, you do have to work very clean, very meticulous on wall thicknesses. It's all very important. So, again, another thing where Z Modeler and like extruding out planes, you know, in that Q mesh operation uh, is really critical. Um, and then you have to be kind of versatile when when you get a change come through that's going to affect a lot of things because everything is layered really thinly around the shell of the helmet. Um, so right. they are a very unique beast. And then someone is yeah, asking the beveling around the edging to get you know a soft beveling edge. Were you guys using Z model for that, or it was just a simple divide up and smooth the edges to get a little beveling around? I would imagine Z model was. You're talking about these air pieces here? No, or like yeah, or just around any of the edges. They have a little bit of bevel on them. Yeah. Yeah. I would imagine Z modeler is the way you want to go. Again, there's that's the the beauty of Z brushes, the versatility of it. You know, you yeah. could approach it anyway, and many of you know many of us do. We all use different techniques, and you know, it's the ends justify the means. Yeah, it's so. Also, this is this is a check model back from HFE as well. So they they a lot of times will take a lot of our sh super sharp edges and give them a little bit of a bevel, just again for a safety thing. For, um, yeah. So we we may have sent this to them with really sharp edges, and they kind of gave it a little bevel. Um, sometimes we put it in, but it, it could be you know high res Dynamesh or it could be Z Modeler. God, that, this is awesome stuff, man! You oh, guys cool. are creating some really gorgeous work. Well, thank you, and it's yeah. it's just you know. Every day, it's just it's a ZBrush. This is our main tool every day. And yeah. for myself, even when I'm working on personal stuff, I'm still in ZBrush. I'm still working on stuff in ZBrush. So it's it's awesome that it can it can work in so many different ways for us. Um, yeah, absolutely the same. Yeah, like I said, it's so versatile, and that's it's our main tool. Honestly, that's what we default to. I've yet to run into any issues or you know problems that I haven't solved in ZBrush yet as far as you know, developing product. So anything I need for it to do, I can get it to do. And a lot of do you know, guys, Go ahead, Paul. When ahead. we showed the Jawa and the, the Mandalorian figure earlier and talked about soft goods, now that we have you know, Dynamics in ZBrush, um, I can't talk about the new figures I'm using it on, but I've already started <laughs> to, to use it to That's sort of make- That's a great new feature soft goods mock-ups for our action figures in our sculpt submissions so that yep. the licensor can kind of get an idea of well what might the soft goods look like because a jawa doesn't really look like a jawa unless he has his robe on and it's the mm -hmm. same right. with other figures as well so that's been really great you just make a simple cape you, you soft mask it off and then you you turn mm. on it and it just goes right down and uh, it's it just saves us a little bit of time there to, to have it in dynamics which is awesome are you yeah. guys do you guys know that someone's asking are you going to make a child size so dad and daughter can have one. Oh man i wish <laughs> you could put a lot of foam padding in there as far as i <laughs> know bobblehead. right now yeah <laughs> i think it might actually be cuter if it was full size on the kid yeah weigh them down and go there. yeah do you uh, when you guys another question when you guys are doing your toys do you keep perspective off in zbrush or do you change the camera's focal length at all most of the time i, I do typically keep it off yeah yeah, there's only a couple of times where I might switch it on and maybe, you know, adjust that focal length a little bit to kind of get a feel for how something is is looking. And if I'm if I'm presenting to portraits, yeah, if I'm presenting yeah. to a group that isn't used to, you know, seeing things without perspective on, I might switch it on so they can kind of get a better feel for, you know, the shape and size of the object with the perspective. And I'll make sure to kind of turn it around slowly for them. And that seems to help sometimes. But utility wise in the background, I'm. 98% without perspective on. Same. Yeah. Okay. 
And uh, Tom, real quick, someone was asking about the Boba Fett that you did. It's the Vintage Collector Collection Boba Fett that was twelve million. No, that one's the Black Series six inch. Yeah, okay. there is a Vintage Collection we, one too. Yes, it? we at the same time we had we developed a new Return of the Jedi Vintage Boba Fett. It was one hundred percent new. It utilized a lot of the same sculpted parts from Tom six inch. Uh, but there's a there's a transition between six inch and vintage where we have to we have to change up some joints the wall thicknesses right. you know it's like 61 percent the scale of a six inch figure so you have to go in and really play with some things and then some of those features like the the over shirt on the six inch one that tom did we didn't really have the thickness in a vintage to be able to do that um, we had to kind of switch it up and do it a little bit differently um, but for the most part it's it's a completely new figure i i, I myself even actually missed the pre-order on that one so i i won't be getting no! one unfortunately <laughs> Uh, I can look at it and brush all I want, but I, I don't. I'm not actually gonna so, I got but, you, Paul. Oh, I appreciate it, Tom. Thank you. Uh, yeah, but I was really proud of our vendors who, who worked on both those figures for us, and they always do such an amazing job for us. And I'm um, really excited for those. Yeah, all right. Definitely. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time with you guys. Oh, this was great. This yeah, has been was amazing. Awesome. Amazing, 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 amazing. Thank you for sharing all this. We've been putting links as well, everyone in mm -hmm. chat, to the product that they've been showing. The helmet's in there. I just put the Boba Fett. It's sold out, though, so wah, 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 wah. <laughs> but the Razor Crest is still available. Don't, Razor don't, still be, like Paul Bennett. don't be like Paul don't Bennett. Don't sleep on the now. Razor Crest. <laughs> Look, the first <laughs> thing I'm doing when I'm hanging up is getting my copies. Amy's you like, you got to get those. Yeah. You better <laughs> do it. You can get your copies, right? Yeah, I do. Yep. So, guys, thank you. This was amazing. I know some people had some mold question process. Ironically, the next presentation is also going to be talking about some molding yeah. stuff and mm -hmm. prosthetics with uh, Creative Creatures Engineering. So I wouldn't leave because some of those questions are also going to be answering. But there you go. Hopefully our these these segments are for us. They're only about an hour long, and then we're moving yeah. on. I, yeah. I would talk to Paul and Tom all day because I'm a large child. So <laughs> <laughs> you're in good company. <laughs> it's a new T-shirt. New T-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and thank you guys for having us. Really appreciate it. Oh, it thank awesome. you all. Absolutely. Yeah. This is a lot of fun. Give them a round of applause. Guys. A round of applause, everybody. A round of applause. Right. <laughs> there we go. There we go. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Well, guys, I really appreciate right, you guys joining us today, this morning. You know, so uh, it's been awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you for and for getting the actual Razor Crest. I know in our talks, we weren't sure if we we're going to be able to physically be able to show one. So I don't know how you made it happen. But thanks. Pull some amazing. strings. We got it done. Thanks for making it happen, guys. That was awesome yeah. to see it in person as well. That really gives the scale Absolutely. too. Yes. Yeah. 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 You it's know huge. what went up on Amazon? Table sales. Okay. That's <laughs> How much weight can this hold? <laughs> I need a table. Stat. Does it have a lazy Susan feature? Dude, you know what the best thing to do for that? I'm, I'm not kidding. IKEA sells them for like literally five bucks. I put, oh. a, dude, I just buy it and then put it on there. That's what I used to put my clay sculptures on. Was like a five dollar IKEA lazy Susan and. It's perfect. Awesome. There you yeah, go. Cool. Yeah. There you go. Fantastic. Yep. Right, well, guys, I really nice. appreciate it again. Thank you so Same. much. We're going to do some giveaways. I know people are chopping at the bit for some giveaways as well. And then we're going to be moving on to Creative Creatures Engineering presentation. Paul and Tom, anything last minute words for you guys before we say goodbye? No, other than, again, thanks again for having Thank us. You. This was a yeah. lot of fun. And um, hopefully, you yeah. know. Enlightening, <laughs> as far as the yeah, process I hope so. and utilizing ZBrush in our day-to-day -day workflow. Yeah. Yep. yep. Thanks, guys. Have All a right, great, guys. great rest right. of the Take day. care. <laughs> See you. We'll see you in Take chat care. now, boys. Oh yeah. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs>
right? So, Sounds but let's good. do some giveaways. Let's do some giveaways before we bring in the next crew, right? So let's start with something that's, let's start with this. So let me make sure you guys are seeing my screen. There we go. There we go. So there's the link for the giveaways. You guys just got to register. Please use the name you're using in the chat for your, your chat name, hence chat name, okay? So whatever you're using right now that you're talking to us on Twitch, YouTube, or Facebook, that's the one you want to register, okay? So make sure you do that. All right, so I'm going to give away right now a full version of Keyshot Pro. This is a $2,000 version of Keyshot Pro with the, Z, with the bridge, and the bridge is now cross-platform, okay? So we're going to give one of those away. Let me get my to this point. Let me make sure on the same day. Let me draw my winner. Oh, I like this. Spider Creek. Spider Creek. That's who I'm looking for right now is Spider Creek. That's another good name. There's so many. That is another good name. I like that. Spider Creek, are you here? Are you here? Here, that's who we're looking for. Just give me a shout out. And again, you guys have to register every day. So you register today, tomorrow, if you're gonna come tomorrow, you gotta register again, okay? You gotta, so I know you guys are here with us today, but make sure you come back. Spider Creek, there you are, my man. Boom, you just won a Key Shop Pro with the bridge. That's worth uh, 2150, so 2150 bucks if you're rounding up, if you wanna round up in that, okay. Let's give let's give something else away. Joseph, pick a number. One right. through ten. One through ten. Yeah. Let's go with seven. Okay. Lucky number seven. All right. Let me show the image. Boom. Let me bring this over here. All right. And there you go. Okay. So we got an on-demand mega bundle for XMD. On demand mega bundle for XMD. Let me draw the winner here. Beep. Okay. AJ Brute. AJ Brute. That's who I want to see in this chat. Chat it up. Chat it up. AJ Brute. AJ Brute. That's who I'm looking for right now. Tell me you're there. The, the guy, you all should still be here. You guys all just registered this morning and it's only been one presentation. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there he is. There we are, AJ. There you go. That's what you've won. You've won an on-demand mega bundle XMD. Congratulations. All right, let's do another one. Let's do another one. Uh, I'm going to do, oh, let's do one of these. Let's do one of these. Let's do this. Here we go. Space Mouse. Oh, yeah. Oh, Space yeah. Space Mouse. Space Mouse. So for those that don't know, the next version of ZBrush will be able to use the space mouse and we will be showing it tomorrow in action at our presentation so who i'm looking for is kung fry right kung fry am i right with that yeah kung fry kung i'm gonna, I'm gonna draw out the use kung fry that's right that's right but I'm, i hope I, that's correct hey rob lens is back he won yesterday or she won yesterday Kung Fry, that's who I'm looking for. Space Mouse it up. Space Mouse, 3D Mouse, 3D Mouse. That's what you have just, you've just won. You've just <laughs> won. Dress, do we have time for one more? Do we have time? I think we have time for one more. Okay, one more, one more, one more, one more. I'm going to do, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, let's do this one. Let's do this one. All right. Ah, because he's here. Thomas, you got to push the button for me, man. You got to push the button push for me on this one. All right. So the winner, winner, Walter Jimenez, Walter, where are you at, Walter? I'm looking for, I just put it in the chat. And then Mr. Thomas Woodlebach is actually in here right now, unless he left. Okay. <laughs> unless he left. But Tom, uh, Walter, this is what you've just won. You won a lifetime membership to the ZBrush Jewelry Workshop. Man, if you ever want to work, know how to do jewelry, this is it, people. This is where you want to be. Walter's here. Bam, Walter. There's what you want. There is what you want. We've got more prizes, more things going on. We're going to do our little be real now, and we're going to come back with the team from Creative Creature Engineering. All right? So those are our prizes. The guys, we're giving prizes away all day. So make sure you get your name in there and get going, okay? So we'll see you back here in just a few minutes, and we're going to get the next team in.
Hello everyone, this is Michael from Pixelogic's social media and marketing team. I want to introduce to you a small fun segment we'll be showing you throughout the ZBrush Summit this year called 2020 ZBrush Highlights. Throughout the day, we'll be showing you some of the most popular ZBrush creations from throughout the year from ZBrush Central, our Instagram, Facebook, and more, while telling you a little bit about the piece, the artists behind it, and where you can see more of that artist's work. Be sure to check out the link in each 2020 ZBrush highlight video to visit our exclusive ZBrush Central thread cataloging all of this year's highlights. Enjoy the summit! The Form 3 has helped bring people's wildest dreams to reality. But sometimes you need to dream bigger. We designed the Form 3L to bring the biggest dreams to life, so we wanted to put it to the ultimate test. Could we use the 3L to print our flagship 3D printer? Introducing Form 3L, so you can print a dream within a dream maker. Hello, Michael here yet again with another 2020 ZBrush highlight. Gabriel Suarez created this stylized interpretation of Cillian Murphy's character Tommy Shelby from Peaky Blinders. The piece started off as a 2D sketch. Gabriel says, sometimes it's better to leave the 2D concept undefined. That way it is possible to have more freedom when sculpting in ZBrush. 3D improves, perfects, and matures the initial concept. Michael here, back again with yet another 2020 ZBrush highlight. This realistic portrait of Tom Hardy comes to us from artist Hadi Karimi. Hadi is known for creating stunning likenesses, and this one is one of his most popular from the past year. Make sure you check out his other portraits from throughout the year.
right? Back from the B reels, right? So first of all, I got I've been tongue tying, so I apologize. It's creative character engineering, by the way, is who our next presenters are. I don't know why I was saying what I was saying. That's my fault. I gotta be put in a corner now. It's ridiculous. Okay, so this next one, people, we have for you is gonna be another really great behind the scenes look at what they're doing at their shop. Okay, this is going to be an opportunity to see how they work with ZBrush, do some molding. They do a whole slew of work and they're gonna have parts where they're, they're using 3D printers, they're using CNC machines, they're using a lot of stuff to do this. So I'm excited for you guys to see this because uh, the team there does a lot of different things. You know, They work on a lot of different shows. So I'm excited to have Andrew and his crew up with us today from Creative Character Engineering. It's going to be a really another fun one. So buckle up. I know some people were asking about molding and stuff like that. So this is also great stuff that you're going to see right now that will line up with even that as well. So uh, I'm excited for this one. This is going to be a really a lot of another fun one behind the scenes. You got if you guys watch some of the ones from yesterday, where we were getting tours of studios and stuff. There's going to be a lot of that in this as well. So let's get the let's get the crew in here. We're going to move on now and get the creative character engineering team in here. So let's get going on this segment. There you are. Hey, everybody. hey guys. Hey guys. Hey Paul. Hey, how are you? All right. How are you? Good. First of all, I'm sorry. That's on me. So, oh no, go. it's it's totally great. You know, we're not a the most known company, the Creative Character Engineering. But I got to tell you, Paul. You know, seeing that the Space Mouse is going to be a part of ZBrush, everybody who works here is going to be asking me for one next week. So, thank you very much. Absolutely. So who we have uh, hi, I'm, Andrew Clement, go ahead. Hi, I'm Andrew Clement, and I'm the owner of Creative Character Engineering, and we are a company that specializes in what I like to call practical organic effects. We do everything from things that replicate human bodies or get glued to human bodies or get worn by human bodies. Pretty much everything that we do is surrounding the human body in one way or another, or an animal body, something. Um, and uh, we've come from a traditional background. I've been doing this for a lot of years. I started doing this professionally in 1981. So I've been doing it for a minute. Um, and uh, like everybody else, we've really started to transition into a lot more of a digital workflow. And ZBrush has been a really integral component to that. I, I can't tell you, you know, what we would do without it. I have no idea. I've, I began doing um, poly modeling for visual effects way back on Hercules and Xeno using Lightwave. And, uh, and I've transitioned into ZBrush exclusively. I, I, you know, I, I still rely on poly modeling very heavily. And, uh, and ZBrush has actually become a really big poly modeler for me. So I want to talk about a lot about uh, some of the things that we've done recently in ZBrush, how we've done it. And, uh, and I thought one of the most interesting things that we could touch upon is actually how we're going directly into mold making, uh, you know, completely surpassing the step of making a print, cleaning it up, and prepping it for molding and going through the traditional mold and making process. We were actually looking to just jumping directly into molds. And I think we've done it a couple of times for some smaller pieces. And I think it's going to become more and more of a standard part of our workflow. So uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to jump in and I'm going to show uh, on my screen. I don't know if you want to jump to my screen here, but uh, can you can you pull that up? I just wanted to show that, you know, we began from uh, that's, uh, that's my screen. That's screen. Are you sharing your screen? You need to share your screen, Andrew. I need to share my screen. Let me do that. Sorry. No worries. A little sneak peek into what I'm going to talk about. There you go. A little, yeah. Give a, a little, little teaser. Give a little teaser for Bill's part. I just so, amazed at all the stuff behind Andrew. All the. Oh, that's all this. yeah. And we've got Bird and Bill also with us today too. Was part of Andrew's team. Okay, great. Yeah, the, the people who will be joining me are Bird Deprez, who is uh, in charge of running 
a lot of these machines that you you're going to see that we use we uh, we use 3d printers laser cutters and we have a six axis robot uh, and he is a wizard at figuring out the tool paths and doing all of that sort of thing he's a new user to zbrush but he's picking it up incredibly well um, and we also have Bill Crichton who is uh, the head of our 3d department and uh, and models some of the most incredible stuff that you've seen uh, on our suits but I just wanted to show that we we began doing a uh, traditional stuff and we still do a lot of traditional stuff like Deadpool we did a lot of the appliances for that show for Deadpool himself and for some of the background mutants that you see in that show uh, and I'll show how we uh, we're segueing into doing some appliance molds actually in uh, 3d but we're also if you don't mind me showing um, we began uh, using 3D, uh, using ZBrush in earnest on shows, uh, uh, the, on the show Black Lightning. Black Lightning was really the first show that we, I had dabbled around in ZBrush doing all kinds of things, smaller things, and uh, I'd always really never considered myself fluent in ZBrush, but Black Lightning was an immersion for me, and we were actually able to create the hard parts on this suit. Uh, with ZBrush and doing all 3D printing, and, and this is the show that I really exclusively learned ZBrush on. And and then we've gone and done so many shows. Uh, if I can scroll through this, we've also done Black Lightning's daughter Thunder. We did her entire suit in ZBrush. Uh, we've done the boys recently. We've done Starlight and the Deep and Queen Maeve and Homelander and uh, uh, A Train and uh, all of the other characters are, are all in ZBrush. Uh, for Doom Patrol, we did Robot Man and Cyborg, both of which I'm going to talk about today. Uh, some more Titans characters, Wonder Girl, Star, uh, Hawk, and Dove. So you can see that it's just a tremendous, tremendous array. And with Star, Star, Star Girl, we've also done... So we've done a tremendous amount of, of suits. We've done over 200 suits by this time, uh, between the originals and duplicates and everything. So but what I really wanted to do is, is really... Uh, jump into the making of a piece here if I can grab I want to jump back to my camera for a second I just wanted to show what I'm going to show you is the uh, the making of robot man's neck now this is a, a, a project that we got we got uh, to make this uh, character robot man and he had this really complicated neck that had all of these pieces and necks are really difficult and to you know really do one they've got to be really flexible uh, and they've really got to move in every direction and the thing about this is it had all of these plates that obviously had to slide one over another so what I did is I, I just really knew that we had to get all of these parts directly off of the printer because we had absolutely no time to do it we spent a, a great deal of time engineering Robot Man's head, and what we had to do with Robot Man's head is we had to find a way to actually create it in a non-traditional way, because usually when you make something like this, you'll uh, make a head, and then you'll make an underskull under it to fit on an actor and to cinch down and really have the uh, head not joggle around. But there was every time we did that, every time we modeled something with uh, traditionally, it wound up being too big. So what we wound up having to do is make the actual outer surface and the inner surface both one and the same so we could keep it extremely tight against his head so we spent a, a fair bit of time doing that which didn't leave us a lot of time to do the neck so what we had to do is we we got our parts the hard parts off of the neck directly off the printer we have a mark forged printer that prints things that are, are durable enough that we can actually make on set pieces for them so we went that route for the external pieces but then we had to generate this silicone piece that everything would tie into uh, underneath. So I uh, was going through all different ways to do that, and I just wanted to take you through all the steps that I went through to actually get a piece on the uh, character that we could actually run uh, on a 3D systems uh, machine in Acura. Uh, we, we actually made this mold is directly 3D printed. So you can see that it's it's made out of this 3D uh, printed material, uh, fairly clear material. It's, uh, like I said, it's an Acura material, and um, we backed it up with epoxy, an epoxy with um, with cloth, traditionally in the back, because 
you know, we, we did wind up running this about four times, and it's not a perfect material. The material did wind up cracking after a while, but we, uh, after we got that many runs out of it, that was kind of the run of however many we need because we'd actually wound up changing actors for it. So after we did that, we wound up having the time to traditionally print it and mold it and go through the proper steps to really get a real uh, a mold to have a lot more longevity. But if it hadn't been for 3D printing the negative, there's no way we would have gotten it done. So I just wanted to show you the steps that I went through. So if you want to pull up my zebra screen here. So we start with a, a scan of the actor as we always do. Um, and the other guys who you're going to see me, who you're going to see talking later, they have a different way of going about modeling. But what I love to do is um, I love to just start sketching out what my suit parts are going to look like actually in poly paint right on the right on the um, right on the bust and so what that allows me to do is really quickly in like an hour, i can shoot something back to my costume designer lj shannon who who designs all of our wonderful costumes here and i can say hey is you know are these lines sort of you know what you had in mind and, and i think it's a great way to work that you know in about an hour or two i can begin to get some sort of idea of whether I'm on the right track or not. And I don't really have to spend any time modeling that I'm going to waste. Um, and there are not a lot of people that you can do with that with some, uh, some clients that you do that with, are going to be like, well, what are you showing me? I have no idea. Well, these are just lines on a, on a, on a maquette or on a, on a bust. It doesn't show me anything, but LJ understands what I'm doing. She's, you know, she knows uh, that I'm really just trying to execute really quickly. So once she approves where some of my lines are, a lot of the time, I'll personally, I'll go in with the topology brush. I love the topology brush because then I can start to just, you know, actually trace out where I am, you know, where some of my edges are going to be. Sorry, I missed that. You know, and I can start, you know, if I've got, if I've got design lines inside, I can actually, you know, follow all these design lines and, I'm, I'm doing it really quickly, so I'm going to get a lot of crap topology and crap geometry here. But you can get the idea. You know, if I've got interior lines or something like that, um, I can – let me get rid of some of these. Um, but, yeah, if I was taking more time with this, you, you can see what I'm doing. But what I can do with this is I can get a really quick um, low-resolution – there we go. So, you know, and I can, I can start to get something that, uh, you know, will actually look like my hard part contours, my silhouette. And I can look at this and I can get my silhouette correct um, really, really quickly. And by the end of the day, I can say, you know, are these really covering the areas that you want me to cover? So, so once I've done that, then I can actually really start to flesh things out and I can really start to get all of my negative pieces. So this is sort of how I got here. I, I you know, did all my, my topology brush and, you know, just basically started pulling forms around and refining them and subdividing it and, uh, and doing all that and doing some creases. And, and that's, uh, that's sort of how I got all of my outer shapes for the hard parts. So uh, that worked really well. And, uh, you know, I got approval on this. And then we could actually start to run these uh, on the 3D printer and start getting, a, uh, getting that process going. So, but then once I, I jumped from that, then I had to start thinking about how am I going to do the interior? How am I going to do that silicone sock that's going to zip up the back that allows all of these pieces to be held in place and overlap and, you know, compress one on top of another and not collapse? Lied. You know, give them a full range of movement and not expose that it's, you know, that there's really a piece of silicone underneath of it. So what I did is I took another version of all of my parts and I started to um, outline where underneath I thought my silicone sock was going to have plateaus. Basically what I wanted is I wanted a quarter inch um, silicone sock with all of these little silicone plateaus that would come up and hold all of these pieces in place. So once I had all of that, and I figured out not only where my silicone plateaus would to give some support, but I also figured out where would I need to lock these pieces down. Because what I'm going to also have to have is little pegs to register all of these silicone pieces in place, 
all these 3D printed pieces in place. So then if you take a look under this, you can see that that's what I started to do, is wherever I started to make those outlines, I actually masked off and I started to extrude out all of these areas up to the base of my, um, my 3D printed parts to begin to have some sort of support for them. Right, so the actor's wearing this underneath and you're snapping the parts. Exactly. Oh, so okay. what basically what you're taking a look at here is I've actually taken my, um, my, the cast of my actor and not only have I, uh, I've extruded my half a quarter inch here to be the re my silicone sock, but I've also given an area where there's going to be contact. I'm already starting to think about how this is going to be molding at this, molded at this point. Because I know that there's going to be areas where I'm going to have to have a gap between my two, um, my my positive and my negative mold, and there's going to be uh, areas where I'm going to have to have it have contact, so it's airtight. So when I inject silicone into this mold, it's all going to fill and it's not going to spill all over the place. So that's what these areas here are. These are areas of contact that will allow, you know, this area to fill with silicone, but this area is going to hold it back. And these areas are areas you don't want your entire mold to be in contact. You want as little points of contact between the two pieces of mold as you possibly can, because that'll give you a finer edge. If you've got too much area of contact, it's too much. Uh, it, it actually makes a, a poorer mold. So, and you'll notice here that I have a little one inch cube. That one inch cube is really important for us no matter what it is that we do. We start with a one inch cube in our scan and we keep a one inch cube through everything just to make absolutely double sure that uh, nothing's going to ever be out of scale and everything's gonna match up perfectly. So once I've done that, I went, oh, I have a little ZBrush problem. Then I went to, oh. You're out of edit mode. So oh. back to that and your stroke drag rack on. Change your stroke to drag rack on. Uh, draw. Uh, I, for some reason, I've lost it here. I've never had that happen. Sit T on the keyboard. Yep. Okay. There you go. There we go. All right. Is that the same one? That's the same one. Yeah. I don't think that's a tool. I think that's, I don't know what's going on there. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. I may have lost one here. Okay. Well, I have to skip a step. But this is basically the next step where I took my uh, original scan and I began to carve off the areas that I didn't need and I also began to add keys to it. And then what I could do is I could Boolean all of these together. So not only did I get negative keys and positive keys where I needed them to be able to actually have these things fit together, but I also hollowed it out so we would be able to actually produce uh, something that wouldn't kill us financially to have printed. It was an expensive print to have done, but it wasn't quite so bad when you compare it to how much time it would have actually taken our mold makers to actually do. So then after that, then I could actually start to really begin to construct this mold. If you want to, I'm going to, I'm going to shut all of this off so you can see really where I wound up being. Okay. So there's my, yeah, there's my positive mold. Here is the modeling that I've done. You can see all of my plateaus that are underneath that are in silicone. And now what I'm doing is I'm actually just taking, I don't know if there's a better way to do this, but what I just did is I just began, I'm a poly modeler guy, so I just created a box and I basically started dragging it around so I could get a shape that would have about, you know, somewhere around three-eighths thickness, you know, that 
really covered all of my shapes and, and gave me thickness outside of my mold, but also I could drag it in to, so I could make sure that it overlapped. So when I booleaned out my part from this, then I was going to get a really good mold surface that wouldn't have any voids. So, and I wound up doing, I found out where my, where I wanted my dividing lines to be, which were about there. And I just started to create these molds that, mold parts that completely encompass the mold. So, so now I, this is where I took care of the, the actual thickness and the surface of my mold, just making sure that, you know, these surfaces were thick enough and they penetrated enough that I was going to capture all of my, uh, all of the areas of my sculpture. But if you notice, I stayed away from each other with the, with the seam lines here. That's because I wanted to construct these mold walls and let the mold walls take care of, uh, take care of the, the actual seam. What you really want is you want, uh, you want your seams to be as, as hairline as you possibly can get them. So what this did, hold on one sec. So what this is going to do is I'm going to, uh, I'm going to create, I created these walls exactly the same way as I created everything else. I wound up making uh, little strips that were about three eighths inch thick and uh, made these, first of all, I, I, I started with a front section and I made these. And then basically the shape of these, I could make a second shape that would uh, fit, that wouldn't have these keys on, that I could Boolean out the second one. So when all of these, when I would Boolean these to the front section, but Boolean these out of the back section, it would give me mold sections that would fit perfectly together. So then what would happen with that then that came to my final piece, which this is the full negative mold. So what you're going to see here is you're going to see, I'm not showing you the core just so you can see the inside. So you can see the result of all of the Booleans. You can see all of the negative spaces of these plateaus that I sculpted in. This is the surface area of the thickness of my original. These pegs are all the negative re uh, registration points for all of my 3D printed parts. Here are my keys. Here's my, this is my contact area right here. This all allows all of my silicone to be poured in here without spilling all over the place. This is going to be a whole negative area that's got exactly the thickness that I need. And, um, and this is going to keep all of my silicone inside the mold when it's all poured under pressure. This is the area that keeps the molds from having too much contact area, which is going to create a thicker seam. And these are my keys. And this is all, thank God for live Boolean. I don't know what I would have done without it, but this that feature came along just in time for me to do this. So, and in your 3D, this is what you're 3D printing. Do you know what? This is exactly, yeah. This, what you know, using, using 3D, the pre 3D printing hub, and, you know, going off of my one-inch cube, I would say, okay, you know, tell the 3D print hub, you know, use this one-inch cube. This one-inch cube is one inch. Everything else uh, sort of corresponds to that. And uh, and we wound up with a perfectly scaled uh, negative and uh, a negative mold for the for the silicone. So what printer? Do you know what print, what printer is being used to print it out? Uh, for this, we have a lot of three D printers. We have about seven three D printers in house, but this one was too big and we needed a high resolution. So this was done uh, on a three um, D systems printer. I don't know what model it is, but I do know it is in the Acura resin, which was tough enough. If you know. We did get some cracking uh, on this mold, even with the, uh, the epoxy reinforcement on the outside. But um, but it really it got us through, and, and there was absolutely no way we could have traditionally molded it. So, so someone was asking for those thicknesses you were talking about on your walls. Are you you're using that one inch cube to get your measurements? Exactly. Yeah. Out? Yeah. No, we're using the one inch cube as sort of a reference point for everything, but it's not really what I'm using to actually measure. What I've done previously is I've gone and I have a set of, um, I've created a set of a, a whole uh, tool that I can import that has an inch cube and it has a lot of other measurements that I might need. I have everything. I go down into fractions of an inch and I go up into, you know, 
feet and meters from that. So I have this, and I also have hardware. You know, I have uh, I've created something where I've brought in, you know, all of my metric and English hardware that I can pull out of that that tool, and I can say, okay, I've got this one inch cube, but I also need to know exactly what. Um, like a sixteenth of an inch would look like in this one inch cube world. I know there's ways to do it with um, using the transpose line, but this is just much easier for me. I've just like, I look, you know, it's like I've got this virtual caliper and this virtual set of, um, of uh, scale blocks that I can use within ZBrush so that I know is always going to be accurate. Nice. This is great. They're loving this. So you showing this oh, good. down how you're doing this and making the molds. Uh, great really valuable information for everybody. Okay, I hope so. Yeah, I mean, this was really, you know, it took me a minute to figure out some of this stuff, but I mean, it really, you know, it's really straightforward. It's really, you know, if you know traditional mold making, uh, you're going to have a real big leg up because you can understand all sorts of things that you're going to need to know by, you know, about making a water tape mold and, and undercuts. Uh, undercuts are a huge, I'll, I'll talk about undercuts in, in my next piece that I'm going to talk about. Um, but you really have to make sure that you can design a mold um, that will um, not lock together. There's nothing worse than making a mold, and, and, and it's happened to me early in my career where you just don't anticipate that some of the shapes that you're going to make are not going to release from one another freely. So, uh, and I've got a, a, a one trick that I, I came up with doing, an appliance mold, that uh, I think what, that, uh, is going to be pretty helpful. So, uh, do you have any? Do you want me to keep this up? Or are there any other questions? Something people would like to see before I, I jump to something else? Uh, the only question I saw coming through, unless Joseph, I missed one. Can you model a? Can you model a joint? Uh, so, do you do any joints with any? We of we typically don't do joints. What we have been doing is, um, we've been making uh, uh, animatronic heads with skulls and with servo blocks that do have um, the ability to have put things, you know, traditional joints and traditional servos locked into these things, and they do fit one-to-one. -one. We wouldn't, in our business, typically make a joint out of 3D printing because it's just not strong enough. We would really go with um, a traditionally uh, CNC milled joint out of aluminum or steel or uh, some sort of store-bought joint. Um, so typically we use 3D printing for things that we're not going to uh, have, have as much stress on the day. So let me jump out of this then and uh, let me jump into the next one. Right, and again, people, Andrew comes from a background of a traditional sculptor and worked on uh, so many films. So he's just taking his process and expanding it and uh, adding a beautiful workflow with him and the team using digital ZBrush and then still doing his techniques that he's done for years. Thank you. Uh, and I, and I, have to give a, I have to give a giant shout out to Joseph Drust. Um, it's right here. I know. I see him. He's right on the screen. Um, no, back no. when I, I, I really want to get into 3D print, we had done a show, we had done a show called um, Repo Man, and we really wanted to uh, expand the 3D printing. You know, we did a lot of 3D printing on that show, but after that, I was like, I really want to do things in-house. So we bought a resin printer, and we, exactly, yeah, we brought a 3D printer, a uh, resin printer and a form labs, and, uh, you know, Joseph had this beautiful thing, and he was kind enough to let us print that, uh, and, and it was just a wonderful thing to allow me to be certain that all of our 3D printers would work together. That was done on three different 3D printers, and I just wanted to make sure that everything would calibrate and everything would glue together and it all fit together perfectly. And you, I know you mentioned, right, this was a huge learning process, right, doing this one. It was huge. I mean, you know, at the time it took me way longer because I had to break everything down to fit on these printers. It wouldn't take me nearly as long today, but, but it was a great trial by fire, and it really taught me a lot, and I'm, and I'm so grateful. Um, but let me jump on. Yeah, look, the helmet turned out awesome. Thank you. So it turned out excellent. Uh, I am going to jump. I don't know why this is up. I think that's why Andrew's pulling up another file. That's for everybody too, right? That's a good way to learn certain features. It's a good way to learn certain workflows. Like put yourself in that workflow and just go through it. And then you'll learn something and you'll get faster and faster and you'll discover new tools that will help you get to your end result even faster. I think that's a, 
just like the Hasbro guys were mentioning, to learn articulation, buy some toys and literally take them apart and reverse engineer it. And it's one of the fastest ways to learn, in all honesty. Well, I, and I have to say, you know, I, I dabbled in ZBrush for many years before Black Lightning came on, but it's, uh, it's like a, a foreign language. If you immerse yourself in ZBrush, uh, you'll make incredible gains so fast. Yeah. All right. So this is the next thing that I, I want to show, which was sort of uh, a really thing for us, which is generating an actual appliance mold for 3D, uh, from a 3D print, a direct 3D print. Uh, so this is a, a scan that we actually did in-house. We have a photogrammy unit. Uh, there's a, a bunch of cameras on it. I think we're up to uh, over 60 cameras now. And uh, we did this of Brent Picker. This is an in-house scan that we had done. Um, and I decided I wanted to do uh, an appliance scar on his cheek. So basically, you can see that we've got a raw scan here, and we've got our one-inch cube that we always have. And the next thing that I would do is I would start to break down uh, the area of his face that I would want to... Um, let me shut off live Boolean. So you can see. So I've, I've chosen the area of the face that I want to actually put the put the appliance cylinder on and uh, gone and oh, and decided that that was where it was going to be. Now, uh, I want to show you a couple things that I'm actually going to do. Because I'm going to go back and forth with live Boolean, and I'm going to add certain things, and I'm going to track certain things. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do, and the first thing that you normally, whenever you're creating an appliance positive, is you get rid of undercuts, any areas that are going to make your mold get trapped together. So what I've done is I've taken some uh, primitives, which uh, is really a great thing because I can be certain that my, uh, my surfaces are going to be geometrically uh, even. And I cleared out using a cylinder, I cleared out behind the nose, and I cleared out inside the nostril using a little bit of a, um, a sphere there. Now that what that's going to do is just if I left you know this hole there, I could have a piece of plastic go into that nose, and it's not going to be able to release. But I just wanted to show uh, this one thing that I thought was really interesting that I decided to start using. A lot of the time when you are making an appliance mold, you're going to use a, a round bit down key, just so you have uh, areas of registration that your two molds will go together. Now I was starting to do that for a little while, but then you know. In the virtual world, what I decided was even smarter is just to go in with a capsule shape. Because a lot of the time when you're using, even in the real world, a traditional router bit, which is a... Sometimes you'll have areas that will still be an undercut, even though you've used this round thing. So, But if you use a so that's oriented in the direction that you want to pull out your mold, you're never going to have an undercut for these. So what I did using live Boolean... I actually created this is going to be this is going to be my positive for my generating my appliance mold, and I'm going to go through this really quickly because I think I'm about to go long and shortcut everybody. So, so but then what it, what I did is once I had this positive, I actually made a, a replica of it, which is hidden inside of it, and but I also scaled it, and I made sure that the keys didn't get in the way. So this has just been scaled in the y-axis a little bit. So I have this flesh-colored um, positive sitting underneath, which what I can do now is I've sketched out in polypate where I want my, my wound to go, and I can actually go in and I can start to begin to use, uh, I can start to mask off certain areas, but I can also start to sculpt, and that'll draw through my duplicate and I can actually see it'll look like I'm sculpting in clay and getting some sort of change in the surface. So then, once I'm done sculpting, I'll come up with something like this, which is not only my, uh, my scar appliance that I've sculpted here, but it's, I've also sculpted, like you saw me do in the last mold, my flashing area, which leaves my keys exposed, but then it's going to minimize the amount of... Uh, uh, surface area that's going to make me have a bad mold. But from this, I can actually do, again, uh, I can go through the entire process and I can put a... Oh, can't find it. Shut off live Boolean. Okay. 
Let me see real quick. Yep. There we go. So doing the same thing. Now I get these these moles again, just using Boolean to pull out from that what I you what you just saw me do to get a native mold. And then if you want to jump to my camera real quick. Okay. Camera. So uh, basic, basically, these are appliance molds directly off the printer. This one I actually uh, filled with a dimensionally solid resin, so it would give it a little more heft, and it wouldn't break if I began to uh, to put a lot of clamping pressure on it. But that actually got me a little silicone appliance that directly off the printer that I can go and apply, and that's exactly how we would apply anything on the day. So, and I didn't get a chance to show Cyborg's head. I was going to do that. But this is another great appliance that we made. Um, we were tasked with making something that was going to be a, uh, uh, a rigid appliance, but reusable every day. And I didn't want to actually have it be made out of a soft material that would look bad after a week or so of application. So we did generate this hard piece that does glue to his head, but it does have a replaceable uh, foam latex gasket on the inside that we can replace uh, every time we need to. So. Now to my presentation. I'm going to hand it over to Bill Crichton. I'm so glad that you watched me. Um, I hope I said something that, that somebody can take away. Yeah, absolutely. This has been great. Yeah, awesome. Very awesome. Yeah, a lot of people are enjoying it. So we're going to go to Bill now. Bill, you're up. Cool. Hey, guys. I actually, uh, I do have Cyborg open right here, so I can show you that oh, you do? Uh, real quickly uh, in terms of what Andy's talking about. Uh, just an extraction to create this gasket. Magnets, uh, this is magnet to magnet uh, brought out on top of that. And then we got the hard piece. Okay, I'll just show on this real quick. And then live booleans. Again, for all the details, clients are gonna change this uh, constantly. Move this here, move that there. Uh, really wanna utilize uh, live booleans as much as possible. All right, so now I'm just going to talk about uh, Deathstroke a little bit. And what we get is usually some really nice uh, concept art. This is Luca. I've never said his last name before. Uh, Nima Lato. And great thing about working with a concept artist like Luca is he's actually built a lot of this stuff in ZBrush as well to get his uh, turnaround so he can do his back views and all that really quickly. So he'll sketch stuff out in ZBrush and do his paint overs in Photoshop. And so what's really nice working with uh, some of the clients that we do with that, I'll actually receive those files from Luca and we can use those to better understand maybe a side view or back view, something that's not otherwise been defined uh, for a lot, of, a lot of what we do. We're the ones kind of defining that from the front paint view. Um, so I saw a lot of people in the chat asking about scans. Um, we'll get scans either from vendors. We do. We just built a 3D scanner rig here. Uh, Bird and Andy built one. I also have a hand scanner, a Nine Scan Pro Plus, and we can scan, you know, boots, different clothing items, whatever we need to start building on top of. And that's where a lot of our our scale and and base meshes come from are from the 3D scans. So step one is really cleaning up that scan. I got the raw scan, usually an actor. Uh, this is just a, a purchase one, so we're not displaying any of our actors um, who might not like it. So really, the first step is to clean up our scans. If uh, they're getting a, any appliances and stuff, we might clean up the skull cap. Otherwise, I might just leave it alone. And to do that, I've just duplicated this. Did a quick high-res Dynamesh just to close any holes. And I remeshed it down to something that looks more like this. Subdivided that up. And then I just projected the original raw scan back onto it. And this is super useful, even if you just have a sculpt of something, to be able to get a subdivided version of that. So don't forget about projection. I'm in the wrong spot, though, subtool. Uh, project. I use that all the time. Uh, that way it's really nice working with clients. You can always come back down to more of a primary form and make any drastic changes and keep all your tertiary elements and that kind of stuff. 
uh, for this guy, I even came in and blocked out just with a Q cube, some lines and with my subdivided one, I just kind of reposed them to be more straight on. And then I'll start building uh, costume pieces on top of that. Now also from uh, our department and different productions, we'll get these nice breakdowns of what's gonna be the hard part elements that CC is gonna make. Another thing to keep in mind with those two is practical lighting, especially on someone such as Black Lightning. Let me hop over to season three Black Lightning here. This is just on our generic model again. Uh, but we gotta think about where to hide batteries, components, hardware, all that kind of stuff. Um, so this wasn't in his, uh, his concept art. But Andy ended up designing uh, this really nice uh, back pouch. And I went in uh, with some uh, the components that I actually built in CAD just to get really exact dimensions on them because that's just faster for me because I come from CAD. And plugged them in so we got a little hole, flipped the switch, and turned on his whole suit. Uh, Andy also went in and made a black lightning mask here. This is all Z Modeler brush. That's the print file version, but this is all Z Modeler. I use Z Modeler every day. I'm from a surface. And one reason to use Z Modeler every day is because, and they kind of touched on this with your Mandalorian helmet, so many notes that we get from clients oh, can we round the edge or chamfer the edge? And you know you can do that instantly uh, with Z Modeler, as opposed to more of a high res sculpt. But we do utilize everything on our plate here. Um, I was also just gonna. Andy ended up touching on this, but since we're only getting like front views, perhaps, or a back view doesn't really tell me where this mask falls, I will use poly paint. And a lot of times too, uh, pre-COVID, I'll have the costume designer or any sort of client looking right over my shoulder and giving me live instructions. So poly paint becomes really a great way to say, does it land here? Does it end here? And we got to think about how we're attaching that uh, to the face, whether it's magnets or a band that's hidden by another element. Yeah, that's a good way to go about it. Uh, paint it off first and then work with your team. Paint it off, get my footprint. Yeah. Uh, instead of the topo brush, what I'll do a lot of times is I just I just rip this face off of uh, Super Average Man. And that already has some nice topology, especially around the eyes. So if I'm going to come in and build a mask, um, I can just throw that on there. And I like to use uh, Z-Project. Uh, just throw that back down, back down onto the form. And another thing, I'm going to mirror and weld this and I'm going to work in symmetry even if it's diving into his head on one side the human body is not actually symmetrical um, but I'm going to work in symmetry because it's literally half the work and then from there I can extrude and I'm really getting pretty good at eyeballing this based on uh, the dimensions here but I do have a one inch cube and I could come in just to touch on that a little bit more I like to use the modeler brush here and insert multiple edge loops. And I can go ahead and divide this into, well, I've got to do 31 divisions. I can divide that into 30 seconds of an inch and you know, just count it off. I use this all the time just to get uh, some quick, quick dimensions. So now I got 330 seconds and I might drag that up and use my uh, scales off grades. I might bring this in and then extrude to that dimension from my surface that I've placed on here. Yeah, that's a good tip. That's a good one for the taking. I use this cube. all the time. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, just using the again. Insert multiple edges. Oh, come on. Not on my cube. That's why. And then, then you just got to know a little bit of math, but if I want eight inches, I'll divide it by seven. And now I can get an eighth inch. Maybe I'll just pull that out. And I know that this dimension here is an eighth inch. 
I do like that. I, I use that quite a lot. So now I've got a simple uh, dynamic subdivided extraction. And why I like starting with the surface is because I know that the shell is evenly extruded all around. Uh, so it's really going to help me in, in 3D printing. And then from there, I just uh, subdivide it up. And now I can go in and sculpt, you know, some little more uh, Batman-y uh, anger frown lines. And what I'll do, another reason using Qcube, I got all these poly groups really nice so I can quickly um, oops, mask off what I don't want to affect on my edge lines and that kind of thing. Now I can go in and just really sculpt on top of this, come down to my subdivision levels, blend this out a little more. And this isn't just for mass, I use this for every single uh, piece that we work on. And then I can quickly UV this and UV master. I won't have time to show that kind of thing, but I quickly UV'd this, masking off any sort of detailed panel lines. And then I've just come down here, I've turned layers on Right when working with clients, we want to really utilize our layers so we can tone stuff down, turn stuff off completely. Because uh, we're not just getting notes back, not just from the costume designer and their team. It goes all the way up the ladder to the showrunner, uh, to the producers. Uh, we get a lot of feedback, and you really have to build your your part in such a way that you can quickly edit it. Nothing's concrete. So you are you're UV mastering this with polygrouping, and then you're yep. having your pattern, and you're using surface noise to put the pattern based upon UV. Yep. So I've just turned on uh, my UVs with the surface noise plugin, and now if they come back and say, "Oh, you know, we really want it to be smaller, uh, different, even a different kind of texture, smaller." Yeah, the scale scales on this stuff changes all the time. You know, maybe oh well, we found this fabric. Uh, can it match that fabric scale? And I got to come in and, and tweak all these settings. Let me recenter this. A uh, great way to add text. You're putting on a layer so you can take it on and off whenever you need it as well. Correct. So once I apply this, I apply it on a layer. And I can tell you know, something there. If you don't mind me saying, sometimes it even depends on what kind of a finish we're going to put on it. If it's a thicker paint, we're going to want a more intense texture or you know, vice versa. That's true. And so the layers allow me to also show the client more what the final product's going to look like. I'll tone it down for that. And then I'll beef it, punch it back up for uh, the 3D print. We've got a mold uh, paint primer. So we prime it before molding and prime it after. Uh, so I really got to start thinking about that. So when you guys are doing this, because you're doing this as a distinct pattern, right? It's going to be a major thing that's seen on the character a lot. Are you guys sending images first? Or are you guys like printing off one and then giving the client, here's a printed off version of what the pattern would look like in real life? It's absolutely a combination of both. Uh, we do images as much as we can, get as much feedback before going into a print. But then I'll run a test print, uh, either on our Mark Forge, also on the form. Uh, those are all affordable printers. And on our Raise printer. So we'll do tests. And something like this, I might uh, print three different versions of the detail level and even go all the way through a paint test and that kind of thing. Another method we utilize here at CC is not even uh, printing some of these textures, uh, like Deathstroke on Solo. Uh, Deathstroke gets carbon fiber textures across all of his parts. We actually printed them clean and then laid on a carbon fiber uh, fabric or vinyl. Uh -huh. So that way we're not sanding and worrying about sanding all the detail. It's it's just gonna be there uh, down the line. Are you guys doing that bath thing, carbon thing, where you put, it's got the sheet in the bath? Is that the one? Or would you We've it? looked at that, but that's not really, uh, right now we haven't found a way in our workflow to make that really work. Oh yeah, there's just some sheet. I've, I've never water screen yeah. uh, dipping yeah, water screen thing. Yeah, it's it's a yeah. lot. It's a, the, the vinyl's a lot thicker than you would think. I, I oh, is it? A little bit. Yeah, it, it looks really diaphanous and, and soft, but it's really just not. Mm -hmm. How do you guys do? You, how do you guys calculate, Andrew? They're asking how do you calculate mold shrinkage for all this that you guys are doing? Do you guys do anything? In Typically, we choose molds uh, materials that really don't shrink that much. The foam latex does shrink, so we have to do things with that. Uh, and somebody asked why we went with foam latex instead of silicone, and the the answer is glueability. Um, but it, most of the most of the shrinking 
package of most of our mold and casting materials is really nominal, so that's not really a giant factor. Okay. Uh, somebody asked about CAD, and I come from CAD, so I use CAD quite a bit. Uh, not so much lately. I'm building everything inside ZBrush now and using my cube. Uh, but for something like Deathstroke's belt veneer, you know, I was given exact dimensions of uh, the leather pieces they want to use. Uh, I need to know that this is going to be thick enough uh, to be molded and cast and not uh, lose this whole middle section of that piece. So I actually drew out uh, in CAD really quickly uh, sort of my uh, template here and then remade this in Z Modeler and just extruded it and placed it around his body. So you did that a couple at a time. You didn't do like the bridging to start off. And then... I didn't do the bridging. I think I started in the back of them. Yeah. And then just I just, just love going. control and dragging with my gizmo and bringing it around and, and shaping it around around there. Um, you could see so much uh, Z modeler that I was using on all of these pieces. You can actually see that what we we've gone in and we've scanned the muscle suit underneath. Oh, yeah. the... CCE will also build this foam muscle suit. So the, the actors are usually already really fit, but it will even go in and really soup them up. Uh, so this was scanned with our hand scanner, just on uh, the actor's body form. And then that way we can build on top. That just uh, makes our, our hard parts more accurate to the, to the final suit. Absolutely. Uh, these were match moved uh, onto the muscle suit here. Uh, his chainmail pieces. What about the fitting for the actor? How many fittings do you guys have to go through? For <laughs> a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Typically, as many as we can get. I mean, uh, how how many? Four or five fittings? I mean, it depends on how local they are. Uh, you know, how many times we can get them. But Bill, what would you say? I'd say probably on average about six. Yeah. And the local thing is something to talk about too with three D scanning. I don't have to get an actor in. LA in the studio, especially during uh, COVID and quarantine, we had actors in Canada, we got them in Texas or wherever they're from in Atlanta, and they can go uh, to a vendor there, get scanned, and we don't lose any of our work. You know, we could get going right away. Mm -hmm. uh, they also, we don't have to cover their mouths. Um, you know, some people get claustrophobic, and that's no longer uh, really a concern. Are you finding photogrammetry is pretty much the go-to for scanning for you guys as the most what people have been doing for to get in the scans? Or is uh, any so photogra things? photogrammetry is absolutely the way to go. It's is nothing yeah. is going to beat that with in terms of resolution. Do we have any time to still talk to Bird? I would love to get yeah, to him yeah. over. No, absolutely. Sure. Yeah, I can hand it off to Bird here. Yeah. Do you think it's about time? I think I think we're probably sure. running close. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. No worry. No worry. You got time. You got time. It's just me and Joseph next. No, we're after this. Oh, you got, you yeah. We're after this. So you can go still. I don't want to cut you short, Bill. I just want to give Bird a chance. Oh, no, no problem. And Andrews, no worries, because we already said me and Joseph are probably not going to – we're going to be going past the time anyway. So okay. <laughs> all good. Go ahead. So do you want to go full webcam on Bird? Bird, what do you say? Go here, Bird. Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yep. Yes. So I'm a beginning ZBrush user, so don't expect any tips and tricks from me. Uh, basically what I'm doing is trying to figure out how to use ZBrush from like our production standpoint. Uh, behind me here, I've got our robot. And he's working on a bust right now. You can kind of see his head coming out there. Um, they'll talk about live moving a lot. That's where I'm actually learning anything right now. And it's about kind of splitting up the bodies and figuring out how to get parts into the machine in the first place. Uh, some of the problem of making things of people standing in weird positions and that kind of stuff. So ZBrush to me, it's, I'm more of a cat person myself and I'm in the production process. So you wouldn't normally be using the more artistic tool. Uh, for us though, it helps for me to come through and be able to cut things apart and find the areas that, because like for the robot, it's different than a mold. There's different issues that you have and how it can cut things, the undercuts that it can do. Uh, it takes it away from the 3D department and can give it to me so that I can be able to handle those things and have a little bit more control in that process. Uh, we can see what he's doing right now. The edges where the bust is actually cut off, 
it's kind of important for like the shoulder cuts and the arm cuts whenever we do a costume, how the costume comes up under somebody's arm or in their, uh, the different joints of your body can be a, a tight spot or you need more room kind of thing. That helps me in, in just being able to see where, kind of where like it's going to have a problem. And you can see if someone has an issue where there might be a little password overhang that the machine could kind of situation. Um, How many axes is that bird? How many axes is that? It's a six axis robot, and the table itself is the uh, seventh axis. It's got a rotary table on the bottom there. And what material are you, what material are you, are you doing right now? What, what are you using? Uh, that's a six pound urethane foam. And it is, <clears throat> for the other person's question there, it is a KUKA. It's a KR210. Uh, so it's just your typical small industrial robot with a 12,000 RPM router uh, head on the end. Awesome. That's great. And then you somebody asked here. somebody asked our hands still an issue in full body scans and, and you know we like the uh, photogrammetry scans because they do take it in an instant and there's no chance of somebody wavering. But we don't typically rely on the body scans for uh, the hands. We will if we're gonna be doing gloves or something like that, we will take traditionally molded uh, hand casts and head casts. Just so we have that, that backup. Just so we can double check that everything is really uh, perfect to life. So you always do both. You'll do both. Then you'll do a, an actual traditional both of the actor and then do a photogrammetry. We'll, we'll do both, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then from that uh, plaster cast of the life cast, I'll 3D scan it again to get a, a cleaner version if the hands didn't come out in the uh, body scan. We you like guys, having backup. We don't do anything once. Do you guys scan the, the cast sometimes? Because obviously now you don't have the actor and it's perfectly still. Do you yep. guys scan those as well to really get the, because then you can use a laser scanner and go really slow. Yeah, exactly. Or sometimes there wasn't going to be a, a hard piece on their, a sculpted piece on their hand and oh, now it's changed. They, they added some stuff. Um, so sometimes we, we got to walk back and I'll scan the, uh, the live casting. Right. Okay. Yeah, your art director comes knocking. Guess what? <laughs> you have to do now. Yeah, we found it's money in the budget. Other departments, we we share data with other departments, and you know, it's nice to be able to have something for them. You know, we've got a, a traditional life cast of the makeup department, or, or whatever. Uh, one one thing I just want to say really quickly, looking at the TV behind Andy, one thing that ZBrush allows us to do is we'll have a meeting with all of our department heads, and I'll throw up the model, and we'll zoom around it, and we'll talk about hey, what can I do uh, before printing and outputting? Uh, any sort of things that they see, hey, this might be an issue, and we'll solve them right there in a, in a quick half hour meeting. Yeah, it gets instant feedback for you. Okay, you make a change right there. Yeah, can we mute Bert? <laughs> when he stood up, that machine got a lot bigger. <laughs> <laughs> the big robot. I saw somebody had asked about smallest size we can go with. Um, our smallest tool in the machine is actually a an eighth inch bit. So we do eighth inch round over end mill. You can actually get quite detailed stuff out of it. And, and it's a great, it's a, I'm sorry, what were you gonna say, Paul? Was that, is that the only um, access machine you have or do you guys have other CNC machines? Is that the one, the only one you guys have in your shop? That's that's the only one we have, but it's really versatile. I mean, we can take the foam and we can tool it up to a greater detail. And we've even, you know, Bert has helped me put clay on it in the past. We actually sculpted a, a, a creature out of clay. Yeah, great. Because I mean, they do that all the time in in uh, you know auto design, but we just decided to try it here, and it worked great. Well, you were doing an experiment too, Andrew, like where you were printing stuff and then hand sculpting on it again after the process right you were doing yeah, I think that was that was the cnc that was that robot yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, okay yeah because andrew was at monster blues son of monster blues and he had a big bus he was working on he was talking to me about how he was, that was pretty awesome too the way you were doing that i think it's a great marriage of bringing in here to digital with your digital and marrying all this together is a great way to work and use the tools right and use the benefits that you get from each one of them yep. mm -hmm. Does Bird have anything that he wants to share on screen inside of ZBrush or anything else like that, or just to make sure? No. Okay. <laughs> just want to make sure. We don't want to leave you. 
We want to make sure if you have something inside of ZBrush, you want to share that. We'll but it's that it one. really is a, it's a testament to how you know ZBrush how you know it's gotten so easy to use and it's you know Bird can just he really just hit the ground running and he's done great. I yeah, guess so how, long, that, how long you been using it, Bird? Like when when did you start using ZBrush? Uh, about a year ago. I oh, got into CCE. I kind of shoved my foot in the door when they were moving and helped them out with some facility stuff. And then the robot showed up and I kind of took over there. So I was the guy that had to figure out how to make it make things. Uh, you're the, you're that guy. Figure it out. Figure it out. You know, the robot looks really good and it's like, wow, I'd really love to have one. And, you know, but the one thing you don't realize is how long it takes to, you know, with something that's got that many axes, how long it takes to create a tool path for it. I mean, it really is an art to, to doing that. And Bird has really sussed that out. It's, it's incredible how, how, you know, what you've got to do to it. Because, you know, it, a robot like that, its instinct is to destroy itself, destroy the enclosure, and to destroy whatever part it's working on. And if you can keep it from doing that, then you've really succeeded. Right. That's really cool. Yeah. That is awesome. He's doing a, a bust of, what's the bust of? Yeah, it's a bust of uh, Crest Williams. He's the actor that plays Black Lightning, actually. Um, and you can, I picked him because you could kind of see some beard detail, but I didn't quite get down to the beard to see it. Because, um, yeah, yeah so with, the, with an eight-inch eight inch bit, you can actually do pretty good detail from it. Uh, you can see pretty good from the nose up, too. You can see you can see from the nose up the, the really yeah. structure of his face and everything, too. And we typically wouldn't, uh, unless it was just for reference, we wouldn't use the robot to create a uh, something for the face. You know, it just the resolution isn't quite there. I would love to take a look at that uh, that Form 3L. I think that that's going to be quite a game changer. Yeah. Do you guys do any maquette stuff for the the shows that you're working? Oh on? yeah, we, we try to generate a maquette for. If you want to see, you want to go full screen on Andrew's for me. There you go. I'll bring a couple. Here's our here's our black lightning oh. maquette, which is really great. I mean, you got all of these parts. You've got the scan, and you can just you know do some great. Things. Got here's our cyborg, and, and you guys are just 3D printing these out and then just hand painting them right there in the shop. Yep, exactly. Or you just you, know, you gotta have your illuminated <laughs> Yeah, you gotta have light. That's great. <laughs> Tell the director, look over here, look over here. <laughs> well, all the pieces too on your wall are just amazing too. What you thank got. you very much. Yeah. Years worth of work, right? A lot of that is your claim working too. And what I've really started to do is, you know, I love ZBrush. Even if I'm going to sculpt something in clay completely, I love beginning a sketch process in ZBrush. I can go home at night. I can be in bed. You know, I can just be doodling, and, and I can come up with something. I can really flesh it out, and then I can, you know, print a miniature of it that I could actually have with me when I went to attack something full size in clay. And it's just so much faster than actually like iterating designs in clay. This has been awesome, guys. I really appreciate you guys sharing so much of your right, studio nice. number one and sharing all this behind the scenes stuff. Like, thank you. What we're trying to do with this, you know, with the pandemic, with cameras, seeing what we could do to up the up the presentations a little bit here, right? Yep. So it was really awesome to see all the stuff that you guys were able to share with us. I really appreciate that. Thank right. you very much. We're really honored to be here. We're, you know, ZBrush is just such a huge part of our lives. It's wonderful to be a part of this community. So, so Andrew, I don't know if you saw, but a couple of people were chiming in. Uh, they're liking the, looks like a fun place to work. How do they uh, get to work there at uh, the Creative Character Engineering? Uh, send a resume if you've got any kind of skill. You know, you never, we never know what we're going to need. You know, we need all kinds of skill sets I, and I and that's one of the things I love about uh, about what it is that we do is you know people come from all these crazy different backgrounds you know just in the three people that we've got here where our backgrounds are all so diverse you know and you've got people who are you know we do costumers and milliners and people who specialize in this and that and feather work and hair people and you know we'll take anybody we, you know, we're always looking for good talented new people so yeah uh, creativecharacter.com is our website, and there's a there's a place on there where you can get in touch with us. Okay. You, do you go anywhere to recruit people, or are you just pretty much just? Well, you know, you can usually find us, as you know, at Monster Palooza. We're there every you know. Once that becomes a thing again, we'll be there again. Um, Any and other we'd, love to, we'd love to branch out, and we'd love to do other things. You know, we'd love to do this. You know, anything ZBrush related. You know, we'll show up for if you invite us. 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we would love to have you. When we get back to reality where we all can hug each other and touch you and, and stuff, we can have you for, uh, we always have um, <clears throat> not, uh, what the portfolio reviews, right? And that's a great mm -hmm. spot for people to show you their work and you can talk to them. We would absolutely love to have you for something like that too. Great, we love, we love portfolios. I love seeing fresh new takes on fresh new ideas and you know, an exciting new talent. Yeah, so we've, they've shared the, the link to you guys' site in the chat. So for those of you that are interested, there you go. Click that link and then you can get a hold of them. So it would be a great way to communicate and uh, reach out and show Andrew some of your work. Get in that movie magic. That's right. It's really cool stuff. So are you guys mostly just doing films and TV? Or are you guys branching out in anything else as well? That you uh you know, we do films, TV, commercials. Uh, you know, I used to do a, a, just a ton of theme park related stuff. Um, not so much anymore. Um, really, our niche is television. You know, we've, we've been so fortunate to, to get involved with, you know, all of these wonderful uh, superhero television shows. And it doesn't look like it's going to end anytime soon. And the boys, you know, just all of these different uh, production companies coming to it's just been a fantastic thing and just such an exciting i always wanted to get into this aspect of it i love uh not only do i love makeup but i love suits and space suits and all kinds of things like that and that you know even though we've done these superhero shows but i think that we you know we could just expand so much on what we do and there's just such an untapped vista of things in front of us it's just so exciting you know I would love to do a lot of a lot of spacesuit designs of our own internally, and I would love to start creating our own product. I, you know, I've got ideas for short films that I would love to, you know, have the the freedom. Now that we've got this space and we're really in it, we've only been in this new space for a couple of years, and finally we're getting to the point where it really works, and all the departments are, are have what they need. You know, and now I can step back a little bit and maybe you know start to explore some of those ideas, get some the original uh, some original properties of our own. That's awesome. Well, I know if anybody's lucky enough to work with Andrew, the years of knowledge and the stuff he has is unparalleled. Like I'm sure Bill and Bert, you're probably eating it up. I'm I'm a kid in a candy store. Yeah, you know, working with a master sculptor and learning from him every day is. Yeah, you guys got to realize Andrew. I'm a kid from Denver. I'd yeah, never you guys gotta realize Andrew is huge, man. Like the stuff and the work that Andrew has is just it's amazing. Crazy. I, oh, yeah. I, Watching your work for years, Andrew. I, I, I feel like I feel like I'm still beginning. I feel like the the best is ahead of me. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I think artists like you too that are just have all that wealth and that information from your background of clay, and then when you get into something like ZBrush, mm -hmm. it just mm -hmm. you know the things you do. It's just like what the heck, man. That's that's beautiful and amazing the stuff that you're doing. So let me let me show. Uh, well, if I go so I really I just want you guys to understand that are watching. Andrew's been in the film industry for a long time. He's worked on a lot of big films and big stuff. So this is a treat to have him be a part of this for us today. This is a, I, I finished this up in ZBrush, and this is one that I've got to paint up soon. I really would love to have this for sale at, uh, at Monster Palooza or something next time. I thought a little crazy cool. design of my own. Nice. And you're airbrushing. You're gonna airbrush paint it all. I'm, I'm gonna airbrush. Yeah, this is yeah. This is the just the base translucent skin tone of the cast, uh, the cast urethane. But we're gonna yeah, just go from there. A little That's little awesome. pentagram goat of my own design. Yeah. So <laughs> when we get back to the real world, hopefully, guys, don't get to Monster Palooza. Andrew's always there, man. Talk to him. Mm -hmm. You do both, right? You do Monster Palooza and of Monster Palooza, right? Oh, yeah, both. Yeah, and I love talking to people. I'm usually working on some kind of piece, either yeah. sculpting or painting something there, but I just love chatting with people all day. It just, it's just so fun to meet people who, who have a like mind. Yeah, absolutely. Guys, I can't thank you enough for being a part of the summit this year, opening up your studio and being here with us. It, it's so, such an honor. Yeah, yeah really. Well, it's an honor for us, honestly, too, to see what you're doing with the application and see how you're using yeah, it. Yeah, really, really cool. Thing. Yeah, especially the stuff, Andrew, you guys were talking about, mold making and the prosthetics. That's very different and unique. So mm -hmm. really cool to see how you're using it. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Great. Thank Thanks you. so much, guys. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you guys all. Hopefully we see you three in the chat, maybe, yeah. throughout the rest of the day. Yeah, yeah. for sure. It's going to be wild and crazy next with me and Joseph and a bunch of tips and tricks and... <laughs> I don't know what will end. I don't <laughs> so know either. Forget thank, the schedule so now. Thanks, right now. I want, can I just say thank you to everybody for watching? I'm, I'm so humbled no, that you took it. I'm, I'm, so, I'm so grateful.
Absolutely. Thank you guys. I really appreciate you guys uh, being with us. It's been awesome. And uh, I'll be chatting with you guys in email after this for sure. All right, great. Thanks, guys. Take Bye -bye. care. Bye. Bye. All right. Okay. Let the let the crazy the fun's gonna start soon. Let the craziness begin. Well, we got to do some giveaways, right? So, yeah. Well, I had one question. These this is a backdrop. They're not three D. Okay. Yeah. No, so we had, we had a, we had a question about that. They are three D. <laughs> they are three D, but it's not a two D backdrop. That would have been that would have been cool actually if you had those as prints. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure Joel has them. He's he's probably got them all printed out now. Yeah. Well, those are, those are, yeah, that's an older one that he did. That is study. Old, yeah. Yeah. He did studies on that was like a study thing that he did for that. So, um, I like that. All right. So let's do some giveaways here. Huh? Shall we? Let's show our image here. Let's see. Everyone's ready again. Uh, when you are registering, you need to make sure you, uh, put the chat nickname that you're actually using in this chat, whether you're on Twitch, YouTube, or Facebook right now, that's how you're gonna win some of these items. So please make sure you do that. We're gonna be giving away some stuff right now. So let me start with, we'll start with a Nomen Workshop one year subscription. So let's give this away. All right, let me get into my prize section here. Hold on, let me make sure I'm picking the right one. Draw my winner. Uh, there we go. And again, we're looking for you in the chat. Say, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. I'm going to put the name that we're looking for in the chat. Hey, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to figure this is probably a name. I'm going to, I'm trying to, uh, follow up. Mart, I'm going to say Mart Zalos, or maybe it could be Luis, uh, with the last part. I'm going to assume this is probably someone's name that's just all together. So, there you're here. You're here. There you go. There you go. There you go. I you are a winner. Confirmed. You're confirmed as a win. A win. <laughs> right? So there you go. Welcome. There you go. There's the first one. Let's do another one. Let's do another one. Let's, let's do another see. one. Let's see what I got here. All right. Let's do let's do another lifetime membership to Zbush Jewelry Workshops. All right. So let me draw a winner here. Oh, Hokeem, Hokeem Jensen, probably not pronouncing that right at all, but forgive me. There you go. That's who I'm looking for, right? For the winner of lifetime membership to Zebrush Julie Workshops. And I know Thomas was in here, right? I don't know if he's still here. I don't know why. There he is. Okay, so Thomas is here. So there's our winner for another one of Thomas's awesome classes, okay, that you guys would want to actually get into. If you want to get into jewelry, this is a way to go for sure. All right, let's do another one. Let's do another one before we get we get going on our next segment. Let's do let's do this one. Let me show this image. Let's do one of Pablo's the 3D concept artist, ZBrush for illustration. Okay, so let's draw that winner. Let's see who we got. S Animation 3D. S Animation or S Animation 3D. However you want to go with that. It. <laughs> who I'm looking for. I'm not sure the way you want me to pronounce it. I don't know if it's S Animation 3D or S Animation 3D. You have just won this ZBrush for Illustrators course from 3D Concept Artists. Are you here? Sanimation 3D, are you here? That's who we're looking for, right? He's there. He or she All or right. There. Wow, we're having a good turnout right today. I like it. You guys are bringing tears to my eyes. I'm not going to lie. Bringing tears to my eyes right now. <laughs> All right, let's do let's do another one. Let's do another one. Uh, let's show this. Let's do another. Hey, you know what? Let's do another 3D mouse. Let's go for it. Let's do a 3D mouse here. Uh, I'm going to draw the winner. Oh, uh, JJ Motion Studio. That's just sound. That's a, that one rolls right out. I like that name too. JJ Motion. <laughs> JJ Motion Studio. I feel like I do. The, JJ Motion. He's here. Boom. Just like that. You're here. You have just won 
one of these mice. You've just won a mouse. Trust, what do you think? We got time for one more? You got time for one more. Okay. Now you're putting a Boba Fett here, though. What's that? A Boba Fett up right now. Oh, you know, well, that's the one that Tom was showing. That's the one mm -hmm. that Tom showed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's do one of these. Let's do one of these. Let's do a one on one mentorship from XMD Academy. Right? Let's do one of these. USA Mifon. That's a hold on. I'm on. Let me see it again. Okay. Mifon, Mifon. USA Mifon. That's who has won this one on one mentorship. Are you here from XMD Academy? Again, these are all part of our sponsors. They're here. So thank you all again for all the sponsors that are involved in the summit with us as well. Kind enough to give us these things to give away to you guys. This is pretty good. USA Mifun, you are the winner. Right, let's do another one. Let's do another one. Let's do another one. Let's do another one. <laughs> I'm on a roll now. I'm feeling, you're, on, you're on a roll. I'm feeling the rhythm. I'm feeling the rhyme. Get on up. It's giveaway things time. Okay. Uh, all right. Let's do this one. Let's do this one. Let's do a Nomen School online digital class. A Nomen School. Was that, was that some Parappa the Rappa? Was that what we were just doing there? A what? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that is that the last video game system you, you owned? Me? When Parappa the Rapper was around? Uh, hold on. Uh, I'm trying. Probably the last gaming console system that I played on is, um, I want to say an Xbox 360. Oh, that's not that, that's not that long ago. It's pretty old. Let's be honest. Uh, that's pretty old. Okay. So our next winner for this Nomen online class. So this is a class you can actually can take. Adam Beard All. Nice. Adam Beard All. You are a winner for one free digital online class. Adam Beard All. You are a winner. That's what you've just won. Let's see, one, two, three. Let's do another one. Let's do another one. I feel I'm feeling this today. I'm feeling good about this today. You guys are all in there. You're with me. You're enjoying this. I'm enjoying being here with you all. Let's see. Let's see. What about this one? Let's see about this one. Yes. Let's do this. I know he was in here earlier. Shane my man Olson's 3D character workshop. Let's give one of these away. This is a lifetime access. So you get to hook right up to Shane. This is crazy. I can't believe he does this. Here we go. Let's draw a winner for this one. Let me make sure. Oh, come on. Come on. Let me draw a winner. Here we go. Oh. Let me put this in the chat. This is who we're looking for. Sheen, I don't know if you're still here, but I'm magically pressing buttons for you. There's who we're looking for. Dress, you can go ahead and pronounce that one. Toraj. 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 So we're going with. Old Robbie. <laughs> Close her up. I would would be my guess, but again, Shane says push it. That's what you have just won. Taraj, if you were still here, are you here? Congrats. I love that people are giving them congrats. That's nice of you all. You're here. <laughs> here. Taraj is here. Hopefully, I'm sorry if I, we butchered your name. I really do apologize. I'm not the best at this. Okay. As you can see, I mess up all the time. Listen. I still mess up Paul's name. <laughs> Listen, I just got so much ZBrush in my head that the rest of just normal life goes out. I don't remember how. <laughs> okay? Right? So, guys, this has been a lot of fun. I hope you're all having fun. I know I am. I know I am having fun. Okay? So, make sure you register. If you guys are just finding out about these giveaways, where have you been the last three days? Hello? Hello? McFly? Hello? All right, there you go. Another 80s reference. It's going to keep coming at you. Guys, okay, so you know what's up next. For those that watched this segment yesterday, it's going to be time. Get your notes ready. Get your pens ready. We're going to take a two-minute little break right here for a second just so you guys can get ready. Get to the restroom. Get your waters ready. I've got my swell. We've got our pens ready. Joseph and I are ready to go. We've got 12 videos to show you, our tips from artists, from the ZBrush Masters and our streamers. And let's not forget... Joseph and myself are going to be throwing things at you. Guys, when you're watching the videos, please go ahead. Keep asking questions in the chat. Joseph and I are watching these, and we're going to be throwing stuff at you. 
Tell your friends, tell your mother, tell your father, tell your aunts, tell your uncles, tell your cousins, watch the stream. Because if you want to find some interesting and amazing things about ZBrush, this is also going to be it right here. This is connection. Joseph and I, you and us, we're together. Spot, spot, spot. All right, so we're going to take a two minute here to get you ready so you guys can get, get a little break, get your snacks, get your water, get your notes ready. We'll see you in a couple minutes for some major tips and tricks coming up here. Hello everyone, this is Michael from Pixelogic's social media and marketing team. I want to introduce to you a small fun segment we'll be showing you throughout the ZBrush Summit this year called 2020 ZBrush Highlights. Throughout the day, we'll be showing you some of the most popular ZBrush creations from throughout the year from ZBrush Central, our Instagram, Facebook, and more, while telling you a little bit about the piece, the artist behind it, and where you can see more of that artist's work. Be sure to check out the link in each 2020 ZBrush highlight video to visit our exclusive ZBrush Central thread cataloging all of this year's highlights. Enjoy the summit! The Form 3 has helped bring people's wildest dreams to reality. But sometimes you need to dream bigger. We designed the Form 3L to bring the biggest dreams to life, so we wanted to put it to the ultimate test. Could we use the 3L to print our flagship 3D printer? Introducing Form 3L, so you can print a dream within a dream maker. Michael back again with more 2020 ZBrush highlights. This stylized Wonder Woman is by ZBrush Central member Doc Zenith. The concept was suggested by one of Doc's Instagram followers and falls in line with his history for creating amazing stylized female characters. Another popular image for this year with our ZBrush Central members. Again, Michael here with another 2020 ZBrush highlight. This scene, simply entitled Tattoo, comes to us from artist Rui Yan. 
Believe it or not, this is the artist's first CG work, and it is based on a concept by Kim jong ji The level of detail in this piece is simply amazing. The artist definitely has a future in CG. Let it begin. Let I I feel like I should do this. It's like over the top. Let's turn it on. Let's go. Hey, before we jump in, Drust, before we jump in, people, that was really awesome to see what Andrew and his team are doing too, right? There's a lot of artists doing stuff like this, right? So I also wanted to share a, a link to Rod Maxwell, another artist that is a, a artist that comes from a traditional world special effects and makeup. And he's also been experimenting a lot with using zebras to make prosthetics and everything else. So I, I put his link in the chat. So you guys can also see there's a ton of artists and really what this summit's all about for all of us too, is you guys being able to mingle, connect, meet other artists and see what people are doing. So I just want to share that as well with you guys. Cause I think it's a, uh, another artist just doing the same kind of thing that Andrew and his team was just showing as well. So. But, so did you do your did you do your sculpt and stretches, Paul? I was you gotta loosen up that elbow. It's more the shoulder. It's more I feel like we need one of these. I feel like we need one of these. Everyone's gotta wake up, right? We need a whole hold on. I don't even ball. know what you're doing over there. Is that the bell? Uh oh, you're ringing the bell. That's right, I'm ringing the bell. If you're not awake now, you are <laughs> ready to go. All right. So we've got again 12 videos that we're gonna show. So this is it. The rest of today is all about throwing stuff at you guys. I don't, I want you to get ready. I wanna talk for just a couple seconds ago, again, cause I want you to be ready to take notes, okay? And myself and the master, Joseph Drust, are gonna be watching your chat. So if you guys have questions that you maybe stuff you're seeing on screen, even from the artists, Joseph's dancing with his pen now, <laughs> put them in there. We're gonna do our best to put whatever we can Obviously, myself and Joseph, we could probably go for another eight hours just talking about things inside of Until we lose our voice. It's usually yeah. what happens. But we got to know that a few times. I've demoed too much and then didn't end up with a voice. Right. Mm -hmm. And let's not forget about tomorrow, too. We also, you know, the first four and a half hours is me and Joseph again for tomorrow's stream. And don't forget, tomorrow's stream is a different time. It starts at 4 p.m. Okay. And for those watching right now, for those that don't own ZBrush right now, raise your hand. Go ahead. Now, ready? One, two, three. Everyone raise your hand. Awesome. That was great. Let's do it again. One, two, three. Raise your hand. I just made everyone raise their hand around the world. That was great. Oh, yes, great. What is that? What do you got there? A ladybug? It's a ladybug. I you don't better know make I... that wish. You better is make that, that wish. I don't know. It's not, it's not going in focus. We're, we'll have to. There it is. All right. So, Mr. Dress, do you want to add anything before we see our first video from uh, the Infant Char? Um, I can, but let's go ahead and do Vichars first, because um, we right. had some stuff to come in the questions too during uh, some of the presentations. Uh, one of them was about the panel designs that you saw in the Razor Crest, and so me and Paul are going to show some of that stuff for you guys. Oh yeah, I got some crazy techniques I like to use for that. Yeah, a hundred percent. All right, so let's get going. Let's get in the first video. And let's get this rolling. Hello, friends. My name is. BN Vichar. I have been using ZBrush since 2007. Uh, the best thing I like about ZBrush is the clay which never dries. Uh, 
I would like to uh, share the easy way of creating uh, stocking with design using ZBrush. I usually use this uh, technique uh, in my sculpt and it's very handy and it's very fast to create uh, uh, this uh, you know, uh, detail, uh, micro detail. So let me show uh, the process how I uh, create. Uh, first, uh, I uh, extract mesh uh, from the uh, uh, model. Uh, if I have a topology, it's uh, uh, very helpful. Uh, if you are creating from Dynamesh, you can mask it and then uh, create a separate geometry. So uh, for this, I have extracted from the model. Uh, the first step is go to uh, UV Master, uh, click Unwrap. Uh, once you create Unwrap, uh, go to Morph, uh, UV Map, Morph UV. Uh, see how uh, your uh, UV uh, been uh, opened. And usually in ZBrush, uh, the UV opens up nicely uh, and it's uh, way faster uh, and quick. Uh, if you want a very precise uh, uh, design to be followed or a precise way, uh, uh, then you have to do manual UV and bring it here. So once uh, this is uh, quite uh, fine for me, uh, for the result what I'm looking for. So once that is done, uh, subdivide several times. So I have divided uh, six smooth at this uh, uh, time uh, but you can go uh, beyond than that also because how, how, uh, how dense it will be it will be so crisp and neat the designs will be so crisp and uh, neat uh, the next step is uh, go to surface surface noise go to edit and uh, I have uh, used uh, alpha a uh, tileable alpha uh, to uh, wrap around on the uh, to uh, on the, my hand to uh, get the design. So frame the model and keep the noise scale to 512. Uh, make sure that you're on UV and uh, the strength. It doesn't matter uh, because you're not going to drop on the model uh, the uh, those details. So it doesn't matter how much you keep. Uh, uh, you uh, have kept it for. Uh, one uh, one two zero one, and uh, I have kept uh, this attribute for max. You can play with the uh, different attributes, uh, which gives a different result. So I keep it for max, and you can play with uh, you know alpha scale. What is the scale you are looking for? Uh, once uh, you are fine with that, you can uh, uh, drop down. Uh, so you will get something like this. Uh, once uh, you uh, you are happy with this, then uh, go to uh, geometry and delete lower and go to uh, surface noise and don't, uh, you know don't apply to mesh, uh, apply mask by noise. So what happens is it uh, you know it's very handy if you uh, use it as a mask because uh, you can go clean the glitches uh, when texture is not working. So uh, right now uh, you know you can clean the unwanted uh, art artifacts uh, very precisely clean. Uh, you have you can if you spend uh, a couple of uh, time in this you get a very precise result. Uh, so uh, once this is done I use control all to sharpen the mask so you can go to masking and uh, uh, you know manually you can go and do sharpen the mask in this way uh, I usually use the shortcut in my keyboard uh, control alt and tap on the model so it will become sharper and the next step is go to edge loop on crisp and press edge uh, edge loop mask border so i have uh, created already that because it takes several minutes 
so I've already uh, done this process so once you've done that uh, what it does is uh, ZBrush calculate the uh, the edge of the mask and uh, draws a loop for you and creates a poly group also so it becomes very handy so once this is done uh, the next uh, process is like Uh, go for geometry uh, uh, go for group loop and uh, uh, keep for one because I need only one group loop around my uh, design so I have kept one group loop and G polish for 50 uh, in this uh, the there is a uh, other option it's a, a closed circle open circle when you play with this two setting you get different uh, result right now it is in a default thing so uh, when you apply group loop uh, you will uh, get a, a group around your design like this so it's uh, very helpful and very handy in the further process so once this is done I keep one more duplicate of this one and I'll go to geometry uh, uh, I'll go to deform deformation uh, use polish by group so it uh, cleans the group polish the group polish the crisp edge uh, you would be uh, cleaning uh, the edges which is not uh, crisp and clean uh, once that is done uh, I will be deleting the uh, other surface which is not required so go to geometry tab go for uh, modify topology delete hidden once that is done uh, I'll keep a copy of uh, this and I will only uh, select the design and go to geometry delete hidden and come to uh, 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 repeat the same process I need the border so uh, go to geometry tab delete hidden so I have two separate polygroup one is the outline and one is the design so uh, once this is done I'll go to geometry the next stage uh, dynamic subdivision apply dynamic and I don't need smooth so I need a thickness for my uh, design for the cloth design so I keep uh, the thickness I'm quite happy with the thickness so let me come out from the solo okay then I go for the border design I go for geometry once again uh, the same process dynamic certain time uh, you know uh, you it throws up error because your mesh is not clean and uh, it can be fixed very easily go to uh, uh, go to mesh integrity and say fix mesh so it cleans the mesh and uh, go to dynamic subdivision click dynamic uh, we don't need smooth here once again the thickness so I want a little more thickness I'll keep this yeah this is good for me uh, I think I'll give a little more thickness to it so that you have that uh, double step and embossing feel to it so once this is done uh, I'll uh, drop it I'll say apply uh, right now it is just for viewing uh, when you're in dynamic mode when you apply now uh, it has applied to the mesh and same thing I do for the design also I'll say apply to the mesh once this is done I'll uh, merge both uh, sub tool into one sub tool okay this once this is done I'll go to deformation tab uh, use polish by group it cleans the poly group polish crisp edge sorry uh, uh, so sometime you need to play around uh, uh, what result you're looking for uh, 
and polish by features based on the feature it will uh, polish so once that is done sorry uh, i'll go to uh, the poly group the mask it uh, in my selection i'll soften my uh, mask and i use inflate 0.09 i start with very low intensity uh, so that you know uh, i can see the result uh, rather than play, uh, you know uh, giving a huge number so i'm quite happy with this i'll reverse uh, the mask and i'll make sure that i give little more thickness to my uh, design so yeah i'm quite happy with the, uh, the how the border design has come out the beading so i go once again polish crisp edge so yeah i'm quite happy with the result uh, you could see uh, you know you're getting a nice they will feel to it once this is done i'll go back uh, to the the first uh, mesh what i had created uh, i uh, reconstructed it because since it's a quad i had uh, dropped down the geometry previously that's a uh, it's a very help uh, handy when you keep uh, you know multiple uh, elements in the sub tool so any point of time you can go back and uh, you know uh, recreate it so uh, since it's not uh, properly quad uh, i'm going to make it in z uh, z remesher i keep one and a z remesh so that i get a proper chord mesh so once this is done i uh, subdivide and so i will project to the uh, highest subdivision mesh go to projection let me off all the things so that i just take only Uh, the z remesher and the uh, high poly mesh what i had created i'll project all so that it's rack to the hand closer to the hand and go to geometry delete lower delete high, uh, uh, you know the higher once that is done go to uh, dynamic subdivision let me go for solo uh, in dynamic subdivision i don't need smooth here uh, and then i'll apply micro poly on this so uh, you can create your own micro poly uh, that's a coolest uh, feature in the latest zbrush so i'm really right now using the default uh, micro mesh so uh, this comes with poly group and it's easy to control and there are several other attributes here uh, align rotate or uh, you know uh, scale Uh, you can play with lot of values right now i kept it as a default thing once it's done so i'll say apply go for deformation once again polish by group uh, polish by crisp edge so you get a nice netted feel or uh, you can use a little polish also so that uh, you know i'll let me use a polish so yeah i got a very nice uh, looking netted uh, uh, cloth so once again uh, i'll uh, on my hand go for here so go to deformation and i inflate it a bit so that it looks like uh, it's tight to the hand uh, and so let me uh, inflate it a little bit so that the design is on top of it so uh, it's ready so it's so easy so fast and it gives the result way quicker i hope uh, you enjoyed it oh right trust what do you have to add to that and show some other things here. 
You're muted. You're muted. There we go. Yeah, I mute myself just to be careful because I get excited. Okay. Dress is still trying to learn the system. Just, just bear I am, with I am. I'm working on it. There's buttons and switches and levers and stuff. I got to pull it. It's all oh. over the place. All right. Go all right. So Vichar went through, and that's an excellent way um, to do your kind of details and designs, definitely for anything. And he takes it to another level by going through and adding even that ornate detail on top of the ornate detail and even putting like the mesh underneath it. Um, we had some questions in chat about getting it to, say, a game model. You, you can always project. So uh, most of the times you would generate your high poly mesh and then you generate a low poly mesh or an in-game mesh and then you project the details from the high to the low. Um, so that's pretty much how you transfer those details if you have them created. You can also generate displacement maps and things like that. So there's a lot of ways um, to get that million poly model down if you want to run it in a real-time engine. So with the stuff that uh, Victor showed in the uh, surface noise, I want to add another one. And this, this is one of my favorite ones involving surface noise. So if I had a 15-minute trip, this is definitely uh, what it was going to be. Uh, so here I just have a mech here, just a quick uh, Z modeler mesh. And as I can see, I just have it broken up. And this was all just started from a cube and just started playing around with it, messing with it. Um, I've shown this a few times in some of my streams, but you know they're all over the place. I think Comic-Con, when we were there, this was the last time I kind of showed this uh, functionality. But basically, you take a model, and it can be any model you want. Uh, this one's just done with uh, you know Z modeler, as I mentioned. And if I turn on dynamic, I can smooth them out a little bit so I have some creasing edges that are held in certain places just to kind of get that form. So I can have like hard surface areas in some places, but then other ones I want to kind of get smoother so I would remove creases from that. And so this little process here is just a quick way uh, to get to this kind of result. Now after you have this model, what I want to do is I want to duplicate it. Um, this is just so I can go back. I do a lot of duplication during my processes just so I have backup. So if I need to go back and say, oh, I didn't like that, I need to go change it, I can always go back to the sub tool it was make that change, and then go back to the one I'm on. Now, since this is dynamic, first I just have that turned on, and then I want to apply it. So I'm going to come down here to the Geometry tab, and I'm going to convert the dynamic version of it to traditional subdivisions. So as we talked about yesterday in one of our other ZBrush Top Tips uh, process, is that dynamic's just going to give you a preview of what the model would look like if it had traditional subdivisions. Now, the benefit on this, as we mentioned yesterday, is that it's going to keep your file size down. So you can use dynamic on your models. You're going to preview them at a higher resolution. But if you save that file out, ZBrush isn't storing you know, those millions of polyons because it's just in this dynamic mode. It only needs to remember that initial state, and then it's going to apply dynamic on it, which is just giving the smoothing effect. So I'm going to convert this to a traditional subdivision model. So you can see it's taken those dynamics, and now I have subdivisions. And then now what I want to do is I want to convert this to a DynaMesh. So basically, I've just gone through the process of taking my model that I've generated, and I'm going to convert it to a DynaMesh. Now, this process I'm going to show must be done with a model that is DynaMesh. So this is the key point here. You must have a model with DynaMesh active. And so for this one, if I DynaMesh at the default resolution that's currently in here, 128, you're going to see that's going to come through, and I'm going to lose um, some of these uh, details here. So it's taking it down, and it's a little bit low. So first, I'm going to delete my subdivisions, and then I'm going to turn off blur, and I'm going to turn off project, and just give you that result again. So this is what it looks like if it was done at that resolution. So I need to adjust this resolution, because I want to contain some of those details on the model. So I'm just going to crank this up to say, we'll do 2048 and see what that gives me here. I usually turn blur off. You can turn on if you want to soften some edges on your meshes as you work on it. But oftentimes, I'll just turn it off because I can always go back through and use clay polishes or smooths to get those edges soft if I need them later. So here I have the DynaMesh model. And if I turn on my polyframes here, you can see it's pretty dense. You can see I have another section or another subtool that's adding a little more extra details. But this is 100% DynaMesh here. Now, what I want to do with this, I'm going to duplicate this again. And this, once again, is because I want an internal kind of layer on this thing I'm about to do, and then I wanted to separate layers after this. So I've got my model, I've converted to a DynaMesh, and I've got it good to go. I'm gonna turn off perspective here, and I'm just gonna go to just an angle. And now let's go into surface noise. So I've got DynaMesh active, I'm gonna come down here to surface noise. If I can find the surface noise. Where are you surface? There we go. I'm just gonna open this up. And it's gonna come in like this, and so you see my robot on screen here. Now, unlike what Victor had, I have no uh, UVs on this mesh. So this mesh has no UV coordinates. It's just the model in 3D space. Now, what I want to do is I want to frame the model on screen here. Because the next process, when I come down here and load an alpha in, 
It's going to basically look at the model and apply a planar projection to it with the alpha or the texture image I'm going to put on top of this. So if I have it positioned like this, it's going to go this way. If I have it positioned like this, it's going to go this way. If I position it to the side, it's going to go this way. So you want to make sure your model is positioned in the angle that you want to have this planar projection applied. And now if I come down here and turn on alpha, I'm going to get a little dialog box that's going to come up. And in here, you can see I have a whole bunch of alphas that were created. Um, there is a tutorial that's on a uh, Z Classroom where we've gone, I went through and created some buildings. So it's a very similar process to that, but this one adds to that as well. But these are some of the uh, alphas I've created through that. So I'm just gonna pick one of these, say like this Mech Alpha 01 here and open that up. This is now gonna load in. And what you wanna realize is that this loads in, it's basically taking this image, if you've loaded it through here, and it's basically putting it across your entire canvas here. So it's doing it as like a projection right onto your model with a planar projection. Now I come over here, I can turn my basic noise off, I can turn my strength up, and as soon as you start turning it up, you're going to start seeing that alpha taking place on your model. Now you can change the scale of this to get it larger and smaller, and what I'm looking at here is details, right? So I'm looking at where this alpha is applying or falling on the mesh. Now the strength here isn't really going to come in too much play, because we're not really going to use this, but this is just used to see how that alpha is being applied. Now, the next thing here is that what I can do with this is I can isolate the black and white parts from this alpha and create an offset. And this is only going to give me one of those others, one either the all white or the all black. And I can tailor this to determine what part of that alpha is going to actually cut through and be visible in a model. So if I go to the offset here and start changing this, you can see those elements are now vanishing from my model and it's creating this translucent effect. Right, so we talked about some panel line stuff earlier that um, was done for the razor crest. So this is another thing you can use here. So you have a model that's densely topologized with uh, Dynamesh, and then we've gone through, and now instead of going generating geometry across that, we're using an alpha. We're taking the alpha and we're clipping it with this offset, and now it's giving this airy nature to our mesh. Right, so I have this area down here that's all wiry now, and I can change the scale on this alpha, you know, to see what it's giving me see if there's anything else, like different little forms and shapes and come in here. Drop, and it gives this nice magnifier so they can see that. The uh, which I never use the magnifier. Shift what button is that, Paul? Shift M. Shift M. Oh, as, man. As in magic. As in mag shift and then the M. Yeah, it's it's not liking me right now. Paul. All right, whatever. Just move on. <laughs> <laughs> so you, double show them again the slider that you're using to make that happen down at the bottom. So it's this offset one. It's directly below the graph. Right here. And if you change this, you see it's going to start cutting out that alpha. And this is giving that offset effect. And you see if your alpha has, you know, more values than just black and white, like it's got the gradient between black and white, this is culling that out. And so it's going to clip out. And as you keep going, you'll clip out more and more and more. So you can get some really cool effects and different designs as this is happening. So we'll go with this one for right now. And so now we're going to just hit OK. And this is going to bring us back into ZBrush. So now you can see we have this. Right, so here's our model with that alpha applied, right? So the, right now, if we take this, and if I turn on my other subtool, the one I duplicated, you can see they're overlaying on top of each other, right? But you can kind of see how some of that form is coming through. So I have one, which is my base body, and I can even go through and say just deflate that a little bit. So if I come to the deformation panel and then inflate slightly, this is going to pull that model in or out, and see now I have this. So I have that object, which is now bleeding through, the other object's intersecting it. So I have the one that I have the surface noise applied, and then I have my original, and it's going through it, and now I have this detailing effect happening. Now right now, this process here is, let me do the, let me just do the other one. Let's, let's correct this. We're gonna inflate the other one there. There, there we go. There, there, there we go. There we go. So I have these two kind of offset. Now. If I look at this model here, you're going to see that it's it's just like single-sided, right? So I have no internal geometry on this. So I applied that offset. This is being displayed as that surface noise. So if I turn this off, you can see it goes away. And now I can apply it to the mesh like normal. So if I click Apply to Mesh here, this is going to apply it, but it's applying it as your regular function. So it's coming off. It's keeping the model same, but it's not giving me that same kind of effect to the whole thing. It's doing it as a normal surface noise would. But if you have a surface noise on, this is the key trick here, and you have Dynamesh active, if you come up here and you hold down the Alt key, 
Please. And then click on sub. This is going to process the model with Dynamesh, and it's going to respect that alpha or that surface noise we just applied. And this is now going to dump out geometry. So it's basically taking the model, looking at it as the surface noise, and now it's going to give me geometry from it. Now, depending on how dense your Dynamesh is, this is, could take a little while here. But you can see now, instead of that surface that was really airy, I have now a Dynamesh model that has respected that surface noise offset. And look at all these details now. right? Look at these crazy shapes I got from that. right? So this stuff would have taken me like a long time to model out. And this is now all geometry. Like this, this is basically a Dynameshed model here. This is a watertight mesh that was created from that offset alpha. So now if I have this and then take that other object I had underneath, so if you go back to this model here, and this one I kind of just went, I think this one still has surface noise on it. Let's get rid of that. Do a little scaling down here. You can start layering this effect over top of your model. So now I have that hard shell that was done from the alphas, and I have that other one bleeding through. And you can keep going and going like this. I could duplicate this again, go back into surface noise, add another alpha to get another detail. I can rotate my model. So say I projected it, this one through the front of the mesh. I can now go to the side and project another alpha through the side of the mesh and get more details for that view on the mesh. And you can keep layering this up like this. And then after you're happy with this, you can Boolean all together or just re it. And it's going to create a nice watertight model. So that's one of my favorite ones um, inside of ZBrush here. And if you want to be uh, symmetrical too, I can go back to that model there and I can just perform a mirror and weld, right? So I'm going to modify topology, mirror and weld. This is now going to mirror the one side to the other. And now I have it symmetrical as well. And if I want to do the reverse, so say I like the other side more than the one, I can undo that. I come down to the deformation area here, just do a mirror first, and then now do a mirror and weld and it's gonna give me the opposite effect. So a lot of flexibility and a lot of power you can get with the surface noise and the offset. And then the little trick there is if you have surface noise applied, your mesh is in Dynamesh. From my Dynamesh tab here, where did you go? You wanna hold down the Alt key and click Sub. And it will re-Dynamesh the model and respect the offset. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. My turn, my turn? My your turn, turn, your turn. Okay, switch to moi. Switch to moi. Oh, look what I did. Beautiful work, people. Just gorgeous. <laughs> Man, I can sculpt. Not really. All right, so I want to go on top of what uh, Ben Vachar was doing a little bit because we saw some questions coming through with UVs. I want you guys also to think differently with UVs as well. Um, as me, as an artist, uh, I don't have to worry about film world or game world, which is great, but there's ways to still use all this and use UV. So one thing I want to talk about that's another one upsets me a little bit. Dress upsets me a little bit. It's not being used. Gets me a little, gets me a little, little, little boiling here. All right. So when you guys have UVs on, let's not forget. Once you have the UVs, you guys can morph your UVs, right? And turn this on. And what this is going to do is show me a flat version of your UVs inside of ZBrush. Guys, you can sculpt and you can paint on this. Okay. Come on now. Right. Why do you care? Because then you can start taking advantage of other things in brushes i.e. if I want a straight line going across this here, across her face, this is going to be a lot easier to do in a flat version per se, right? So even if I just want to start here and then go across and say, make a line going through here, right? Boom, there's a line going through there. It's that simple, right? And then I, oh, I want to make another one right here. And I'm just going to get a little cray cray here. I love that the eyes and the teeth are still on, just makes it extra scary, right? This is now making these lines. This is giving me an advantage. And when I unmorph, it's back. And you can see those lines are now using the UVs, in essence, to sculpt across the model, right? This is a fantastic way to think a little differently. I do this a lot when I'm doing UVs and I have separate shells. Let's say a jacket. I wish I could find the model. I can't find it. You've got arm sleeves, right? And then you got a chest, right? And then you got a back. I can set my UVs in a, in a row and then literally paint and sculpt right across because it's gonna go across the UV shells. Here's another thing that you guys can do. Let's bring a, let's, let's bring a texture, right? I don't want Joseph to be the one that brings textures and darn it, I wanna join the party. Okay, so I've got this texture that's repeating. I'm gonna add this to spotlight, okay? Add into the spotlight, sound effects, mandatory. 
So there's your add to spotlight button that you can see right there. I'm hovering over it right now. I'm not moving. I'm not moving. I'm moving on. Okay. So now that I have this in spotlight, right, we can move this around. I can position this. I can size it. But now the cool thing about this is I can also tile it. So right here, Christmas in a corner. I'm going to go over here. Christmas in a corner over here, as I like to phrase call it now. There's these two right here, your tiling abilities, right? This will tile in either direction. What I'm going to do is I'm going to hold the shift, shift key, and I can tile in both directions. Why do you guys care about this? Because watch this. You guys are going to be able to have this image. I personally like to use this spotlight radius dial, hence why this is called spotlight. It's like having a flashlight on your texture images, right? And then now I'm going to hit the Z key for ZBrush and oh, it's gone. But it's really not gone. As you can see, I move around, you can see your image. Now got, I hope you all know where I'm going with this. Morph it, right? So we're gonna morph our UVs back to the flat version. Oh, that's beautiful, it's beautiful. Let's turn the eyes and the teeth off because of the, and you can see that image right there, right? I can use this image and sculpt with this image, right? And I'm sculpting on what? The flat, uv version right and wherever i go i sculpt and you can paint with this as well right so i can be this way and you can even work symmetrically if you want to Ooh, baby. right you can do all of this think outside the box people i like to call zbrush it's like playing chess or like if you're you know fat guy like me it's like eating cake layer upon layer upon layer if you're an onion person it's layering man it's layering feature on top of a feature i unmorph that Boom, now I got that pattern on her face. Okay, outside the box, right? Outside the box thinking here, okay? That's how I like to use things like this. I, Joseph and I are always trying to think, what is a different way we can use this feature? Okay, we made this feature, but what can we really do with it, right? Okay, so we're gonna be moving on to the next video. Maddie Spencer's up next. So let's move on to that video and Dress and I are gonna come back with more stuff as well. So Maddie more Spencer, stuff. up next. Hi, I'm Maddie Spencer, and I've been using ZBrush since 2003. Today at the ZBrush Summit, I'm going to share a tip with you on how you can use Frame Mesh under the Curve tools to create edge details on costume elements like panels on a spacesuit or edges on uh, hammered steel armor. So let's take a look at how this works. I have my alien on screen right now, and I've got just a generic body for the suit. Now this is actually the Nick Z mesh that comes pre-installed with ZBrush. I've just stretched the hands out and taken off the, the sort of body details and I've also deleted the head. So I'm gonna go to my polygroups menu and I'm gonna group visible. So there's nothing but a single polygroup here. Now I'm gonna divide this mesh up a few times, maybe three times, just to give myself enough resolution that I can paint a nice crisp mask on here. And I'm just gonna use the masking brush to paint some panels. And the mask panels are eventually gonna become uh, panel loops. We're gonna polygroup with these. So I just wanna create some kind of interesting shapes here. And a nice thing uh, when you're doing something like this, I find is sometimes you can get interesting shapes just by sort of following the underlying form of the anatomy more or less. You don't have to exactly match it, but I'll sort of do a little panel over the abdominals and maybe do a panel here that sort of follows more or less the, the lateral oblique. Just helps give you a nice flow that works with the body, but it doesn't have to be, like I said, exactly the same shape as what the anatomy is underneath. It's just there to give you sort of a guide. So it's just an, a way that you can start. So I wanna put a shoulder pad here. So I'm gonna mask out the shoulder area. And then let's do a little mask here around the bicep. And I think it would be neat if we had a panel that sort of followed the extensor muscles here, the forearm. So let's bring this down here and maybe we'll do another panel this way that sort of follows the flexor muscles. There we go. And while we're at it, we'll just do a few more here. I'll do a sort of a, a loop that comes around this way, sort of following the sartorius muscle and the vastus medialis, and we'll do another bigger panel out here on the side that kind of represents the side of the thigh here. And then of course I can erase out with Control-Alt 
if I overshoot that and paint too much of a mask in one particular area. There we go. And you don't have to worry about these being perfect because we're going to clean them up here in just a second. So now that I've got these masked out, I'm going to go to Tool, Polygroups, Group, Masked. There we go. Now if I clear my mask and go to frame mode, you can see I've got a, a polygroup for each of those areas that was previously masked. Now I'm going to go to the geometry menu. I'm going to go to the edge loop sub menu and I'll use panel loops. Now I'm going to turn my elevation down a little bit so I don't, it, that keeps it from sort of expanding too much off the surface. I am going to turn on thickness or turn up thickness to about let's see 0.07 for thickness I don't want it to be too thick and I'm going to turn off double I don't want it to be double sided so now I'm going to go ahead and just hit, click panel loops and I need to delete my lower subdivision levels don't forget that now I will click panel loops and it's going to carve a panel loop around each one of those islands now, if you look at them, they're kind of messy. They don't have a nice clean look about them. So what I'll do now is go to the deformation submenu and there is the polish by features slider here. If I turn that up, by default, it may not really appear to do anything, but if you turn off or just click the radio button here, oops, wrong one, click the radio button on polish by features. So now if I turn that up, I will get more of an effect. There we go. Make sure that it's an empty circle. There you go. So if I turn that up really high, you see that that really polishes things down and gives us a nice clean edge around that paneling. So now I'm going to control shift click on the inner shell. That would be kind of the undersuit and make sure that that's hidden. And I'm going to go to the subtool menu, go to split and split hidden. And now that's split that inner suit out as its own subtool. Now I've got a separate subtool, which are just the panels and their thickness. If I go into frame mode, you can see that these still have their individual um, polygroups for the thickness and for the facing panels. So I'll turn frame mode off and I'll turn on visibility on that inner suit. And I'm going to select the inner suit and then I'm going to go to let's zoom out a bit so we can see it properly. I'm going to go to the surface noise plugin. We'll zoom in on that a little bit so we can see it. And I'm going to go to noise plugin. I just want to give this sort of an underlying texture. Noise plugin will open up the noise plug and it's actually opening up on my other screen here. So I've got multiple monitors. I'm going to have to sort of reduce my ZBrush size here. And now I'll open up the noise plugin. And we'll drag that onto screen so you can see it. I'm going to select the hex tiles. So we'll go to hex tile, click OK. And then I'm going to take ba mixed basic noise down to zero. And I'm going to take my plugin scale down so I can see it. And then take the strength and turn that up. And let's invert that so it's going in instead of out. Yeah, there we go. That's what I want. And then click OK. So now I've got a, so this hex tiling that's on the undersuit. Now if I turn on my paneling, we've got the paneling separate. So I'm going to alt click on the paneling. Now what I want to do is I'm going to create sort of a piping that goes around those panels. So it's sort of like uh, there's some sort of seaming or some tubing that's uh, just an extra little touch of detail on this. So what I will do is I will control shift click on the panels and that's going to hide the panel thickness. Now I'm going to do another split hidden. So I've got a separate subtool now for the thickness of the panels. But if I go to solo mode, you see that we're actually seeing just the panels themselves. Now I'm going to go to the stroke menu. I'm going to open up curve modifiers and curve functions. So this is all of our curve options here. Under curve functions, you see I've got frame mesh. Now I can frame border, polygroups, or creased edges. I'm just going to use border. If I click that, you see every separate polygroup or island of polygons has a frame, which is a curve. Now I'm going to go to B for brush, I for insert, and I'm just going to grab insert cylinder extrusion this tube cylinder um, insert brush here. Now we're accustomed to maybe using this to draw pipes that go from point A to point B. But if we have an existing curve here and I have this brush selected, if I just click on the curve, 
it's going to add that piping around each instance of that tube. See that? Let's go ahead and turn Solo off so we can see the rest of the suit. So if I zoom out, see now we've got this nice sort of tubing going around the, um, the whole surface. Now if I go to my brush depth control here and turn depth down, the curve is still active. So if I click the curve again, it's going to update and that's going to countersink that deeper into the surface. So I can actually control how deep this goes just by using my depth control here. If I turn it down again and then touch the curve, you see that it's pushed in and further. Let's really push that. Let's bring it down really far and then we'll touch the curve again. And there you can see it's really sunk it down. So we can have total control over exactly where that's hitting on the surface. So if I'm happy with that, I'll just click somewhere where there's not a curve and now that has been created as geometry. So I'll clear my masking and there we go. Now I'm going to select the inner suit just by alt clicking on it and I want to do the same thing here but I want to create sort of a tubing um, uh, hem that goes around the neckline. Something that maybe a, a helmet might attach to. So if I do the same thing I go to the stroke menu under curve functions frame mesh and I'll use border so you see that that's framing all the borders, but it's also grabbing these borders here. So what I'll need to do is just tap somewhere off the model, off the curves, just to get rid of that. Oops, let's undo that. I only want this particular hole to be framed. So I'm going to go ahead and go to frame mode. Now you see that there is no, there are no polygroups here. So what I will do is I will just create a new polygroup by zooming in here and I'm going to turn my surface noise off so I can see my polygrouping. I'm going to go to B for brush, S for select and select select and select the select lasso brush. Click OK. Now with select lasso if I press control shift and then click on that edge loop I can hide that loop and now I will go to polygroups, group visible. There we go. And I will now be able to control shift click on the blue polygroup to hide it, revealing just that polygroup. Now I'll go back to stroke frame mesh and I can do uh, border or I can do polygroup or I can do creased edges. Um, I'll go ahead and do polygroup. Frame mesh. We zoom in here. Go to stroke. Frame mesh. There you go. You see now we're getting a border at, or a curve along that polygroup. We're not getting it on all the other pieces and parts. So now if I click on there I can now add my sort of uh, tubing that runs around the neckline. But I want to go back to my depth control, set this back to zero. I'll set the embed to zero. And I'm going to turn my draw size up on my brush. And then I'll click that curve again. So now it's kind of a bigger, chunkier sort of neckline on there. So it looks like something that you might have on a spacesuit. So I'll turn solo off and control click and drag to clear my masking and I'll go back to my surface and turn my noise back on. Now if I want to get rid of the curve just tap somewhere on the model where there is no curve and the curve will go away. I'll control shift click to hide the the tubing which is a separate piece and I will go to subtool split split hidden. Now I can divide this suit up a couple more times and then I can go to my surface noise and just apply to mesh and that will apply that noise to the mesh itself. So that's how we can use frame mesh to take a curve and frame specific areas to add detailing to it. So I'll show you this is where we where I took it originally, so I'm working on this spacesuit for this alien, and I was able to go in here and isolate all these individual panels and create this piping and this detailing which helped accentuate and give that extra little bit of detail to just those areas.
So I hope you found this tip helpful and maybe you can use it in your own workflow. Enjoy the rest of the ZBrush Summit. I'm Maddie Spencer and thanks for watching. All right, I'm wearing my space suit. I'm ready to go. Joseph, you're muted again. The, you know, he, people, Thank you. You just have to tell me that every time. This is just what we're going to do. Yeah, that's what we're going to do. I'm just doing it on purpose now. When I see your lips moving, I'll let you know. Okay, Joseph, <laughs> you're going first. I got my space suit on. Let's do this. What do you got? What do you got for me? All right. So, first of all, we had we had some questions in the chat. We do. Where can I find red wax? Oh, so I knew it. I was going to do it too. <laughs> <laughs> so if you come over here to the material palette and open this up, the red wax will either be here or right here. And there you have it. There's red wax. It's it's probably the best tip out there. Now, you all know, <laughs> I don't usually do red wax. I, I'm, but I'll, I'll switch to red wax every once in a while. Okay. But you're never going to get me okay. into that right-click army. Uh-uh. Oh, for life. you should Alt join my click army. for life. No, Alt stop click. it. Stop, stop, join my army, stop it, okay, go. <laughs> All right, and we also had some comments that there was not enough earthquake on the screen. So anytime you screen, see my screen now, earthquake will be with us. <laughs> there he is, right up there. He's showing me where the front view is inside his ebrush. All right, so Maddie was showing how she, she took like masking and did all the panels when she started off on her suit. So you can definitely do that. So if you hold down control, you get the mask brush. And you come across your surface and start, you know, generating that masking. And then if you want to turn it to a poly group, you can just do uh, Control W on your screen there. And here, let me get one that's a little bit colorful. There we go. And that'll give you a new poly group to that masked area. Another thing I wanted to show you all is that you can also do this with poly paint. Now, if you're doing masking and say you come over and you click off um, and clear it, you can clear it accidentally. Like there's oftentimes where I'll be masking something and I'll accidentally relate, erase it. So another thing you can do in order to use polygrouping is you can do it with poly paint. So I just have the red wax uh, ring here and I just have the standard brush selected and I've just filled it with white color. So, but I'm gonna switch to the paint brush. So B, P, and then we're gonna find paint. Now with paint, I'm just gonna make sure RGB is turned on. I'm gonna set my color to black. And it's really just the contrast that this process I'm gonna show is gonna be looking at. So you just wanna make sure you have a clear contrast on your model when you're doing this. And so now I just have paint enabled. I can come through and I can start using this to start painting a design on my mesh here. Um, if you enable Sculptures Pro, this will also work with the paint as well. And you'll see if I do this, I'm gonna get a cleaner stroke on my mesh. So you can enable stroke Sculptures Pro with the paint brush, and this is gonna tessellate the model as you paint, which is a big help if you wanna keep like really, really clean surfaces. Now, after you have a model with poly paint applied, so if I just switch to say the flat color here, oops, I actually filled my material as well. So you're not getting flat color. We're just gonna stay. We'll stay with red wax. And I can now take what I have here in terms of what I painted, and I can turn this to a poly group. And I can use the plugin up here that is called Poly Group It. Now Poly Group It. Poly Group It, 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 go. Now Poly Group It, you can take your model and you can load it into Poly Group It and you can assign poly groups to flat areas very quickly. Another option you have for using Polygroup It is you have a Polygroup It from Paint and a Polygroup It from Paint border. So if I use Polygroup It from Paint right here, it's going to look at the poly paint that's on the model. So it's looking at just what I painted. And if I click this, it's going to process that. And now if I turn on, let me turn off the line here, my polygroups here, these will be broken up into... Well, it should have here, Paul. What did I do wrong here? You didn't close it. You didn't let's, close it. Let's restart. Let's you restart. Know, you we'll gotta, you gotta close it. You gotta close the paint. I'm gonna close the paint. It's the red wax. It's the red wax. It's it might be the red wax. You never it's know. You never on. know. <laughs> All right. So let's fill our object. Switch to black color. Go to the paint brush. We're gonna paint our coloring on here. Woo. You gotta close it. It won't work unless you close. Well, not like that. I'm closing it like You're that. Crazy. And now we're going to do polygroup from paint. And there you go. Now we have. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> you may just have to take the controls from me. Paul. You want me to take over? <laughs> you may need to. <laughs> uh, I love it. You're cracking me up. We're throwing. We're giving. We're giving Joseph a little run. Giving him off his off his game right now.
That's right. That's right. What's going to happen? <laughs> Paul, you're from paint. All right, Paul, you want it? Here you go. It's all you. All right. All right. All right. I'll, I'll show what you're going with that if you want. Okay. So come, <laughs> come to me. Come to me. Come to me. It was right. the red wax. It no, red no, wax. no. I won't do it. I won't do it. I won't do it. No, no. Yes. Yes. No, no. Okay. That's enough red wax for me. Okay. Number one, first of all, this is a, this is a war. Okay. This is a war now. Dross brought it up and he started it with me. This is happening. This is happening. People, right-click navigation. What are you doing? Get out of Joseph and O'Fair's world, man. Get into my world. Get in the right-click army. Jared, you better you better conform, man. Just do it. Just do it. Do you guys know how much better right-click navigation is? There's actually three navigations, by the way. Not one, not two, but three. And now there's going to be four with the 3D mouse. Oh, boy. All right, so I got to show this. So Joseph's navigation of working is he clicks in the document and rotates, right? He holds the alt key, he moves, his finger's on the alt key and he's moving, and then he lets go of the alt key and he zooms in and out. Totally fine, great. That is the original way that ZBrush had navigation. Here's your, here's your problem. When you're in the world like this, right, and your model's filling, oh, it's beautiful. You gotta go over to the highway to the safe zone. Da, 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 da. You gotta go to this border outside here, right? And then that's how you now you gotta rotate, and now you can zoom and then you can move, right? You're that's taking time. There's nothing wrong with that. Listen, if some of you guys are using this navigation, that's fine. Okay. But I'm going to convert you right now. Right click navigation works like this. You're going to hold the right click. I'm using a pen. In fact, I use this even inside of Maya now. I don't use a mouse anymore. What's a mouse? Mouse is uh, using a mouse is like sculpting with boxing gloves. I'm not going to do it because I can't even box very well. So this bottom button right here is my right click navigation right okay and then i can move and then i can zoom now here's the beauty of mine here's the beauty of mine because i'm going to start look at this i can zoom right to the point of the face that i want to look at zoom out go oh i want to go to the hand oh, oh, oh joseph can't do this he can't he can't do what i'm doing right here no we the other thing he can't do is when we're zoomed up like this look at this oh god classics why I, I can't tell you how much faster my workflow got I can sit here and sculpt and then rotate. Look what I'm rotating around. Oh, and I don't have to go to the highway danger zone and be there with Goose and Maverick and everybody else. I'm my own person. I'm my own pilot, people. I'll go where I want to go, okay? Yeah, you like that one, Dress. That one I just made up today. You know, it's what I do, right? Oh, this is the way to work, right? Oh, I got to get used to this Windows, crazy Windows thing. So not only do you zoom to the area you want to go with right click, you rotate around wherever your cursor is as well. Like... I don't know what else I have to do to sell this to you. Jared, I saw you in the chat, man. I saw you. What else do I got to do here? I'm not even bothered showing you guys the third way because it's just going to do that. It's going to set you sideways, okay? It's going to set you sideways. What I want to show is the tip, another tip that I really love, okay? I'm going to turn off the line here. So something what Maddie was doing, she was making like panels for like space suits or like when Andrew was showing his stuff, how he liked to use topology brushes and then Bill liked to use other things. Guys, your artist, do do you, you do you, I do me loud, crazy, things come out of my mouth that we don't even know what's happening. Now there's anybody at Pixelogic what's gonna come out of here, okay? Who cares? I'm being me. So what I'm gonna do is make a new poly group like Joseph was trying to do, okay? And make a new poly group here. And so this is say, this is a chest plate on the character. <laughs> I'm gonna control W and bam, I get a new poly group. Oh, that was just gorgeous, you know? That's it, that's my tip, control W. <laughs> Okay, God, do you really want to see, maybe we'll come back dress. Are they really wanting to see the third way now, like ridiculously? Okay, so this is a poly group, right? So let's say, let's let's make this look a little bit better at least. Okay, here we go. Let's say I want to do something like this and then something like that and come across. What I like to do, and I think what was really great about Andrew and Bill and all them, I think what we we're trying to go, so and some of you were asking questions earlier, sketching things out i use zbrush to sketch like you can't get any better than this rotating around a 3d model seeing what that panel could look like from every angle i can't draw this fast right there's no way i can draw this fast in every single angle i'm not sid mead it's not gonna happen okay man i miss you sid you were great god too bad you guys if you guys ever got a chance to see him live he's like me okay so this is a panel <laughs> control w Right now, I want to start making maybe something down lower down the body, right? So then I come down here and say, "Yeah, 
yes, we're going to make something here. And I want the panel to kind of butt up into this panel. So I start doing this, uh-oh, wah, 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 right? I'm taking away some of that blue in there, right? So, <laughs> no. I don't want to do that, right? So this is it, okay? This is your Lisa Nates braces moment. I had my crazy rants right there, but this is your Lisa Nates. You're going to go to the brush palette, okay? I'm going to turn on the magnifier for you all. Again, that is Shift M. It's built in ZBrush, and you guys can even customize this a little bit as well. If you really want me to show you, we'll do that later. We're going to come down here, okay? Auto masking. That's a great menu. Love it. Write it down. Live it, okay? Click this. The very first slider is my best friend. Okay, if I could hold its hand, I would. Mask by polygroups. I'm gonna put that all the way to 100. Hundy, if you want to, put it to a Benjamin, if you wanna go that way. Doesn't matter to me, call it what you wanna call it. Now watch this, watch this. I'm masking, oh, <laughs> oh boy, God, this is great. I can't tell you how often I use this for hard surface people. Control Control W, bam, that's lined up. Look, I'm gonna make another panel here. Do you see it's not touching now the blue and the green one? I know Joseph's excited about this. He's enjoying it over there. I am enjoying it. Control W, new polygroup. Look at that, they're butting up right next to each other. Guys, this is a global setting. I can even grab a sculpting brush and look. Ooh, yes, the power you have. Okay, look at that. So how this is working is the first polygroup you click on, that's all ZBrush cares about. That's it. That's the only polygroup ZBrush cares about is that. Okay, so it's global setting. So just remember, when you turn that on, it's on for all sculpting brushes, okay? Now, obviously, the benefit to this is when we go to someone like Maddie was doing, right? She went now to, uh, wrong one. She went to panel loops, right? And she was making a panel. I'm going to make these double-sided because the last... Last thing I want to show you here, okay? Let's go with a little bit of more thickness. Bam! We got some panels, right? Based on, and you can see, ooh, nice. They're right, they're right there. They're uh, coming together. Come together right now. Guys, I haven't had any coffee yet, or I never will, and this is how I am. So here's the beauty of this. Remember, we've got this setting turned on, cranked up. I'm going to turn it down. I'm going to put it back to zero. Knock it down, right? Now, I'm going to use, we already talked about it yesterday, I'm going to use one of my favorite brushes, which is Move Topological. What is the benefit? Well, these panels are separated. They're different. They're different meshes. So I can actually readjust and even say, okay, I want this panel to go a little bit lower. Okay, I want it to be inside it a little bit more like this. Okay, I want these panels to come across and be out here. Yeah. So we're getting a layering effect. That's what I'm trying to do right there, right? Make those panels kind of look like they're actually or layering. And I can go with a massive brush size and look. I'm only moving that one panel, even though they're the same subtool, okay? And here's another trick. God, I, I can't stop talking. Look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. Look at me. <laughs> Make your brush size one, and you guys can move the whole piece as a unit. Oh, oh I didn't even switch to Gizmo. I'm just, guys, I'm just slinging tips at you right now. I'm just from they're, the left. They're comparing right you to a hummingbird right now, Paul. Oh man. I'm like, I'm giving you guys tip from the homeland of Canada right now. Okay. That's what's going on. That's what's happening with you guys today. But the, the hummingbirds, they do, they do crash after a certain point because it just hopped up on sugar all day. That's what Paul does too. You'll just find him over there and he'll just be like, I don't eat, like I don't eat, minutes. I'll be honest with you. I don't eat too much sugar. The wife will not allow it. My love, Callie, if you're watching, you want it, she won't allow it. No, 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 no. I, I listen, I do have some sugar, but that's not, I'm high on life, man. I'm high on life. So I'm messing around with this. I know somebody brought it up. You guys can go to deformation and then there's a slider right here. Polished by groups. And we've got a closed circle and we've got an open circle, right? They're different. The closed circle is only gonna polish where the poly groups are in essence meeting. So this slider, I keep viewing it, it's cleaning up these lines. If I open that circle, now it's like a free-for-all, just like Joseph's navigation. It's a free-for-all. So when I go all the way, you can see how clean this gets. I want to throw something else. I can't stop. I can't stop. You really, you can't stop. I, can't. I want to throw something else at you all, right? Okay. You can see there's different polygrouping here, right? I'm going to turn this on. See, there's various polygroups. Watch this, people. Z modeler. I'm going to throw a little crease a on here. I'm going to say partial because I'm just partial to creasing sometimes. 
and I'm going to click right there. So see, now there's a crease line right there. I can say, you know what? Now, I'm going to pick and choose. I am that kind of artist. I choose what I want. Boom. Can you show the uh, the poly group setting again? Which one? Mask poly poly groups. Yeah. Or the, poly um, yeah, the brush, the brush option. Oh, sure. Brush, polish by groups. There you go. Auto mask. masking, mask by polygroups. Yeah. Do you need me to make my magnifier bigger? No. All right. There's also a uh, a macro that will toggle the mask by polygroups as well. So it will automatically set the slider value for you. So you can bind that to a button and then you just hit that as well. It's in the yes. macros area. Yes. Yes. Guys, look at this. Watch the difference. You ready? Wait for it. Buckle up. Guys, don't everyone ever, no one should leave this stream because we're just throwing things. You see, I crease those edges. If you guys use this polish by groups, it's only looking at polygroupings. You see how it rounds out right there? I can throw an extra thing at this and say creasing, right? So we got to polish by crease edges below that and see, oh, yeah, that's gorgeous. That's just beautiful. This is beautiful. Okay. If you go above this and you do the polish by features, Okay, we're doing a marriage, and we're doing a marriage between creasing and poly group, grouping, right? So if I now slide this slider all the way up, you can see the creased edges are also staying sharp along with every poly group, right? So no matter where you go, that's what you have, right? Okay. Does that make sense, to everybody? Dress. I got to show one more thing. Dress. I got. I oh my gotta, gosh, we got to go. We got these videos, Paul. You, you can't be. You can't be going off on super. Yeah, all right, you're right. You're right. You're right. I'll show this later. You Let's can show it next. Show it next. Show it next. We, Let's we get into these videos. Video. You're right. Pull me in. Pull me in. Pull me in. Let's get into <laughs> Anna Carolina's video. Right. Let's go. Let's get to that video. My name is Anna Carolina Pereira. I'm a 3D technical artist, a VR developer, ZBrush live streamer, and a professor at the Ringling College of Art and Design. I've been streaming with Pixelogic for over two years now, and I've loved every second of it. I get to hang out with you guys, be a part of the community. I get to share a little bit of my experience and my knowledge with you. And of course, I get to learn as well. I started using ZBrush about six years ago when I was introduced to it in college. I loved ZBrush so much the first time I ever touched it that I totally gave up on my 2D concept art career and switched to the 3D world. Needless to say, I am very proud and very excited to be here today. Today, I want to take this opportunity to talk to you guys about VDM brushes, what they are, how to make them, and how to use them to make truly effortless surface detailing, kind of like how I have on my T-Rex right here. So why don't we go ahead and get started? Well, before we talk about making our own custom VDM brushes, we should talk about what VDM brushes are in the first place. VDM stands for Vector Displacement Mesh, and it works almost like an alpha with the added benefits that it's very 3D and it allows for undercuts. Let's pull up one of ZBrush's default VDM brushes that comes with that software. I'm going to click B to open up my brush menu, and I'm going to choose Chisel 3D. Up here, we see a bunch of VDM options. This is the most dramatic one, in my opinion, so let's use it. Uh, it's called Mouth01. I just drag it on, and boom. Do you see that? Normal alphas do not do that. So let's make our own VDM brush. I'm going to go to the light box. I'm going to go to Projects miscellaneous and in here you'll see brush 3d template there are five of them so i'm going to choose this one no here we have a plane for us to begin sculpting our vdm brush i'm going to sculpt the scale and i have some reference already off to the side here this is extremely important when creating vdm brushes avoid editing or warping the side uh, edges of the plane at all costs Otherwise, it will create artifacts in your brush. Okay, once you're done with a rough draft of what your VDM could be, I highly recommend testing it out before you spend too much time detailing and then you realize that it doesn't work, it doesn't look good on your model, maybe there's something wrong with the way you've constructed it, so feel feel free to test. 
The first step to getting this into a VDM brush so that we can test it is to make sure that these edges have not been warped. And I can tell you right now that they have been. I'm going to actually use the mask rectangle brush and I'm just going to mask carefully without getting uh, too close to my modeling. Uh, I'm going to mask the edges and I'm actually going to soften the mask a little bit and I'm going to invert. In the deformation menu right here, there is a button called Morph to Grid, which will basically uh, do exactly what it sounds like it will do. It will morph this plane back into a perfect grid plane. So let's go ahead and do that. And it should just update. And theoretically now we have a perfect grid on the outside here. Next, we're going to select one of the pre-made chisel brushes that comes with ZBrush. So I'm going to open up the brush panel and we have to select one of these four chisel brushes. Chisel, chisel 3D, chisel creature, or chisel rectangle. I'm going to choose chisel 3D. I'm going to go to create and I'm going to select create multi alpha brush. Before I do that though, I'm going to make sure that I am viewing my brush from the top view perfectly. So make sure you snap to the top view. And let's go ahead and click it, create multi alpha brush. And now you should have your new VDM brush right up here and you can actually use it and try it out. So let's do it. These brushes need relatively high uh, resolution up in order to get the details. But here is my scale. Before we move on, let me go ahead and show you guys how to save your new VDM brush. So you're going to go up here to brush and you're going to click save as and from there you are going to name it whatever it is that you want to name it and it should be saved you can load it back in you can set it up so that it loads every time you open up zbrush it's up to you so let's talk about creating a little bit more variety without having to re-sculpt a scale or whatever it is that you're trying to do every single time so i'm going to go back to my vdm brush and I'm just going to create more versions of this that are slightly altered. I'm going to duplicate it, hide the old one, and just kind of take the move brush, whatever it is that I feel is necessary, and just kind of look at my reference and try to copy a few of the scales and how they're set up. But here we have them. One, two, three. To add more variety to your VDM brush up here, I'm just going to select the new sculpt that I just did on the plane, and I'm going to say from mesh with the uh, brush that I want to add to selected. So I'm gonna go ahead and say from mesh, and then boom, now we have two side by side. Let me go ahead and pick the last one from mesh, and now I have all three. Let's go ahead and test. First one, second one, and the third one. Now that we have all three, I'm going to show you how to combine them into their own VDM brush, like little clusters to make our life even easier when we're sculpting our dyno. Start off with a brand new VDM template and your existing VDM brush and just use that to create little clusters. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to use uh, a mixture of all of my different brushes here and just create kind of an organic pattern. Here's the first one. So I'm going to actually make it more organic by using the move brush and kind of just fitting the pieces together. And now I'm just going to add a little detailing between them to make it even more organic. If like me, you made your VDM sculpt too small or off-centered or something, you can actually fix it by turning that into a VDM brush and then using that to create even another one. So let me go ahead and show you. Go create multi alpha brush and it should be up here. I'm going to find another plane as a template and simply drag it on and make sure it is big enough and centered or well, as centered as possible anyway. This is why you want your VDM brush to be as centered as possible because it's just so much easier to drag it on if it's centered. There we go. And I am going to go ahead and turn that into another option on my brush here. From mesh. There we go. And let's try it out. 
Testing is so important when it comes to these. I want to make sure that I never drag them on top of each other, otherwise that causes, uh, that causes warping. So I'm just going to go as far as I can and not worry too much about little gaps because I have the individual ones that I can use to fill those gaps in. I will take some of the singular ones and just come in here and just fill it out. These scales are pretty basic. But you can go crazy with it. You can create fish-like scales, scales with uh, overhangs, scales that are twisty, curvy, spiky. It's up to you. Let's take it for a spin on this super early version of the dinosaur I showed you guys earlier. So say I am using my brush, my VDM brush, and I'm just, you know, going to town. It's kind of putting scales down left and right. It's having a good time. That one is actually overlapping. Let's fix that. Uh, and then I put one over these um, osteoplasms. Actually, these are called osteoderms, not osteoplasms. Um, say I put something over there. Well, I want to take it off. I don't want scales to go over the bony parts of the skin. So what can I do? I'm going to try... I'm going to try taking it off with the smooth brush, but like, honestly, look, it's just making everything look really muddy. And not just that, but it's taking off the detail from the bony parts of the skin. So what we're going to do is we're not actually going to put it directly on the model. We're just going to use layers instead to make it easier. And I'm going to create a new layer. I'm going to do that by going in the tool palette under layers. And I'm going to click this big plus button here for new layer. And now I'm thinking, oh, actually, that doesn't really work for me. Like, it doesn't work for me. I, I hate it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop recording the layer by clicking that rec button. And I'm going to click the eyeball button. And look, everything that you edited with the layer is just stored within the layer. So you can take it off. And not just that, but you can actually change the intensity of it. So say I wanted the scales to be more subtle. Boom. Now I have them at 30% of the intensity. It's absolutely wonderful. Layers allow you to sculpt in a less destructive manner. And not just that, but you can actually go negative with your amount. So I can actually turn, uh, invert the way the scales work or whatever it is that you're doing with the layer by going to negative one, for example, and look what happens. But here's the thing though, all of this allows me to do is take the, the entire layer off. What if I still want to just erase part of the layer? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually store a morph target. So I'm going to turn off my layer and pretend that I never did any of this work. Okay. I'm going to go to uh, the tools palette. I'm going to select morph target, and then I'm going to say store morph target. And now this, this geometry is stored in this exact state. It can be accessed at any time. So let's go ahead and take it for a spin and see uh, how this changes our pipeline. I'm going to create a new layer. I'm going to put in my scales. La la la. Oh my goodness, I am so clumsy. I put it over the top of the bony areas again. Well, this time I'm not going to use smooth. I'm going to use the morph target brush. And it's right here, morph. So what this brush is going to do is it's going to locally allow me to access the morph target aka the mesh in, in the exact state it was when I made the morph target, all right? So in the morph target, there were no scales. So if I were to just paint over, look, they go away. It's absolutely wonderful and 100% a tool you should be using when you're doing any sort of surface detailing. This morph target usage is not to be confused with a smooth brush. It's completely different. All we're doing is we're restoring the area that we are brushing on to the state that it was when I saved the morph target. Okay. Say I'm putting these down, right? And I'm a little disappointed because I don't think that it's impactful and bold and strong enough. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop recording my current layer. All right. And I'm going to leave it visible and I'm going to make a new layer. And in this new layer, all I'm going to record is myself smoothing this stuff out. Just goodbye. Smooth, 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 smooth. And you're going to say, oh no, this is the exact opposite of what I wanted. I wanted it to be more impactful and you just made it a thousand times less impactful. 
Well, remember what I told you guys earlier about inverting the layer? So let's see what that does for this. If I set this to negative one, boom, you see what it did? It kind of just made everything even stronger. So one cool thing that you can actually do with VDM brushes that not everybody knows about is you can use them with color. All you have to do is with the VDM brush selected, you press and hold down spacebar, which will give you a lot of options for the brush. And you can select here RGB and you can select a color. Let's just say green for dinosaur. And then I'm going to try dragging it in and notice that look at how much easier this makes everything in your life. I'm going to show you guys on the eye area how to achieve a certain amount of flow and organicness. So first I'm just going to start by using my little cluster and I'm just going to follow the natural anatomy of the eye. The magic it really happens when you start using the Damien standard to define the wrinkles and the flow of your scales. Okay, so I'm here I have my VDM template, so I'm just going to create some random wrinkle. I am going to Go here to masking and then I'm going to say mask by cavity. If I were to do this for the rest of the skin, it would eventually look something like this. Well, that's it for my segment. To overview, we talked about VDM brushes, a little bit about layers and a couple tips and tricks, and a little bit about morph targets in ZBrush. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you, Pixel Logic, for having me and for hosting this wonderful online event. I love the ZBrush Summit, and I'm just so happy to be able to be a part of it again this year. Make sure to follow me on social media. Anna Carolina Art is my username on every single platform. I stream ZBrush every single Sunday on my own Twitch channel, Anna Carolina Arts, at 5 p.m. Central Time. Thank you so much, everybody. Ciao, ciao, galera. Um beijão. Ciao. I got you with the mute. You're doing it now. <laughs> Anna's in here. Anna's in here. Great job, Anna. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah. But, Drust, I want to add, people, we're going to add even something else to her workflow tomorrow in our presentation. Not today, tomorrow. Something, tune into our presentation, the Pixel Logic presentation. We got something else. But now we're going to go to Drust. Let's go to just Drust's screen. He's got something else to share, another tip. All right, so Paul's going to pick up on my polygroupit error. Um, I'm not going to go back in there. I'm not staying away. I'm staying away from that red wax. I got it. Did, did it to me. It did it to me. All right, so we had some questions uh, during uh, Anna's uh, presentation there. Why would you use a VDM? So the main thing is here I just have the standard brush. I've got drag, rectangle, and just a normal alpha. Now, if you draw this out, you're going to notice it's kind of giving you this kind of pushed up effect. You can modify this some in a brush modifier, um, but you're noticing that it's never going to have a undercut. And that's the key thing here that's different between using a normal alpha with a brush and using a vector displacement mesh brush. So the vector displacement mesh brushes are gonna allow you to get those undercuts. So this is just your standard alpha being applied to your mesh here. And now if I come over here and say select the chisel creature brush and drag this out, you can see it's getting this undercut. And that's the key thing, because now you can back these up on top of each other like this, and you're not going to be able to get this with a normal alpha. So if I switch back to that standard brush with that alpha, if I tried to get something to overhang, you see it's going to affect everything. So it's not going to have those undercuts. Now, another quick thing with the VDM is if you want to see how any of these are made, if you want to modify them, so she went through how you could take one and then you know use it to create another one. So it's basically like the straps on straps on straps. It's <laughs> scales on top of scales on top of scales. So if you want to see how any of these are made, just select one of these, come over here and just pick a poly mesh object, go to modify topology, do mesh from brush, and you're going to get that VDM right there. And now you can come through and modify this, change it up if you want to do anything different with it. 
And then you just come back over how she showed it and you go to the brush and you can go uh, from mesh right here and it'll actually load it to your existing one or you can create this multi alpha brush here. Now, another thing as well, if you've created a vector displacement map from another application, you can import those into ZBrush too. So if I come to texture up here and go to import, I have one that I've just made quickly on my desktop and it's gonna come in and it's gonna look crazy colored like this, right? And so after you bring it in, it's gonna come in looking like this. And then we come over here to the tool palette again, do that texture from mesh option right here. So you wanna make sure you have it selected and then do from mesh. Oh, and actually let me do, uh, I gotta have a plain 3D object, I failed. It's okay, I'm here. <laughs> I'm here for support, I'm support. And there you go, and it's gonna transfer to that object right there and now you can have this. So you've just brought in that texture map you brought it in the uh, vector displacement map and you've converted it to a vector displacement mesh. And then now you can go to your brush palette again and do the two mesh option here and it will create that as a new part. So just a little thing there in terms of how you can edit and modify them. And remember the differences for between the VDM and a normal alpha is that the VDMs are gonna have undercutting. Bingo. All right, Paul. Bingo. Polygroup it, polygroup it, polygroup it, polygroup it, polygroup it. Let's do it. Switch to me. Switch to me. All right, so here's an example where you would want to use polygroup it. This is James Kane's helmet. This is not mine. This is something he did when we made polygroup it. So what Joseph was was attempting, doing, attempting was doing, to do. He was painting. Okay, but the key thing here is you have to have enclosure. So it's like old school paint by numbers. So you see like this little opening right here and this opening right here. This is going to become a polygroup. This is going to become a polygroup. This is going to become a polygroup. And that's why I just went polygroup it, polygroup it, polygroup it, polygroup it. All right. So all you have to do is do that painting. Joseph already showed you guys you could use Sculptures Pro. So uh, this is a plugin, okay, that's in here. And all I'm going to do is go to polygroup it. And I'm going to hit this polygroup it from paint. I click. I wait a couple seconds. Boom. We're done. I turn on polyframe. <laughs> oh, 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 Merry Christmas. There you go. Now, every opening is like old school paint by numbers from the 80s, which I know is still around. As a dad, I see it, right? So every point that has the black paint, and if you notice, we zoom in close, we're looking at the middle point of the paint. And the one polygroup will stop at the middle point, and the other polygroup will come and meet, right? So that way you have this, okay? So this is one way to use it. And people, let's not forget all the stuff we just talked about, I'm, I'm telling you right now, doesn't anybody want some cake? Okay, I'm just I'm just saying it out loud, all right? Deformation, polished by groups, boom, you can see the sharpness that's starting to happen already right there for me by polygroups. And then we throw our little, you know, throw on top of this, boom, panel, done, move on, my life is complete. Oh, 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 oh. right, even forget that. Let's, this. I've got double turned off too, boom, what's the, what's the difference? People, people, look at that. You can even make something that looks kind of more like a leather. Like maybe you're doing a medieval person that's going to wear, or I don't know, or Roman. Yeah, and all, and all he did on this, too, he just painted, pressed a button, applied some polygroups. Yes! Wait, I'm going to show another way. Wait, I'm going to show another way. Okay, this is from Nacho Risco. If Nacho, if you are watching, thank you so much for letting me borrow this model as well. That was James, James Kane's model, which was our first presenter with James Powell of the Summit this year. So this is a ring, he's using live bullions, right? So Nacho is another amazing jeweler that uses ZBrush to do some really beautiful jewelry work, right? And so this is an example from him using this plugin now, right? So I'm just gonna go to his sub tool. And I'm gonna go to the top one, the very top one. Let's take, let's take a peek, shall we? Come with me, right? Bam, right? So that's what we're looking at. See the paint, the painting he did here? Right, so you see he just painted out the design he wants on the ring. Notice it is all single planes, right? There, there's no there's no thickness here, okay? I know the jewelers out there is like, you need your millimeters, you need your thickness, obviously we're, we're using gold, silver, bronze, paper, whatever you're gonna use, okay? Now, all you gotta do is this, all right guys? This, this one, you guys gotta pay attention. This one's a tough one. This one's a difficult one. Press a button, okay? So you just click border, right? Sit back, have a sip of water, done, okay? That's it. That's all I have to do. What did that do for me? Watch this. 
I've got not only poly groups, look at, oh, look at this, just, and Nacho did a great job at this, really, honestly, beautiful, beautiful, right? You see each leaf and each part, its own poly group, but not only that, I'm going to turn off the paint, but not only that, but the black paint is its own poly group as well. Why do you care? People, this is how easy it was for him to do. You could even use old school extract here, okay? Then I just say, oh, give me some, extract it, okay? Uh, I'm going to say, yes, accept it. Bam. There you go. There you have it. There. It's that easy, people. It's that easy. Okay. And Dress, I want to throw one thing at him real quick. I'm going to do it. Do it. Do it. I want to I want to do it. I want to do it. Can I do it? Can I, can I go? You can, can do I, it. Okay? And then we'll move on to the next video. Okay. So, guys, we got this beautiful edge loop world, right, that we live in. Right? You see that? I just made a new edge loop. Okay, you see this button right here, edge loop. Okay, so I'm gonna change my hotkey on this. I'm gonna blame Jurus because he deletes my files from these computers half the time. So I, I've only done that once. Leave me alone. All right, you're right. It's only been one time. I'll never <laughs> let it go. I'll never let it. Go. That's because you had it in the trash can, like it was just hanging out. Give me a break. I did not have. It, let's see. Let's see. Chat. If you have something in the trash can. It wasn't in the trash can. It was on the desktop. It was no, it desktop. was in the trash can and I emptied the trash can. That's it. Stop bringing our stop bringing our home life in, <laughs> into the stream. Let's move on. Okay, so I'm shrinking and growing my selection. Control shift S to shrink, control shift X to expand. That's the same thing as going here since you guys love to look at the UI so much. I don't. Right? There's your grow, there's your shrink in the visibility. Me, I, I'm at this point. I want to work like this if I can, right? I get it. We want to see where UI is, though. So I'm going to shrink it, shrink it down, and I'm going to come back to this edge loop. I'm going to say, let's add a little crisp, and let's displace it out a little bit. Edge loop. Oh, look at that. I, look what I just added. A whole nother element. <laughs> this is so fun. All right. We got to move on to the next video. There you go. We're moving on to... Brendan now. Let's play that next video. Let's go. Hey guys, it's Daniel here. I work at SciShow Collectibles as a sculptor and art director. And today I would like to share some tips with you. Let's begin. Okay guys, uh, what I have here, it is a kind of a hammer axe or Axe Hammer, I don't know the name of this exactly, but um, I would like to share with you some of the process I've used to create the grip. I'm going to, to tell you how I did this, um, the cores, the in, these interlaced cords. Let me show you. Okay, first we're going to insert a cylinder. Um, Let's try to find the same volume that we have here. Something like this. Perfect. Um, let's, let's turn off all this subtitles. Then we need to apply or insert or open, let better say, a Helix 3D. Um, and then I will bring here our cylinder so we have a reference of uh, how tall this course should be then we need to go to initialize so we can we can uh, trick some of the settings of this helix first we're going to uh, set the radius I will read off at this point here in the middle just uh, moving out of this uh, window here so now we have this shape like a uh, almost the same size of our cylinder then we're going to adjust coverage so let's say something like this and the thickness and for the thickness I'm going to lower this point and try to do it exactly the same on the other side. Double check that you have the same volume on the vertical side. It says 1398. Let's try to do exactly the same to the other side. There you go. Uh, let's trick 
the radius just a little bit lower okay perfect okay now I'm going to press uh, make polymesh 3d so we can unlock the rest of the options of the geometry I'm going to press shift F so I can see the polyframe and I will hide the rest of the sections because I will try to make a kind of a tile a tile of this section right okay there you go so now I'm going to delete hidden here or you can go to the geometry panel and um, use it like this geometry modified topology and then they'll hidden I'm just using my personal UI but you can go like the normal way you can use the normal way uh, okay then I will press W control hold control click and draw release and we have this copy it um, then I'm going to duplicate this subtool and I will go to deformation and press mirror we are going to work in these uh, overlapping chords so let's select move topological you can press B M T then press alt and push out move out this and in this section just push in this is out and in then press alt click on the other subtool so you can select it quickly without going to this palette and uh, do the opposite just push uh, push out push in and push out and push in right so you will have this kind of um, effect of uh, interlaced then we're going to do the same thing in the other side so let's just push out this is out this is in and in alt click on the other sub tool select it push in uh, it was, oh, I'm sorry this out is in and this out right so now we're going to merge both sections I just uh, go to sub tool menu merge down okay you have both the only thing we need to do first before copy the rest of, of these chords is to hide and delete this section because uh, we're going to close and connect the holes later right we're going to keep this section with ctrl shift click and drag then drag outside to make the opposite selection right and the hidden and that's it we just simple uh, press w click drag and release but don't release a click because if you're going down you can keep coping using the same amount of distance so this is pretty useful thing then release and that's it so a quick way to uh, connect and, and well all these parts it is um, we can go to geometry then to modify topology and well points of course we'll, we have to adjust the well distance first let's say uh, I, okay perfect and 10 it works perfectly and it is just one entire thing and if we if we want to check uh, if this uh, was well done weld we can press auto groups and just check if the entire thing is one solid thing which it is right then we can press close holes and these holes will be closed and um, yeah, pretty good okay now we are going to insert our uh, cylinder that was our base we're going to move move it like this and uh, we can adjust this perfect 
and then we can play with the thickness uh, pretty easily like using in flat if you go to select your helix then go to deformation panel and just look for inflate put it like a, in a minor eight for example something i think it works perfectly and um, then we can scale it you can put this you can use a gizmo to uh, scale you can adjust the distance like i use an, an, an axis scale and now we can look for uh, this square shape that i showed you before instead of just being uh, like a, as a cylinder we can make a more um, rectangular shape right Okay, thanks for the escape option of uh, the auto save, guys. Thank you so much for that. Um, so you can do this uh, in a multiple ways, right? But uh, let's let's do like uh, like I did it. So let me show you. Just merge down and put in just one sub tool both the cores and the mainframe. Then press W. Uh, select the gear icon and press the former and um, you will get you will get this this is former which is pretty awesome because you, you can uh, you can work with this uh, contour points and you will deform this shape right but um, if we're going to make it like a rectangular I think what we can do it is add another section play and press in this um, orange icon you're going to make sections so you have more control points more control points more control right uh, over the entire geometry I, I want to put just two sections and two sections like this then um, I will select this section in the middle click invert then I scale it and as you can see we are getting this uh, rectangular shape and I'm going to do the same for this section and scale it again so for rectangular shape you just select this section here and then push up and there you go then the only thing left it is go to gear icon again and press and uh, accept and that's it so now if you press ctrl D to make some uh, to add some subdivisions you're going to see uh, this looks pretty nice so uh, let's just select this thing here and uh, do an minor inflate so you get this it's pretty nice right pretty cool and another thing you can do to make these um, sections like a, with a better interaction between each other you can go and select one chord then damn standard and just try to pull this right so you're going to uh, create the effect of um, tension you can do it in, in every piece of course it takes some time but um, and I know we could do this before uh, but I think if we can if we can uh, work in every single one we're going to get a more natural shape and uh, the behavior will be different actually you can go and use the move topological brush and then you can move it just a little bit to add more variety right you can push it this and, and, and again you can control and select and you can go to down standard or any other brush and just make this right you will get a better form and another thing we can do it is to add the texture so 
in order to do that first we need the UV maps and this is pretty simple we just uh, just go to C plugin UV master uh, click on photo groups and then unwrapped and it says this function is required that you be at the lowest division level plus go to one and try again which is I forget thank you for this guys we can try again and wrap and that's it it's pretty easy and quick now let's go to surface noise maker let's click on UB uh, press uh, click on color blend and put zero um, then select a texture perfect and I will put some I will put my mix basic noise on zero to scale down just a little bit more and I would add some uh, uh, strength and I will click more tiny texture something like this I think it's okay okay click on okay and then I recommend I always recommend to use layers before apply a texture because if you want to change it or if you don't want it anymore or if you want it more uh, pumped with more intensity you can do that with layer without any 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 problems right so layer noisemaker apply to mesh and I'm sure it looks pretty cool yeah it's pretty nice then turn off layer let's name it like a texture again texture and uh, um, let's try putting in two intensity so as you can see the effect it's more obvious so this is it guys um, I really hope you can find these tips useful and if you have any questions please let me know you can contact me through my social media and keep enjoying this cyber summit and i hope to see you next year but in person bye bye guys take care all right all right great stuff i'm i'm leaning back for this one. Oh, so so for how many times didn't so he's won was it the 3D Print of the Award, 3D Print of the Year Award? How, how yeah. many times did he win that? Uh, I want to say it's three times. He won three years in a row, I want to say, for the uh, 3D Print of the Year Award. Yes, I want to say it's three. Yeah, I don't remember. Awesome. Awesome. I awesome. can't awesome. remember how many we've done now. I want to say we've done six awards. Because mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Frederick Joust won, uh, I think, two years ago. And I don't remember. I'm trying to remember who won the year before. I don't remember now. All right, Dress, you got something for us. I'm leaning back. Yeah, I don't. I don't mean I don't. I got something, but I don't have much to recap on what uh, Daniel showed. He, he excellent yep. stuff all the way around. Um, just a few things I want to hit on quick. So as you saw, what he did with the ropes on his. Uh, I don't even know what you call it. Or the hammer axe. I don't, I don't have a. <laughs> You're good. I would call. There's it probably, that. There's probably a name for it. it. I'm sure. I'm sure he's right. I don't. Even, I don't know it either. But basically, when you model stuff like that, like ropes and strings and, say, like bandages for a zombie, um, you don't really have to, you know, since it's 3D, you don't really have to model the thing exactly how it would be in order to get the same effect. So one thing that I often will do, too, is, you know, if, say I have this Wacom pen here and I want to put, you know, some, say it's got a rubber band on it or a piece of string or a piece of rope, um, you can always just append in, say, like a cylinder. And this is just a, a cylinder primitive here. And if you scale this down and then move it up in relation to your model and then just rotate it and scale it, you can see you're getting that kind of effect as this is like a piece of string that's wrapped around. Um, so you can definitely take it the full effect where you can go through and make it so that it actually flows all the way through. Um, but oftentimes just taking you know, the, the object itself and just manipulating it, just holding control and clicking and dragging, um, you're gonna get that same effect. And then if you do what Daniel did by coming through and you know using that option to mask by polygroups and then use that move brush with that alternate functionality. You can pull those in and out and get that nice interweaving happening. Now, a few other things he showed, just want to recap on that, is he showed the process where you can have the Gizmo 3D, and if you hold control and click and drag, you're going to get a duplicate of it. But if you're doing this and then you release control, this is going to allow you to keep growing out that replication. And it's remember that distance you did first. So to recap this, if I have my part here, and then I just want to hold control and drag it out, 
And wherever I stop, it's going to remember that distance. And then if we release control, I still have my mouse or my pen down, and then drag, it's now going to repeat at that distance. And this is going to go until you release that pen again. So that was one trick you showed there with taking that rope and moving it up and down. So let's just recap on that. Now, another thing he did too, he was using inflates. So remember, if you have the Gizmo 3D active and you go to the scale modifier here in the middle, you're going to see down below here, it says control to inflate. So you don't have to go to the deformation panel. You can just hold down control and click and drag, and you're going to be able to inflate right with the Gizmo 3D. So you can go directly from doing that duplication process, moving, and then now you can come in here and you can hold control and drag on the Gizmo 3D and do that inflate as well. So just two little additions to the excellent stuff that uh, Daniel showed. Russ, show them how he's at. The, you, you've converted somebody to have the earthquake as your cam view. Show them where you're, you're changing the cam views. All right, so if we go to preferences and you go to the cam view option here, you've got a bunch of these that are presets. One of these is earthquake. So you can come through and you can click through these and these will give you different versions of the cam view here. And then if you want to make your own, so let's say I really like the Wacom pen here and I want this to be my cam view. I don't know why you'd want this one because you're not going to be able to tell which is front. But you can take any model and if we go to preferences here, you just need to put on screen in the middle there, and then you click Make Cam View, and this is going to go through and model it in all those different positions. And I can see up here, I have this very tiny Wacom Perfect. pen there as my camera view. So you can create your own camera view from anything. Um, if you had a scan of Paul's head, you could definitely take that, make mm -hmm. that a cam view, all sorts of fun stuff. Wait, I do, I do have something. I lied. I just thought of something with the heel. <laughs> I lied. I'm sorry. Show my screen. Okay, web, give me full webcam. Give me full webcam right now. Full webcam. Ah, I just wanted to see myself full size. Thanks for doing that. No, you guys <laughs> see this? Okay, there we go. See that? See that screw? Guys, this was done in ZBrush. Look, screws in and screws out. And this was done on a MakerBot, an FDM printer, right? So we made, I made various sizes of this. This is all done with the Helix, all of this. Pretty much doing the exact same thing that Daniel did. So if you show my ZBrush screen real quick, right? So he was just using a, that's pretty much what I did the same thing as him, using a cylinder and then the helix. Now for me, I wanted to have some threading on this. So the initialize state, I first need this to be perfectly straight threading. So just like him, I changed this. And then I found the spans that I wanted to have across here. So I changed these spans right here. Right, so you see this number right here? It's, hold on, let me put it up higher. This Where's your magnifier, Paul? Where's your magnifier? That's div right here, right? You can get a number and say something like that. So you see now there's gonna be a peak point right there, right? So this is what I wanted to use as the threads, okay? It's, this, it's, it's really simple sometimes. And then boom, there's that. And now all I did is the same thing as Daniel, right append a cylinder right i'll turn off solo mode and now i'm just my cylinder is not the size i want it to be so i size it down so we've got overlapping geometry and then i stretched it across and then you go you've got your threading there it is and then this when you go to soften it and just see it does that so obviously i want this edge right here to crease so that that threading does that. And then for those that know me, I like to live in the world of creasing, but I like to add a little more geometry and kick down that creasing a little. Oh, <laughs> there we go. Right? That simple. It's not rocket science here, right? It's just and then that's how I'm getting this working threaded piece. Yeah, and then you just merge those together with that remesh by union deformer, and then you can go through and create the Boolean shape off of it, and it's going to match. Yeah, Joseph and I made like tiny ones, and this all worked, right? So there you go. There's another little tip for you that we want to do. Let's move on to the next video. Hey, everybody. Brendan Isaiah Bankston here. I'm a lead character artist at Crystal Dynamics and a streamer on ZBrushLive.com. Today, I'm going to show you how to do some super cool realistic leather. Yeah! Let's do it.
do it. So realistic leather has so many details in it, and it's awesome. You can just drill into it and get all in there and sculpt all over it. It's awesome. It's one of my favorite things to do. But now some of you may be saying, Brendan, why don't you just use a material? And then the materials, why not? Just throw them on there. Slap, slap, slap. Nah, man. Sculpting is fun. You got to get in there. You got to drill in and get all those dirty details in there. Let's get to sculpting. I mean, you could throw material on there, to be fair. And I usually do. But when you throw material on there, you don't get all of this cool little memory wrinkles in the right areas. So typically what I'll do is I'll do uh, a little bit of both. So I'll go in and I'll sculpt these little memory folds in the areas that I want them. And then later in the material phase, I will overlay a leather material in some of these larger sections. So what better time than to show you right now? Here's how I do it. Uh, so I'm just going to grab a standard plane, a 3D plane, plane 3D. Uh, make sure that that is a polymesh 3D. We're going to go ahead and subdivide it a couple of times because I want enough. Eh, usually, I think it's I think it's six for this one. Uh, about a million. Uh, yeah, say about a million. Cool. Now, secondary forms. Okay, sculpty, sculpty. First, second. Actually, that's that's also a second. This is a secondary. I'm just gonna get maybe it's just some kind of base, interesting, somewhat interesting forms. I mean, it doesn't have to be perfect. It's just for... It's never perfect. Okay. Just some super simple... Like that. Okay. Next step. Establish some smaller details. Alright. Uh, so I'll usually we'll just use my standard brush here. I'll use drag rack. And then for me, um, I'm going to use... Uh, alpha, just to, at, we can really just use almost any kind of leather alpha, as long as it has some kind of base details in here. In this particular case, I'm going to use Leathery Skin 79. Something like that, okay? Alright, so let's adjust. We're going to do subtract, and we're going to take that down a little bit. Cool. This is the beginnings. All right, so I'm going to head back up to the highest subdivision here. And then I'm just going to start laying in details. Actually, before I start that really important point, morph target. So you want to store your morph target first. That way you can always get back to this state. All right, so I'm just going to start throwing in just some kind of crisscrossy. So what I really want is I want these things um, to have really happy accidents, right? So when I'm throwing down these alphas, I like, I'm watching how these um, are kind of intersecting in between where I'm dropping them. So I kind of want to go in a X pattern. So these are kind of going this way, and then these ones kind of go a little bit across that grain. So we're starting to get these little shapes in here like this guy and this guy and this guy. So I'm just going to continue to just throw a bunch of this in and I'm looking for happy, happy accidents. Happy little accidents. And I'm not too concerned about it being repetitive uh, because when I overlay them um, and kind of mix and match like this, you will get rid of that repetitiveness. I don't want to go too much. I'm just going to go kind of enough, right? So I'm starting to lose a little bit in here, which is fine. You can always go back, All right? So I'm just going to do the, the, the main memory folds through here. So again, I want, I'm looking for this kind of this crisscrossy action here.
something like that. Okay. And then now what I can do is take my morph target, B M O morph brush, and I can just pull some of this back a little bit, right? So it's going back to that previous state. That's the awesome thing is that it's like rewinding a little bit. So the idea is get some happy accidents happening, um, and then we'll kind of capitalize on those happy accidents. So these these big memory stress folds will usually happen in between some of the secondary shapes. So maybe I'll just pull that out just a little bit. If I don't like it, pull it out a little bit and then go back, right? So we're going to go back to our standard real quick and then maybe I'll just do another one in here. So like that. Cool? Oh dude, it's actually starting to look like leather. Okay, next step enhance. All right, I'm going to use our damn standard here. And I'm just going to pull out some of the areas that I really like. All right, so I'm going to use this base layer as how I want to actually pull out more of these details. So I'm just going to kind of go in and pick out some of these and enhance, enhance. All right, so the whole idea of this that first layout was to just get some of these interactions happening where I can go in and really add some extra little details in there. Happy little details. So we're just going to get some crisscrossing in some of these areas. So. I don't like that. The good thing we gotta do. Okay, maybe so maybe something like this. Kinda like that right there. Alright, so you're starting to see this varied depth happening. Alright, so I'm, I'm getting some uh, different shadow values, right? So it's gonna give us kind of a little bit more depth and, and interest. All right. And then I'm just going to vary this up a little bit. I'm going to kind of go in. And you can do this a couple of times if you want. You know, if you don't like how something is is looking, you can morph target back. But for the sake of this little tutorial, we're going to steam ahead. Keep going, dude. Just keep going. Eventually you get out of the valley of the suck. I want to make sure that I have um, some kind of different size pieces in here. Okay, cool. And then if you want to, you can go back and add a little bit more. So maybe we'll go back to our standard. And then we can just we'll add just a little bit more. So you can see as I'm starting to layer this information up, right, you can already tell where some of those pieces are going to be. And this is a little too repetitive in here, so I'm going to try to break this up just a touch. And maybe we can add a little bit more intensity. Alright, so I just want to break up some of those areas a little bit. Alright, that's cool. Alright, back to my morph brush. Pull out a little bit of this. A little bit of that. A little bit of this, and we're almost done. We're actually almost done. Here, now's the now's the fun part. Oh, I love this part. The big payoff. All right, so we got all of these kind of memory folds happening, right, in the areas and the amounts that we kind of want. All right, now, now, the magic sauce, inflate. I love inflate. Now what we're doing is, so basically what's happening is the, the skin is compressing and then where it compresses it, it buckles up like this, right? So the surface of the leather actually comes up a little bit in those areas. So all I have to do is come in here with my handy dandy inflate tool and we'll just start picking out some of these little spots where these happy accidents were happening in between my secondary shapes. All right. 
and I just I just go in and hit different areas uh, in different amounts, and it kind of lends to the whole organic feel. Oh, this is my favorite part. I'm a sucker for details. This is like my zen moment. All right, so we're getting that skin, really it's skin, right? Um, that buckles and pushes the surface up in between these stress lines. Like a that, like a that, like a that. Leather. Cool. Hey, now you know how to do it too. And now you can see that's how I did all this detail. All right, you just go in, find some areas that you want some stress in, um, drop some alpha, pick it out the details that you want with your dam standard and then you hit the inflate brush and you can do all kinds of cool stuff and that's really nice organic details so that's it short and sweet hope you enjoyed thanks for watching and as always i hope you had fun I hope you learned a couple things but most of all i hope you were inspired to go out and make some cool stuff so you get out there go make some cool stuff brendan says so all right, guys. Thanks. Bye. And you're muted. Get out of that mute. Get out of that mute. We're just going to do this for a while and see if he notices. He's not noticing. I'm noticing. I had to get my mouth, okay? <laughs> it's underneath my monitor, all right? <laughs> There you go. Okay. All right. So I want to show a couple, there's a couple little things here that uh, I want to touch base on. Obviously now in ZBrush 2021, right? We've got dynamics ability, right? So we can play with dynamics and start getting some cloth like this, right? So again, like Joseph's been discussing, it's important to embrace the dynamic subdiv for some of this stuff, right? This is where dynamic subdivs is going to come in really handy for when you're messing with something like this, where it's just a plane. Right, but I've got the smooth version, but really this is a very low, low, low polygon mesh, right? It's not that high because right now I've turned on dynamic subdivs here, right? And then we can even throw some thickness on this. So, cause you gotta have a little bit of some thickness there, right? And then, so even this with the thickness, will start folding there, okay? So I wanna show something too with leather and kind of maybe combining this as well and using now the new dynamics ability but before there was dynamics, this is a little rocketeer. Oh, a little tip of that to rocketeer. I'm a big fan of the rocketeer. So I've got a leather piece here as well. Okay. So I'm going to sole this out and you can see what this is. As you see, there's some stitching and there's some leather there. So now with, I didn't have dynamics that we did here, right? So we I've 3D printed this and I got all this kind of leather bunching up going on. I just want to show really quickly how easy it was for me to do this, right? So I've got this kind of mountainous bumping through here to give that leather like it's got padding inside there, right? Because you're gonna put that on your back. Gotta be good, okay? Here we go. So this is all I did. It's really simple. We're not getting complicated at this, right? So if you look at my mesh, okay? It's about right now 5 million because I started sculpting on it. But when I started, I started really low. Okay, so this is all I did. I went to my initialize here and I made a cube. And now what I like about this in the initialize state is I can set the difference along X, Y, and Z, how many spans of poly. So if I hit the quick cube, you can see if I turn on polyframe with shift F, shift it up, you get two by two by two, right? So you can see two, two, two over here. I know Joseph's gonna say two, 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 two right? So I'm going to say uh, in the Z, I only need one, right? In the Y, let's go up a little bit more. Let's go maybe six. And then in the X, let's go also go six. And then click Quick Cube. So you can see what I'm making here. By me changing these sliders, 
I can actually get a different type of cube. And in this case, now I'm starting, you know, add a little more topology there for me, right? So I really am a fan of working with this little thing just as a quick way for me to get a base, okay? It's also polygrouped off for me, which is gonna be my benefit, right? So for me, right, I want this, these back and front, okay, of this leather piece, I'm gonna flip it. And then I'm gonna control W to give it a new polygroup, right? There's my new polygroup. Bam. Wow, this is exciting. Right now I'm gonna to go to Z Modeler and I'm gonna say let's Q mesh. Okay, let's hold the space bar. We'll go to Q mesh and I'll say polygroup all. So I'm just and I'm gonna change that polygroup on the fly by tapping the tapping the alt key. There we go. And then now you can see I got a yellow here and the same thing on the back. So I'll pull that out. Tap the alt key, got a, got, you gotta give yourself new polygroups, right? And when we go to smooth this, you can see I start getting something rounded like this, right? So obviously as an artist, there's many ways to go about this, but I can just now just switch to, you know, like a move brush and reposition this to be kind of what I want it to be, right? Simple, 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 simple. Not, nothing too crazy here, nothing too crazy, right? So now that I have this, I'm actually going to tell ZBrush, hey, this dynamic, great. That's what I like. Let's apply it. So now that I've applied it, we're actually now got a little bit more information here. We got some more polygons, okay? So I'm going to divide up just a little bit more. That's probably enough for me, okay? And what I want to do is look at, say, this front part right here. You can see there's a front and back, okay? So you got a front and back. So I'm going to use like what Daniel Bell mentioned, I believe, and the if I remember right, auto groups, right? So that way, just the front is really what I care about, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to the gizmo. Here's another hidden trick. Here it is. Lisa needs braces. Lisa needs braces. Lisa needs braces. Look up here. Right? Hold control and tap. And you'll see what ZBrush does is mass up every other poly group but this one, Okay? And I'm actually now going to delete the levels. I'm just going to so you guys see the density that I'm playing with here, okay? And what this has done is giving the ability to mask everything off, right? I just wanted to show that because I think it's very handy. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take do one other thing with this. I'm going to take this green one, and I'm going to use my little wonderful slicing, okay? I'm going to use my slice curve here, okay? Lisa Needs Braces goes from a Simpsons episode. Whenever I say Lisa Needs Braces, I'm giving you probably something that's important. So you definitely want to be paying, and that's where that's where it comes from. So I'm just going to quickly make polygroups a different way. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And I'm going to do this. So I got different polygroups happening through here, right? And you got you can put as many as you want. I'm just slicing through them and making different. I'm going to add a bunch of more here, making different polygroups, right? You guys see what's happening there, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell ZBrush, okay, these polygroups that I'm looking at. What I want to do is come here to my edge loops. You can see I, I live in this world a lot. I've already shown you the edge loops. We've already talked about panel loops. But people, there's also group loops. This is super handy. So this is applying loops around the, the existing topology that I was showing. And you can see those loops are clean, right? So that's, let me go back. So you see I have different polygroups, right? And I've been slicing it. You can come over here. You've got ability to polish. You've got, you know, what kind of polishing you want. You want how many loops. You want to allow triangles. And then you just hit group loops, right? And what that does, okay, is gives me now these paneling points, right? That's pretty much what's happening here. But what it's also happened is I got polygrouping here, right? It's created loops around so right if you look see there's loops happening here Here, i'll go up another one there you go so you can see there's loops that are happening right there right so here i'll control w and make them just one polygroup now so you can see it and what i'm going to do is i want to use that as a way for me to play with the mesh right so if i mask those off you can see what we get there right and now as an artist you can just simply come down here to deformation if you wanted to and then just inflate it out a little bit, right? And you can see, and then I can smooth it. And what I'm gonna, I'm gonna hide my mask now, is that. Right? So I'm making more of a soft body like what Brandon was doing with leather. So I'm just making it happen for me 
And then obviously now with the dynamics, we can start throwing the dynamics at this. And But I've, I've set myself up with the polygrouping that I need to make all this happen. This is pretty much, this is exactly what I did for that that backpack part of of my um, Rocketeer, right? So if we look at this again, that's, this is how I did this. That's all I did, right? And then I just sculpted away like what Brandon was doing to make some leather, right? So there you go. There's a, another way to use looping and polygrouping to get something for you. And then, bam, there you go. Drust, do you have anything? Or are we ready to move on to the next video? All right, for the next. Move on to the next video. Let's do it. Hey, Zebra Summit. My name is Eamon Akhtar. I'm a 3D artist in Los Angeles, and I've been using ZBrush since about 2006. It's a long time. It's a regular part of my workflow, daily sculpting, and it's a really awesome tool. Um, I do it a lot for 3D printing and toys and articulated characters, as well as concept art maquettes. So the tip and trick I wanted to share with you today is about how to use render booleans to create keys for your 3D prints. I've got this model here set up and I crocheted that I've sculpted. And let's switch it to a sculpty material. What I'm going to do is show you how to start making keys for your own projects. Now, I'm going to get rid of the base because so, I don't need it. So I'll click Auto Groups, Control Shift, click on it, and go under Geometry, Modify Topology, Delete Hidden. You'll also notice that the eyes are separate colors and that's because they're separate pieces, but for 3D printing, you don't want multiple meshes overlapping each other or intersecting. You want it to be one solid piece. And ZBrush is really great because the standard DynaMesh at the right resolution can do just that. It'll create one watertight piece of object. So there we go. Now this is technically 3D print ready, though I might take it through Decimation Master. However, what if you wanted to have heads that swapped out? Then you may want to create a slice right there to have the head printed separately. This also applies for if you're trying to 3D print something really large, uh, you may need to print it in a bunch of smaller pieces so that each piece can be oriented and supported for, you know, optimally for that piece. For example, the head, you don't want supports coming in on the face because that'll damage and you know create chips that you have to fill in. And that these are the kind of considerations you have to make as a digital artist making things for the real world. You have to kind of think like an engineer and know how things are going to be made. So let's get started. In order to split this, it's pretty straightforward. Let me duplicate this so I have a backup model. And I'll switch over to my slice curve brush while holding control shift. This will let me draw it out as I click Control Shift, and you'll see it changes the poly group color. And I can go simply to Subtool, Split, Group Split. And now I've got a head and a body. Another pro tip for you always label. You'll notice, however, that the body's got a hole in it. And this isn't ideal for 3D printing either. You can't have holes in the meshes. They need to be solid and watertight. You can double check by going under display properties and turning on double and confirm that yes, indeed, that needs to be filled. And DynaMesh is really great again because you can simply just DynaMesh by control dragging and it'll fill that in. Do the same thing on the head. Now this is technically good enough, but the head will just slide off the body. There's nothing to keep it in place there. Um, maybe glue, but if you want to swap the heads out, then maybe you want to create a, an actual key to pop that on. The way we're going to do that is by creating a new key, and I'll show you how to do it. So I'll press Control N to clear my canvas, go to Cube 3D, and draw that out. We'll click on Make Polymesh 3D. And under the Deformation tab, I'll click on Taper, maybe just in the Y. And let's taper that down a little bit. And so this is a pretty standard key, 
just a tapered square key, but it's perfect for plopping something on and taking it off. I'm going to look at it from the top down and create an insert mesh brush inside my brush palette, new, and then when I go back to my body, I can draw it on over there. If I'm trying to be precise, I'll press the X key to turn on symmetry, and then when I come to the center, it'll kind of snap and become one object. And I'll draw it there. You'll also notice if you switch to any of your move, transport, rotate tools, you can drag it in and out, whether you're on traditional transpose or the new gizmo. And you want this to be slightly buried into the mesh, and then just DynaMesh. And that kind of blends it all together and makes it one piece. Now we're going to duplicate the body and call it body cutter. Maybe inflate it also. Not much, maybe just by one. And we'll click on that half moon shape icon because we're going to use the body to cut out of the head in order to create that key. Now you'll notice at this point, it's already happened, and that's because I've got render live booleans turned on. If you don't, you won't see anything. But if I turn it on, that body disappears because that half moon icon actually makes it a cutter. And if you really want to double down on making something a cutter, you can go under poly groups and see, make sure we have the body selected. You can see it in polyframe. Under poly groups, you can say group as DynaMesh sub, and that's kind of doubly making sure that something's a cutter. Turn solo mode off. These are really great, the booleans, the render booleans like this, because this has not actually happened yet. This is just a preview of what's to come. So this allows us to actually adjust the sculpt on the fly. I can change that key, make it smaller, bigger. I can even rotate the position, say if I wanted a really clean cut around this edge of the face, I can move that up. So Boolean cutters are really powerful like that. But what I'm going to do is just demonstrate and I'll show you now a much faster way of doing all of this. So go to the head, go under booleans and make boolean mesh. It's going to think about it for a second. And there it is. It'll plop it on as its own model, but there's the head. So we'll call this then body keyed and append that head which we'll call head key and you'll see how that fits on top of the other one now let me show you a way of doing this a lot faster it's just by using a smarter boolean tool we're going to go over to that cube that we were working with and let's duplicate it. So first we'll have that as a backup and let's go under Z modeler, ZM to add some edge loops. So we'll come over to the edge and add some edge loops. I'm going to go make sure your perspective mode is turned off and you can select that and simply scale it up. I'm going to move it up as well a little bit. And I don't really want it to be super thick, so I'm going to make it a bit thinner. All right, so now we've got that, which is perfect. Let's go ahead and DynaMesh it. 
Let's dynamesh that. Let's say 128 resolution. And now we're going to take that model that was above it and actually move it down a little bit and use that as a Boolean cutter so that we can have a negative. And you can actually see in transparency mode how this goes in and customize it a bit if you'd like. Maybe I'll move it up. All right. So now we'll have this object and we'll use that as our cutter. So go under, well, let's first make it a final thing because it's still a render Boolean. I'll go to render, no, I'll go to Boolean and make Boolean mesh. There it is. And we'll now go over to our IMM brush. So we'll go to brush create insert mesh and go back to our body and now I'm going to use the original body so no slices or keys on it this is just the dynamesh piece that we had originally and I can draw it on just while holding shift split it so it's its own item and move it into place. Now you can use the transparency mode to make sure it's nice and clean and you can rotate it and move it however you please. Now you can see one edge is a bit longer than the other one. And that was just because when I scaled from the gizmo, it wasn't at the center. But it'll still work for our goals. I'm going to use that as the cutter now. Turn off transparency mode, and you can already see what's happening. It's going to, in one cut, prep the head and the body. Rather than this being a 10, 15 minute process, it's going to be a one minute process. So I'll just simply click on Boolean now, make Boolean mesh. It's going to think about it again. And here we are. You can do auto groups and then you'll see that the head has been keyed perfectly with the tolerances and so is the body and you can simply just split group split and now you've got a body keyed and a head keyed so that was my pro tip it's using render booleans in order to create your keys and articulation for 3D print. Now you don't have to just do a simple tapered square. You can also do a hinge joint or you can do a ball joint and there's a whole bunch of joints in the middle. So if you're interested in this kind of thing, I highly recommend check out ZBrush, get it. I have a brush on Gumroad called Keys and Articulation, which is does basically just this. So you can check that out and follow other ZBrush artists, see what we're all up to. Uh, Check out the ZBrush live streams. They're pretty cool. I hop on sometimes. So that's my tip. Thank you, everyone, for having me. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the ZBrush Summit. Thanks so much. Cheers. Hey, you know what that is, Dress? You know what that video was? Besides the amazing tip? Let's make sure you're... You know, you're not muted. We're going to play this game. Sometimes it's going to be me. Sometimes it's going to be you. I'm back. I don't know what it, what, what is it? What was it?
This is halfway point only of these videos. That was literally no, video number six. We've got six more videos, people, which means you also have me and Joseph still throwing things at you. So I want to use this as a midpoint to do the next favorite thing that you all love is give away some stuff. Okay. Let's do some giveaways <laughs> just as our midpoint. You know, get that stretch on and one and two and three. You know, pull some of that 80s back. Ooh, da, 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 da. This is like seventh inning stretch. You know, we're just getting going here. We're only halfway through this segment. Sorry, boys, up in the booth. We, like I said, there was no way we were going to end at two o'clock today. Not happening. So, guess what, guys? We're going longer than two o'clock. Man, happy holidays, right? Okay, so let's do this. Let's do some giveaways. <laughs> what do I want to give away now? Let's see, let's give this one away. Let's do, so can you guys show my screen for me? Uh, thank you, boys. So let's do another Space Mouse. Let's do this, okay? So let me see who my winner is. Again, we're looking for you in the chat, okay? What is this? Scart of a salad, scart of salad? This is, this is what I'm, I'm I gotta write this down again so I can read it. I'm putting me in the chat who we're looking for. Scared, Scared of salad. salad. How can you not read this? Because I'm trying to read them. What is it? I gotta, now it's moving too fast for me. Scared right. of salad. Oh, yeah, there it is. Scared of salad. Thank you. Okay. Are you here? There yes. you are. You're here. Confirm. Watch out for that scared me. Watch scared out for me. that scared, scared me. me. Scared me. I'm just trying to make sure I'm clicking the right buttons over here, Dress. I got levers and things going on over here. That's what I'm trying to do. Okay. All right, let's move on to something else here. Let's do, let's do this one. Let's do this one. Yes, let's do this one. Okay, how about that? XMD source, right? So this is a lifetime membership. Let's draw the winner. Oh man, hold on. I gotta see, I gotta read and separate, make sure I'm not putting part of the email in too, trust. Okay, so stop yelling at me. Mm -hmm, Dang mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. Okay, there is our winner. There is White Sky. Is that right? White Sky 1478. Yeah, White Sky 1478. White Sky 1478. My uh, wonderful uh, partner and colleague, also Daisuke, is in here letting you know. Are you here? Are you here? He is. White Sky. You, he is? Is she is? No, right? Daisuke is. Daisuke oh, is. I don't know yeah. about White Sky. Yeah. Right? So there you go. White Sky. 1478. Why not 1498? I like that. So, all right. So that is another prize. Let's let's do you want to do one more? Do one more. Do one more. Okay. You want me to do one more? All right, all right, all right. Let's do one more. Uh let's see. I gotta make sure I'm on the right day here. It's, it's important. It's a lot going on over here. Lots going on over here. All right, let's do let's do this one. Let's do this one. Ah, uh, yes, yes. The extra mile course. The extra mile course from Pablo Minas on his 3D concept artist. Let's draw a winner here. Let's draw a winner. Let's see. Matt Smith. Matt Smith FX. FX. Matt Smith FX. Right? Or GFX. Oh, there's a G in there too. Matt Smith GFX. Are you here? And uh, you should be here. Because we still got another easily hour of content to go through here. If not, probably another hour and a half still of stuff to go through here. Right? So, Matt Smith, you have just won a 3D concept artist. 3D concept artist. Okay. There you go, Matt Smith. Congratulations. Congratulations. All right. So let's go to Joseph because Joseph has stuff to show now, right? Yeah, just, just a quick one, then we'll get then we'll get back to the videos. So this is what we were talking about um 3D printing. Uh, I wanted to bring up some other stuff. So the stuff Eamon showed was excellent. And the main thing there was after he made that little part, um, you can reuse that. So you just can drag it around as an instrument mesh brush, move it around and then make it as its own subtool as a Boolean subtract, and then you just run it, no process. So you can do the same things for arms, you can do the same things for your wrists, any of your joints, you just slide it in there and do it. And the tolerance you can all change. It doesn't have to be you know 
that thick if you don't want it that thick, but it depends on what kind of printer you're printing on too. So there's a lot of ways uh, to do that. So here we have just a uh, quick X-Wing here, and this was done by the Pixelogic team here for Magic Wheelchair. So we had uh, James Powell on yesterday from uh, Monster City, and their company actually turned this ZBrush model into reality, and then we took it to Comic-Con, and it was ridden around by one of the Magic Wheelchair uh, I don't know. I don't know how you, <laughs> what do you describe it. The uh, one of the uh, kids for Magic Wheelchair, and it was awesome. And so we did a whole thing of Star Wars um, kind of ships and stuff. So this is the one we designed in ZBrush, and then we had uh, Monster City uh, go through and fabricate it. So this was all broken into parts, and uh, some of the things we had talking about earlier was um, you know generating like, panel designs too. So we showed the one way of going through and using say alphas to generate designs. And the other way you can kind of use this is just using geometry with live booleans. And so the live boolean system inside ZBrush will allow you to generate subtraction processes on million polygon models. So you can basically take a model, add another subtool, you can set that subtool to either be a subtraction, an intersection, or a union, and then it will go through and give you the result. So as an example of this, I have my wing part here, and you can see if I click on this, it's a pretty dense Dynamesh, because this one's already been processed a lot with this functionality I'm about to show, but I just want to kind of hit on it again. And you can see all these little different paneled areas through here. Now, all these details, so this is a, a piece of the ship that I uh, contributed to, was all done with Zmodeler. So all these little parts here were just individual pieces that have just sunken into the surface. So you don't have to think about it as going in and manually carving these. You can use different model assets and then use them to your advantage to generate parts. So if I just have this part here and then I have a plain 3D object, or not even plain 3D object, just a quick cube, a quick cube here, I can take this really, and say if really. I want to... Do what, do what? Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. You're interrupting me here. Sorry, I'm gonna sit back down. So I can take this and you can see if this is part is taken and embedded into the surface of the other one, you're going to get that effect, right? So this is all this is for panel lines, right? You can take a part, intersect with something else, and you're going to get a result. And it's going to give you that clean connection between the two. Now, you could hand sculpt this if you want. You could pull in alphas if you want. But sometimes it's just easier just taking it and applying it as geometry. Now, you'll notice as this is applied to this mesh here, it's a little bit harsh around the edges. So right now, if I wanted to mold this, if I wanted to cast it, if I want to do anything with this, especially because it was going to get seed and seed milled out on that large scale uh, arm that James Powell had. It needed to make sure it didn't have any undercuts and it kind of almost had this draft mentality. So with this part being just what it is, if I isolate this and I go to geometry, I can apply dynamic subdivision to this and you'll see it starts smoothing out. And then in addition to this, if I don't want to go through and cut in edges to get beveling or anything else, if the model part is going to be squarish in format like this one I have here, I can just activate this Q grid. And the Q grid's already going to go through, and it's going to start giving me those beveled edges. And all I'm doing here is just changing the sliders here, and then manipulating these little uh, different values. And you can see how I can start getting a beveled edge. Now, oftentimes, this is going to be enough to give you that drafting that would be needed, so it's not giving that undercut. And so just that simple technique, this is still all I have in terms of a model, right? A very low polygon shape. I've added this dynamic. I've now softened those edges with this Q grid option. And now if I go back to my model, you can see now it's looking similar to some of the other parts. Now these other parts, I've dynamished this model. I couldn't find my uh, original one on the machine I have here. It's on my other computer. Uh, so this one's been processed a few times. That's why you're kind of getting some of these variations here. But then if I take this and now say position it like so, I can then replicate this. If I want to do something like this where I have these little striations, just make this tinier. And then we can hold control and drag, right? This is going to give me that offset. And then I can release and then keep dragging, and now I'm gonna get those replicated shapes out like that. And then you can go through and just continue doing this to build up on your forms. So taking these little parts, if I want one down here now, I can move it around, I can then reposition it, and all I'm doing is creating these intersecting pieces of geometry. Now these pieces of geometry can also be changed and have them look like they're actually inverted on the model too. So you started with a, that subtool there, so this is its own separate subtool. And if I come up here and activate Live Boolean, this is now going to look at the subtool list, and it's going to go in this hierarchy function. So it's going to look at the top subtool, and then it's going to process the subtool underneath it. And it's going to go all the way down your list of your subtools until it comes to another folder, a subtool folder, 
or another start icon, which you can turn on here. So right now, if I process this, it would look at this top tool, and then it's just going to add those parts of this one. If I don't want them to add, I can come through and subtract. And you can see as I do the subtract functionality, I'm now going to get that part as a subtracted form. So you can use the live boolean here with all these different parts to get those different effects on your mesh. Now, after you're happy with this, all you need to simply do is just convert it to geometry. So you go to Boolean. Since I was using that dynamic subdivision with that second subtool, I want to make sure that I have this dynamic subdivision op option on. And then I can click Make Boolean Mesh. It's going to process this. And it's going to take those intersecting pieces of geometry and weld them together and it, at the areas where they connect. And it's only going to generate topology where that connection happens. So the topology on those original models are going to stay the same. And this is a big thing for anything you know, manufacturing-wise, collectibles, toys, because it's not changing the topology across everything. It's not like doing a Z-remeshed version of the model where the topology is going to change globally. It's only going to change where those parts intersect. So if you had to add details, you know, split a model up, using the Booleans is going to be the way to do it. So you can see there's my topology there. And this is now fused together, and now I have that part. Now, another quick thing with the Boolean process as well is you can also use it for your keys, as Eamon was showing. And if I come in and just append a cube here, let's do another one of those. And we'll take this, and we're going to turn it to a quick cube. And I'm just going to position it. So let's say I want to break off this part of the model here. So this is just one subtool. I've already processed it with the Boolean once. I'm going to come through and just now scale this up. And let's just say I want to break off this part. So you can, that process that Eamon was showing, he went through and he was splitting it up, you know, using slices. You can also split it up just using Booleans. So if I just take this volume, just like this, and then I position it over top of my model there, and I come through and I can move this just so it's right where I want it. Now I come up here, and if I activate that as a subtraction, you see it's going to cut it off. And when this cut process happens, you don't have to go back in and you know, fill in that hole. The Boolean, if you run this metal again through live Boolean, it's gonna do that cut and this is the result you're gonna get. So it's already gonna seal that open face off. Now, if I wanna do the opposite part, which is because I need two of these, right? I can change this cutter now to be an intersection and now it's gonna give me the opposite side. And this opposite side is gonna reflect 100% the opposite of the other one. So this is gonna give you that clean cut between those two parts. And you can just process this twice if you want. You can also duplicate your subtools to get this happen multiple times. But all I did here was just change this little icon on the subtool here, and I'm getting the one version and the other version there. And then after this is done, you can add that keyed part again and get that little keyed mesh there. And then you just set it up here as its own tool. So we can do that really quick because Paul's already gone over time. Oh, oh really? Oh, really quick, Russ? Really quick? Okay. What I like to do, I like to set my resolutions down to 111 and then Q cube this. And now we have just this cube that's single sided, and I can place it through here. I can now hold control and get the mask brush, mask that one side. I can center the gizmo on the unmasked portion and click and drag, and that's going to give me that taper. So I'm getting this tapered shape here. I can now position this to where I want it to go, like this, and move it into position there. And then you'll notice that the edges are harsh on this again. So once again, this is where I'd come up to the uh, dynamic option here, and I'd activate that Q grid again. And this, you can see, is going to taper that key there. And I find that this helps you know, keeping that from being locked into the other model, especially after you print it. And so now I've just added that little taper there. So there we have shape one, just like that. I can run the live Boolean, and that would give me that part. Shape two, I'd come up. All I'm doing is here is changing this to an intersection and then setting the second one to subtract. And there is part two. So you can do that process too where you have these stacked. And then now if I Boolean this, I'm getting the one side as a result and then I can get the other side as a result. And all I'm doing here is changing which operation I'm using. So I change this from a subtractive to an additive and I get the part one. And then if I go to the intersection and then the subtractive, I get part two. So you can think about doing things like that in order to speed up you know, your keying process as well. And so for anything I do, helmets and all sorts of stuff, I will often use just geometry to do my cuts. And this is also non-destructive at this point. So if you do it, generate the mesh, you find out that, hey, that's not enough tolerance, or hey, that part you know, fit too snugly, um, you can come through and modify that as well. Uh, one more final thing with the- Oh, come on, here. really? Ah. <laughs> I have something I want to show. It's our favorite well, thing to do. 
Too bad, Paul. Too bad, Paul. Ah. Uh, <clears throat> there's also a uh, a little plugin you can grab from the uh, Pixelogic Resource Center, and this plugin is called Quick Scaler. And so if you want to come through and you know you need to scale up something that you have for 3D printing uh, by a percentage or just increase the scale in millimeters, you can use this. And so if I have key one and key two, and I know I want you know the one to be like 10% larger than the other one, I can set that and then come up here and run this. And if I do percentage, 10%, I can increase the scale, and it's going to increase the scale of that by 10%. And so then I'll have my small and my large one, and I can go through and do it that way. Another thing with this... Uh, plugin as well, it has the option to scale from your transpose line. So if you have this already embedded to where you want it into the surface of one, it'll look at the transpose line. And instead of giving this global scale, which it was doing here, if I set this to scale from transpose line and now run that again, it's going to scale from where that transpose line is located. So you can see it's scaled outward this way rather than doing that global scale that I did if that functionality was disabled. So a little thing there that will help as well if you're doing a bunch of keys and you need to like you find out your tolerance is sticking too much, um, you can go through and scale that up or down really quick and get that change. All right, Paul, you can have it. Oh, thanks, Dross. <laughs> Thank you. Wait, you don't have anywhere today where you're going to show our favorite thing with live balloons, which is with the brushes, are you? Because that's what I want to show. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think so, no. All right, I don't care. I'm showing it. I like it anyways. Okay, so here's our cargo ship that I've been working on myself. <laughs> Another one of those that'll never get done. <laughs> All right. So what I want to do is start doing like what Joseph was doing it. Like he was using like the meshes and duplicating them to create that designing element on the X-Wing, which by the way, that was part of the magic wheelchair that we talked about. Man, what is today? Monday? So yesterday? It was Monday. Monday. Yep. <laughs> Wait, today is Monday, right? Yes, today is Monday. It is Monday. Okay, guys, I, I, I don't know what else to do here to make you pay attention to this trick. In my opinion, this is one of the most powerful and probably my favorite trick in all of ZBrush, period. Period! Okay, so look at me. Look at me right now. Pay attention, okay? So I got this ship, and live booleans is my life, man. Non-destructive workflow is my favorite thing to do because I can change things on the fly like Joseph was doing, right? So I got this ship with a whole bunch of stuff that's starting to happen here, right? So you can see I got this element in here and then there's a whole bunch of, there's my cockpit, a little old little tip of the hat to Prometheus. I know, stop it, you love the movie, get. You should, you should probably taper that front a little bit. Oh, here we go. Oh, <laughs> here come the, here come the pixelogic jokes. Here they come, here they come, okie dokie. You guys don't know that joke, but I know where he's going with that one. So <laughs> this is what you guys can do. Right now, I just have a mesh like this. This is what I have. It's just this mesh. And in fact, this is actually an array mesh, OK? So this is being duplicated. We'll get to this. I don't want to get an array mesh now, because that's a whole other 45-minute conversation for me, which I don't want to take away from the videos, even though I'm already doing it. So what I'm going to do is I've got folders over here. right? And right now, that's my selected mesh, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to throw something in here. It doesn't, guys, this is not even relevant what I'm going to throw in here. I'm just going to append, no, I'm going to insert. I'm going to insert. Okay, let's be different. Let's put a cone. Yes. Oh, wow. That was awesome, Paul. Yay. Look, he's got a little hat. It's a birthday. Do, 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 do. Right, so you see that little cone right there? It's like this, Thor, Thor Ragnarok birthday right there. Oh, there you go. This is not relevant at an A shape where a form. I just want to make, in essence, another subtool. That's really all I'm doing here. I'm just trying to make another subtool, right? So people, oh, God, watch this. <laughs> Look, I'm not I kidding. don't even know where you're going on this oh, one. You I'm know sitting where back I'm, and I'm enjoying the show, too. Going. Dress, you know where I'm going. Because you and I both, when we were doing live bullying, you and I both got on a call. And we both were doing this. Him and I, okay? I'm going to go to I insert mesh brushes. And I'm going to grab the brush that Joseph painstakingly put together which is IMM Boolean. Guys, this, this is, oh my God, this is one of the best things ever. So now all I'm gonna do is, I'm in live Boolean already, so you can see whoop, at the top, right? I'm in live Boolean. That's right, I added time already, right? <laughs> so <clears throat> I'm gonna switch this subtool that I just added, right? So there was my ship I had selected in there. I'm gonna turn this to subtractive and magic happens. And when I mean magic happens, nothing, nothing happens. Where the magic comes into play is people pick a shape, pick a shape, take a pick, take a pick, take a pick. Let's grab this one. And now all I got to do is draw out. <laughs> what? What? Now look at that. 
you are now getting like, come on, this isn't like I got dynamic sub div on now. People, 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 come on, let me, let me, uh, let me rewind. <laughs> right? This, I can move it around. I can position it where, like, there's no way, you know, talk about box modeling that I would be able to come up with this box modeling like this fast. Like, the things you can do with this trick is insane. And if we have enough time, I'll, I'll even show more than just this using this trick, right? What I also love to add to this is because we've got the gizmo and because this is an insert mesh brush along the top, okay? I've got all these pieces. So everyone watch this one. All I have to do is click and we swap out the piece. So now this is a completely different piece. So all I do is just do click, click, click and swapping it out. And you see that blue arrow? That's important. It's not blue because of only the Z axis. It's blue because I said it's going to be blue in the program. Darn it. That's what I said. No, it's blue because it's the Z axis. And these brushes, when Joseph made it, he was looking straight at the camera like my hand is right now. Right? So this axis, if I turn this so that the blue is now facing up, anytime I click on these, you're going to get these shapes now. Because when he made it, that's the axis he was looking at. Right? And look, you guys can just swap through these. And I can't tell how many times I'm just, I'm just swapping through this. Like, mm, that one looks better. And then I size it up. Then I rotate it maybe. Now maybe I want it to go there. And then I do it like, like look and at this, that. This is all separate geometry too. So we had a question earlier about using VDMs and sliding them around the surface. Um, if you create your part, you can slide it around your surface, move it wherever you want, and it's going to subtract out of it, which is what it's doing here. Um, so you can create any part. Eamon did with the key and put it in your model and it's going to cut it out. Okay. Okay. I got to do it. Okay. You see, how I love a ray mesh now. It's, it's like my little, it's my, my baby Yoda now. Okay. That's what a ray mesh is to me. Right. I've got this duplicating cargo ship. This is a big ship that I'm doing here and I, I'll get all the scribe lining going here and all the stuff that you would see you guys saw in the razor crest today. Right. So I'm going to copy this array mesh that I'm doing here. Watch this people. All I have to do now is go to the other subtool, which is the one below it. I use the down arrow key to select it instead of going to the subtool palette. So the up arrow key selects the one above. The down arrow key will select the next one in line. I'm now just going to turn on a ray mesh here, and I'm just going to hit paste. Boom. It goes to all of them. <laughs> what? <laughs> I love how you laugh after oh, that. Yeah, I love it. This is, I'm not kidding. This is my favorite trick. I freaking like, come on. I love this so hot. This is how I did all this replicating, duplicating. It's like we all you may have the, you know, the Bob Ross and us there. Happy little accidents. Look at now. Look at my ship. I'm not talented at all. Look, it's all just live booing, live booing, live booing, <laughs> live booing, live booing. Live. I'm not doing it. I'm not spectacular in any shape, way, or form. It's just me using ZBrush. Right. And using this cake, num, 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 layering it. Right. If you want to cry like I am right now and save it for the morning and taste salt in the morning, it's fine. You know, an onion. That's it. You know, I just want to move on to the next video. I'm going to, I need a moment. I need to stretch. That this, was, this isn't even our Tuesday stream. The Tuesday stream is going to yeah. be, I mean, that one's late. Late, yeah. late. This is just, forget it. It's on like Donkey Kong. I'm jumping over barrels. Move on to the next video. Hi, my name is Daniel DeLeon, and, and I've been using ZBrush since uh, about 2012, I believe. And uh, this will be a brief demonstration of how to create a feathered anything, or perhaps even you could just say um, an arrayed anything in some ways. And using a nano mesh brush and uh, a feather I designed, and this creature that I replicated, I sculpted. Um, based on the, uh, if anyone knows, video game The Last Guardian. I'm um, a huge fan of this uh, beautiful story and game, and so I decided to go crazy and uh, create an homage statue um, that will be a gift to the creator of the game and the composer and uh, sound designer. Um, so uh, a very elaborate gift here, a very elaborate statue, which you can see right here, standing next to me. Um, and uh, for better clarity, I'll show you the final output um, from the form uh, two and also the form three. Um, here are just some sample shots that I took of this statue uh, with uh, a nice camera and some nice lighting setups. Um, but yeah, so going from uh, a single feather and a very carefully sculpted creature and we can get this whole thing and get it to print 
Um, so without further ado, say you've done your feather or you could do this with cards or even tubes, you know, anything you want to array across a surface uh, mesh. Um, the first key would be, of course, to have your asset that you want to array across the mesh, um, whether it be a feather or whatever. Uh, then, of course, the next thing would be to make sure that the surface you're arraying it on is not too high resolution. So you want to have a decent amount of quads, um, and I'll show you here in a minute, um, but nothing too dense, definitely not dynamesh. You know, you need to have some nice topology. Um, and again, it's all dependent to on how much thickness or thinness of, uh, you know, distribution of the objects that you want to array um, across it. Also, you have to take into consideration your computer's power and the uh, volume number of polygons that your object, feather, or what have you, um, is so that it doesn't um, just, you know, become instanced, which is fine. But then when you turn it to real geometry later, it'll just, you know, be millions and millions and millions of polys. So, um, yeah. So let's say you've you've made your feather. In my case, um, I went through a painstaking process of uh, using as few polys as possible to get the ridges on the feather because it actually did print with that detail on the feather, uh, all the all the feathers of uh, Trico. So it's a uh, pretty a pretty insane level of quality you can get out of the uh, Form Two and Form Threes. Um, so with any SLA printer, a lot of resin printers now are getting pretty pretty incredible stuff. But Form Labs has definitely been the leader um, for desktop SLA. So anyway, once you have your feather designed, you want to turn this into a nano mesh brush. But first, you have to turn it into a uh, insert mesh brush. So first things first, you want to make sure that you have your object pointing toward the camera and away from the the imaginary surface at this point, right? That it would be growing out of or inserting into. So. You face it toward the camera, you come over here, say create insert mesh brush, we say new, and then immediately say we want to create a uh, nano mesh brush. So now there we have that. And you can see here it says zmodeler underscore one, and then you can see the little feather up there. So that indicates that we have that now as our insert mesh brush, our nano mesh brush, excuse me. So now I'm going to come over here and they're just going to do a, a small sample uh, object here for you because to do a large creature would take more time of course uh, and so here we have just a sphere a polysphere that I cut in half and closed holes on all right so we're just going to focus on the uh, red portion of this so uh, also something I found handy is to be able to um, specifically uh, do a checkerboarding of your mesh so that you can have more randomness and diversity to your feathers so that they're not all just going the exact same direction um, but you can actually have a little bit more randomness there that's controlled. So I'll show you what I mean in a second here. So let's say we want to checkerboard this. All right, so we got our Z modeler brush already selected. Hold space bar over your um, poly. And uh, we want to come here to uh, poly group. And then we have checker already selected. I think normally it's on something else like one group ID or whatever. But select checker and then click on excuse me sorry that is actually still the insert mesh brush so here we go z modeler brush hold space bar polygroup checker click and okay undo history no problem here we go and now we have the checker board across the surface and so now we want to switch back to our uh, insert mesh brush hold space bar and now we will come up to insert nano mesh and we want to do, I believe, polygroup all. So then that'll do it only on the green polygroup. As you can see, leaving the yellow untouched, which we could then put a different type of feather or the same feather if you'd like, but just have a little bit more control over different groups of them. So that way you have more diversity and a little bit more natural randomness already being assigned here. Um, but something else you want to do too, once you have this in there, is you want to make sure that your edges are aligned on your uh, mesh, your underlying mesh. And that's a little feature that uh, a friend of mine, Solomon Blair, who used to work for Pixelogic, he and I developed this technique, and he was uh, essential in figuring out some of these steps, uh, which I was just racking my brain over and couldn't figure out. So a huge thanks to uh, Solomon. So you want to click here in your geometry palette, and you want to come down here to where it says Align Edge. And now that makes sure that all the edges of this topology are 
having the same polarity, essentially. They're all facing the same directions. So now the other thing is there's, a, you know, the feathers are a little too stuck in there, right? They're a little too deep. So in order to fix that, you want to come down here to your nano mesh um, palette, and then you want to come over to uh, Z offset and just raise that, increase that a bit until you have just the tip, the shaft of the feather inserting. And that's good enough. It's, it's still a little tight, but that's fine. Uh, so now we have that in the right distribution. And so now let's say we want to have them lay down or we want to have the feathers align themselves to this body in a way that would be more like a bird or a griffin or whatever you'd like that nature would have it um, look more appropriate. So uh, you simply want to come here to rotation and I believe uh, X rotation. Yeah. And you can see how they just very nicely start to fold down on themselves and uh, you know we're getting a, an animal like quality to this. Um, there's also rotation, Z rotation here. So you can see how they're spinning around. Maybe you don't want them to do that. Maybe you want them to be a little bit more straight outward. Um, you can you can mess with the Z rotation here a bit until you're seeing uh, you know a shape that you like. Um, you know, so you want to play with these. You can even do Y if you want a little twist in there, where they kind of rotate around their their own um, pole, so to speak, their own shaft. Um, and so then once you have that, right, you've got your general layout. You can also then do, let's say, another feather. If you have another insert mesh brush you want to use, go into yellow, draw these out again. Once you're happy with that, say we're, we're okay with that, we want to do the same thing again. We want to make sure that they're touching just by the shaft of the feather and not too deep in. There we go. And then we also want to do uh, perhaps some rotation here. And uh, let's see which way do we want them to go. Maybe we want them to lay down like this. And play with the Z rotation again to have them kind of fall into the same general area. Uh, but perhaps you know, make it a little bit more random. So you have that, and then you also have extra variances here. See, so we have some variation for the Z. So now it'll start to like rustle them a little bit. And then we can also even do it on the X and the Y. And then we can switch up here to the previous set and then do the same thing there. So we add some variance. And now you're seeing subtle changes amongst different groups so that they don't all look the same. You don't have a mechanical property so much to that. And then after this, you would even want to go in there and by hand edit and touch certain ones, I believe, too, because you might have some feathers that are interpenetrating each other and uh, stuff that's not really naturally occurring in the real world or that shouldn't usually. And so those are things you might want to fix and touch up. You know, in some areas here, you're getting a little too clustered, probably just because that's how the underlying topology looks. So if I turn off Nanomesh for a second, this area, stuff like this, where you have like, you know, convergence of polys a bit here and that area is a little tight, not ideal. You know, you want to probably have chunks or strips you know, of areas that are just your, um, your quads. And, uh, you know, so then you have more control over how it's distributed. So this isn't the most idyllic, perfect example, but it is showing you the process of, of how to get this done. And, uh, from here, let's say we're, we're happy with all this. Let's say we've got it where we want it, even though obviously there's stuff here that I would, I would go back and change, of course, but, um, for the sake of example, uh, once you say you're happy with your alignment of your objects you want to come here and uh, say one to mesh and in your inventory in the sub palette of uh, nano mesh all right so that made that actual geo now so now it's not an instance anymore it's actually geometry and then we want to do the same thing for the next one as well one to mesh boom now you have all your feathers that are actual geometry intersecting the underlying tissue or you know the uh, surface and so let's say now we want to uh, make sure that these pieces can be printed though because um, right now they're still all intersecting each other but they are not boolean together right so the next and i guess the little last step here um is to boolean them together but they're all still the same object right now so that's where you use the the wonderful helpfulness of polygroups
So let me make sure I don't select the wrong stuff. I'm selecting the uh, shafts here. All right, so there we go. All right, so oh, we gotta get that bottom part too. So invert selection, turn on wireframe so I can see that. Okay, so now we've got our feathers and we can split hidden and that'll separate the half sphere from our feathers. And I will do for the sake of just ease, I'll group all our feathers as one poly group. So now we have two separate sub tools and we want to Boolean them together. We turn on live Boolean. We come down here and we go to Boolean, make Boolean mesh. Let that process for a moment. It will then fuse the interpenetrating uh, shafts of the feathers to the underlying surface and we'll have a new printable mesh, which is basically then the rudimentary example of how I was able to create Trico um, just with a far longer attention to detail and time uh, spent on it. Um, it was definitely worked on on and off over the course of um, a year and a half, two years um, while I was working full time at different studios. So uh, yeah, it was a lot of work <laughs> to put it to uh, lightly uh okay and that is done now and there we are voila so now where normally if i go back to the previous one for a second if we were to go here you can see obviously they're intersecting here if i select just this area we turn on double you'll see right where the feather intersects the surface of the skin or underlying sphere you have a beautiful, clean boolean where it's creating just enough points to connect everything watertight to the surface. And now you could print this. Obviously, this is not the most beautiful, perfect example, but it gets the point across. So I hope this was uh, helpful for you guys, and hopefully you can start feathering some birds, dinosaurs, I guess birds are dinosaurs um, or any other creature, you know, you have in your uh, imagination. So, yeah, this was my tip. Uh, I hope it helps you guys out and uh, happy as you rushing. Take care. Oh, right. <laughs> are you unmuted this time? You, yeah. you did it right. Listen, it's going to happen again. You know, I'm going to uh, not unmute myself one of these times. Uh, again, mm -hmm, again, mm -hmm, again. Mm -hmm, All right, you're mm -hmm. going first. You're going first. Yeah, I got, I got a few things. Yeah, you go first, and then I'm going <clears> to. <throat> All right, so a few things just to kind of recap on the Nanomesh stuff that uh, Daniel was showing. So Nanomesh is another one of my the features that I greatly enjoy inside of ZBrush. When it was being developed, I made tons of stuff with Nanomesh. Uh, so one thing I want to show you guys is that you can use it for surfacing, which is what I find really cool. And then you, you can also do that same principle where you know Daniel showed it. We can use it with live booleans and then convert it all to a mesh. So as an example, I've got this really, really, really rudimentary um, kind of structure for a building here. Like none of the stuff here is anything complex. Like this is basically two planes that have thickness on them with another two planes that have thickness on it going inside each other. That's it. That's it we got for the roof. If I come down here to say one of these structures here, you can see it's just all intersecting geometry. These are just cubes that I just extruded out and then just intersected and went through the model. So nothing complex. Now, if I take this, um, I've gone through and I've made all these little, little parts here. And so one thing that's really cool about NanoMesh is that you're taking a poly on a model and you're replacing it with another object. So it's basically taking whatever that poly has and putting the other object on top of it. So I have all these different little pieces of geometry that I've modeled you know, very quickly for this. So if I can come through all this, you can see I have even some weird ones that look like this. And basically, these are all designed to be used with NanoMesh. So I'm going to be able to take this and replace those polys with this object. And if you replace that poly with enough of these objects, you're going to get this surface detailing on top of it. So kind of like how Daniel had with the feathers, you can actually see the feathers. You can take it even further, right? So let's go back to my NanoMesh house here. Let's go to that roof. Now, this one, I have a few polygroups set up. And so on each of these different polygroups, I'm able to put 
an instance, a different instance of NanoMesh. You can also put multiple instances of NanoMesh, NanoMesh on the same polygroup, but I've got this split up so that the NanoMeshes will go in different directions. So I have different polygroups for the direction flow I want for the NanoMesh. Now, if I come down here and activate NanoMesh, you can see this is what I've got going here, right? So I've just had, this is what I have just for geometry. And then I took this little part here. This was my little roof thatch here. And this was just made quickly with fiber mesh. And then add those together with nano mesh. And boom, bam. I've got a thatch roof, right? And Maybe now at this stage, bam, bam. Well, you're, you're there to make the sound effects for me. Yeah. Paul. And so this process here, like I now can change the sliders on this to determine how much of this I want to come through. So I have this random distribution here that this one's using. Um, and you see all the different indexes. So I can cycle through these. And you can see which ones are making up what. And if I do um, turn off uh, hide, turn on hide others, you can see which ones I can cycle through. So you can see all the different indexes that are being made here. And this is mostly just done in different indexes for the way I wanted these things to align. And then I can change the distribution on this. And this is all through sliders, right? So there's nothing you know, magically here. I'm not hand sculpting any of this. I just made a part, made a base part, I've applied a nano mesh to those polys, and now I'm getting magic, right? So really cool stuff. Now, one thing that Daniel did with his uh, feathers was that he went through and he created you know, instances of each of these. So he came down here to this inventory and did one to mesh, and that will convert the index you have to geometry. And then he went to the next one, one to mesh, converted geometry. So there's two things you can add to this. I saw one of them was already getting uh, through the chat here. Um, well, if you want to do an easy way to split this, you can come through and mask everything first. And then when you do that one to mesh, that part's going to remain masked, and the nano meshes will come out unmasked. And then you can split them that way. The other thing that I like to do is instead of doing one to mesh, one to mesh, one to mesh, kind of like straps on straps on straps, is if you come up here and do convert BPR to geo, this will take what the BPR pass would see and then turn it to geometry. So this can also be done with surface noise. So if you render surface noise, you render fibers, all that stuff does different things when it's rendered in BPR. So when you click this button here, you may have it in preview and then you render in BPR, you get a different result. If you click this button, it's gonna give you that geometry that that BPR render was generating. So if I click BPR to geo now on this object, this is going to take that and it's going to generate the mesh. And now I don't have to go through and do that one to mesh multiple times. So I just one button solution to get all those nano mesh indexes into one piece of geometry. And then now at this stage, if my object was masked, I could come through and isolate those. Um, I can also come through and one thing when you're using control and shift to isolate parts out, like I don't want the under roof maybe for this thatch anymore, is you wanna make sure that when you're isolating pieces, you are clicking on vertices. That's what allows you to isolate. So when you click, if you click on a poly holding control and shift, you're probably not gonna see much of anything happen. So most of the time, if you're having trouble isolating parts, make sure you're clicking on a vertice and when you click on that vertice, that part will then be isolated. Another thing, after you've isolated part of a model that's a jam trail, so it's a part that's not intersecting another model. So this one, I had those multiple polygroups set up on each of those edges. And so what I'm doing initially is isolating the polygroup. But now that I have one part of this, I know the rest of the model was solid, so I can hit Control Shift A, and this will go through and isolate that jam trail. So I don't have to go through and, you know, select each individual polygroup for this model. I can select one of them. Since I know that polygroup was associated with the geometry island, I can then hit Control Shift A after I have that visibility, and then I can bring everything back. And then once that is back, we can go now to the subtool palette over here. We can do the split hidden option. And now we have our thatching as its own separate subtool. Let me turn off my polyframes here. And then I also have my initial roof as well. And so you can get pretty crazy with this. So if I go to say some of these other parts here and turn this on with their nano meshes, you can see inside you know, bricks. So I have a brick object and I can sign it to multiple parts. So you can see I have these with this kind of brick structure. And then if I go to my wooden part here, you can see I've taken this one simple shape and now generated this wood effect. So what I did was I took this part that looked somewhere like this this is the, all the geometry here. And this was all done with the Z modeler brush really quickly. And then if I come through here and I've taken that and I've applied that as a nano mesh to those wooden beams. And so you can see now it's giving me that wood effect. So I'm taking geometry and I'm surfacing with geometry using nano mesh. So it's another cool way to get different things and effects on your models. You can see I also have an index that's basically 
just these nails. So I added a nail object as an index, and then I can randomly place those all over the place. And so now I get that nice little nailed effect added too. And so you see that's index one, and then you see the different indexes I used to get that wood pattern. And then once again, since it's a nano mesh, you can change the distribution of it, and you can see how it's just that one shape that I created. And as it's getting this random distribution, it's filling in all those gaps, and now it's giving me that wood texture on my model. So there you go, Paul. I'll give you some time now. Oh, thanks. I got a really good one. I got a really, really, it's a sphere. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's a sphere. Okay, and just because, just for you, Dress, red wax, red rock, red wax, red rock. Okay, so someone brought up micro uh, micropoly. You wouldn't do what he just did with micropoly because micropoly is not going to allow to do the differences that he did in nano mesh. He was able to have various all over the place. Micropoly is going to be is going to be restricted to the polygon. He nano mesh doesn't have to have that restriction if you don't want it. So that's that's the one difference between that two, right? So here's something else. So you know uh, Daniel did an awesome job with the feathers and using nano. There are again so many ways to do stuff as an artist. There's so many ways to do things in ZBrush. So I want to show you guys another way to do maybe something like feathers or leaves or hair or even what dress was doing right now. Other ways to do this, okay? So I'm going to use fiber mesh, all right? <laughs> you know I love it. Okay, so here we go. We're going to go to fiber mesh right here, all right? And right now I just got this sphere, and then I'm going to say preview. Oh, they're beautiful. This this gorgeous. So what I've done here is I've dropped the max count, and I'm going to turn on my trusty assistant, Mr. Magnifier. Okay, so max fiber number just controls how many fibers. Let's let's make it a lower number. That's fine. So you guys will be able to visually get a cue here. I've changed my length as well, so they're not little. It's not little spuds of fibers, and I've changed my coverage as well. Right, so you can see this is just changing the coverage. What I've also done is is in the profile, I've changed my profile, and you can see you can actually even just use this profile to start making a feather, really, honestly. You could mess around with this and start doing whatever you want. So I gotta switch to this so I can see the whole thing, right? So you can see just using this alone, you can start doing something. But this, this, this is not the trick I wanna show, not even close. Okay, but I want you guys to understand that there's power here in this fiber mesh and there's other things to do with this. And I'm gonna show an oldie, but goodie. We're going back to the 1990s with this one, oldie but goodie. <laughs> okay, so all I'm doing here is changing my length, right? Changing my coverage. I'm controlling my coverage by the graph. So how wide that's going to get, tapering in, tapering out at the beginning, at the end. And I'm playing with my max number. That's it, okay? The other thing that I did was I went down here to my segment slider. So this is telling ZBrush, I want 12 polygons on every single fiber mesh. That's what I want, okay? I want every single one there, okay? So what I'm gonna do is do this, then I'm gonna say, let's accept it. I accept you into my tool, mm -hmm. okay? A little note to Spicer if you're watching there, a little game reminds me of you. So then you can see I've got now a fibers 35 sub tool. Okay, this is actually tagged as a fiber mesh. This is very important. Now I've got my sphere. Let's say it's the bird or whatever I'm making skin, right? So now watch this. I'm gonna tell ZBrush, you know, this is pretty cool. The thing you guys gotta understand now, there's grooming brushes, right? So these grooming brushes were made specifically for fiber mesh, right? So you have the ability to grab a brush. Now that this is real topology that you can play with and manipulate, you guys can, like, I'm a big fan of the hair toss one. You can start moving these around. See, be, 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 party, party, right? So you can just start manipulating these and moving them around. Here's the cool part. Don't make me do it. I'm gonna have to plug ears if you don't wanna hear. Look up here, look at me. Lisa needs braces, Lisa needs braces, Lisa needs braces, Lisa needs braces. Okay, here you go. This is all you gotta do now, watch this. I'm gonna go to the geometry. Okay, I'm gonna come down here to my modified topology. I don't know if, if I don't know if I need to keep clicking on the my uh, magnifier dress. Is it too small, or do I need to always click on the magnifier here? Let's see. Uh, yeah, it's, it's back and forth. You're fine. Okay. You do you do you. Yep. Thanks, Dross. Okay, so now I'm gonna come down here. And I'm gonna click on old school micro mesh. Why? Because watch this. I'm gonna click on this. 
there's my tool palette popping up. I have personally already made a, a feather. That's a sculpted feather. So mind you, I can have poly paint, I can have sculpture, I can have poly groups. I'm gonna click on it and then it's gonna tell you, hey, you need to go turn something on in the render palette. And what we call this is draw, draw the micro poly. So I'm gonna go in the render palette and right here you can see draw micro mesh, right? You guys see that? And when you click, look what's happening. Everyone see it here, I'll magnify that. See that? You're getting some dots. Sort of like an outline of something that looks like a feather because darn it, it is a feather, right? Look how simple rudimentary my feather is. It's not anything fantastic right now, but it, it's a feather-ish look. look. Obviously I can make this look way better, but guys, we've got more videos to get to. So now this, right, you guys see this? <laughs> Oh, 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 please wait. Just click it. it. Just click it. Come on. Wait yep. for it. Wait for it. Bam. Feathers. And what are we dealing with? We're dealing with actually fiber mesh that's low polygon stuff, right? So actually, the feathers is not what I'm playing with right now. It is the actual fiber mesh. And I know this got asked yesterday. People, <laughs> turning my head around for this one. It's a cake, people. We're artists. We layer our stuff. You know, when I'm drawing, <laughs> I don't just sit there with about BH, right? I don't sit there, just use B12. I'm using a whole bunch of different pencils. Let's do the same thing in ZBrush. Okay, let's throw some dynamics on this, right? Let's recalculate that. Guess what? This is geometry. So to someone's question that I was asking, can you use fiber mesh and dynamics? <laughs> Of course you can. What kind of question? Of course you can, right? And then now look, I'm just gonna grab this. Oh, death bless him. I'm gonna just keep pulling it. Look, to show you guys, see how it's colliding, right? And then now when I render, which I'm hitting Shift R, which is our BPR, you're gonna have a, a very sad looking bird that's lost all his or her feathers. Yeah, and the, the key thing to remember here is that, so the micro mesh, when it's applied to a fiber, it's going to go across the whole fiber. So if you take that feather, it's going across all those divisions that Paul made. And so this now the entire strip of fiber mesh contains that feather. So unlike nano mesh, where it's only going to do the single poly or uh, micro poly, where it's only doing single poly, mm -hmm. the fiber mesh with micro mesh is going to go across the entire fiber. And then now you just hit Joseph's magical button, convert BPR to geo, and all those all those feathers now will become the real geometry when I click this. So instead of it now being fire mesh, you can see it's actually the feathers again now. And this is 2.3 million because my feathers weren't very complicated, right? So that, guys, is a, an oldie but really goodie for things that I will use all the time, right? So we still got more videos. We're gonna start moving on to the next video. We got Steve Lord next. He's doing some anatomy stuff. People, if you wanna see someone sculpting anatomy stuff, this is the guy. So let's get going to Steve Lord's video next. Hello, my name is Steve Lord, and today I'm gonna to go over my uh, sculpting process in ZBrush here, and hopefully you guys be able to take something from it. So let's just get going here. I start out with the Z-Sphere. I don't do this every time for sculptures, because if I'm doing something for work, I'll have maybe something already built out, but uh, a lot of times I will start from a Z-Sphere. So, and I'll just start creating a character with it. <clears throat> And I don't usually sculpt in a T pose. I go right into my pose that I want. So you can see I'm blocking it out here, this pose. So that's basically the general idea I was shooting for. Then I will make it into a, a mesh to work on. And I will do Control-W, turn into one. 
one poly group and then I'll start uh, <clears throat> just diving in here change my modifiers and change my roll distance turn my lazy mouse off okay I like using clay tubes a lot at a low setting you can really build up a lot of nice clean forms right now I'm not worrying about being pretty I just want to build out the the basic silhouette of this piece and then you I like to start with a rib cage figure out the position into that then I like to think about the the pelvis how that's gonna lay out in the arm positions and for quite a large portion of my sculpting process my piece looks uh, quite quite rough pretty ugly it's just not till the very end where everything starts to come together for me some people um, their pieces look really good early on and I, I envy them I, I wish I could do that but my pieces are very very sloppy because I'm I'm doing a lot of calculating in my head at this point I'm looking at the overall silhouette thinking about how the rib cage lays out then at some point around this time I'll take my standard brush um, you can use any of these alphas just pick alpha 47 for now change my turn off my lazy mouse bring up my roll distance again and now I like to scribe in my center lines, get things mapped out. And this, this really helps keep you on track I would always go back to taking these measurements and go back to forward make sure your spine is meshing with your um, your sternum here and it's the same angle a lot of times people sculpt and they won't think of that and the spine and the scapula be or um, the sternum will be all askew from each other same thing with your pelvis Make sure that everything's lined up properly. Then I'll go to my next step. As you can see here, I start building it out more. Let's go to this one. So making a little more progress you can see I have my center lines starting to get things blocked out and you can see I'm focusing on the torso mostly not worry too much about the legs right now because this this area is the main area where things are gonna look right or wrong torso is really important to nail first I think I mean you can do the whole piece obviously but this is how I did this one and then start blocking in a little more building out the legs still minding my my center line you can see here it's starting to skew a little bit you got to be careful you can always Take your lasso and see 
where you're at. Make sure everything's lined up. Yeah, and I cut this in pieces so I can take the arms off as well. So I can see this portion. Then I go to the next step, more refining of the forms. And I can start thinking about how I'm gonna block in the musculature now that I have my, my basic rib cage and hips kind of figured out. Still have my center line here. Still not focusing too much on the legs on, at this one. I knew the main focus of this guy was going to be the torso and the arms, so that's why I uh, spent a lot more time on these areas. Then I'm just using my clay tubes again. You can just you can get a lot done with clay tubes going back and forth, go negative. Then I can use my standard again, and then I'll go with standard alpha. And you can always do custom stuff that suits you, obviously, but I do a lot of off-the-shelf brushes. Then my next step is starting to refine the actual muscle groups here. I'm blocking in. It's almost like an anatomy lesson at this point. I'm, um, let's do my uh, damn standard. That's another good one to use. Bring my roll distance up. Now I can start scribing in the actual muscle groups, how they're, how they're gonna lay out. Then I'll go back in. Start refining a little bit till I till I like what I see. There's a lot of back and forth at this stage. I'll probably re-sculpt this probably around 10 different times, like going back and forth, back and forth, till I, I like the result. It's not very efficient, but that's, that's just how I do it. Because, uh, like I said, I'm always calculating, I'm always trying to measure and feel out like in my head I'm visualizing basically uh, like I said an anatomy lesson in my head it's like okay the tricep this tricep goes here this one from this view will be showing a little will pop out the back side here will show this And then you'll have a flat area here where your tendons pressing on the on the muscle and the fascia. And let's see, it's a little more refining. I'm starting to do some uh, 
some handwork here. Blocking this in. Going back to my center line here, you can see this. Now I smooth out my forms, see how they look. Going back in again. Now that I have my forms kind of flushed out how I really like them. More modification. Now at this point, I'll start putting in bringing it kind of come to life here, bring in some um, veins and I use, I do veins with uh, inflate, bring this down, bring this up. That's just pretty much how I do it. Then, you know, you want to put some texture on. Pretty simple. You can use a lot of off-the-shelf stuff here, or you can make your own. Then a little more refining of the muscle groups. And then you have this result. This is about as far as I got with it. So I hope that helps you guys kind of give an overview of uh, how I do things. And uh, take care. So much anatomy, so much anatomy. There's so much. I look at that and I'm just like, I know nothing. You're muted. Somehow you're muted. <laughs> Are you fake muting? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. That's me? People are saying that was me? All right. I like it. I'll take it. I wish I was that muscular, okay? But I've got good old belly down here, right? All right, so I want to show something that's old school. Okay, that is wrapped around a little bit like what Steve was doing, right? This is another person that's like a traditional artist background history, okay? Just like some of the artists we've had at the summit this year. So I, I like to think, think of Z-Spheres as an old uh, feature, but still widely used, very powerful feature. Think about it more as like armature wire right now. That's how I want you guys to think about this, okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use Z-Sketch. Okay, so this is really something that hasn't been used as much anymore because when Dynamesh came along and other things came along, people stopped using this. However, the things you guys got to remember is I can like literally, it might help if I put myself in drama, start putting in essence like the muscular forms and building up form here, right? Where I would want to start laying parts of the body down, right? And then start just laying down some form and then they can sit over top and I can keep building up more sketching form, right? It really, I know when we came out, there was an artist that took the time and made like a full anatomy piece with these. And it looked really awesome. It looked like a bunch of muscles, right? That are coming down the body. Now, all you're doing, you just slowly, and then obviously if you're lighter, you have smaller sketching. If you're stronger, so you'll get big muscling groups, right? So you can work this way, right? And you can see, you can start really bulking something up, blah, 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 blah. okay? And now, what I can do as a user is now that I've started putting some of these sketches in here and using this, the next thing I can do is tell ZBrush to give me the topology. Right? I just got a hair in my mouth, <laughs> okay? So you hit the A key, not E-H like me, Canadian, but the letter A, right? That's all you gotta do is hit the letter A 
And what we're doing is right now I'm in Z sketch mode. So you can see that edit sketch mode has been turned on. So I've sh hit shift A to put myself in sketch mode. And then when I hit A, we're giving you a preview of what the unified skin would look like. That's, it's not adaptive skin, it's using a unified, unified. Mm -hmm. right? So there's resolutions controls here, right? And so I can keep adding more resolution and you can see you can get more and more details. So again, this is different. It's not using adaptive skin, it's using unified skin. Now, if I wanna use, okay, the adaptive skin, there is a way to do this. Okay, so what I'm actually doing is I'm gonna come out of edit sketch, right? So now obviously my amazing anatomy that I just did, nothing anywhere as close or as good as Steve, but you've got the idea where we're going here. Okay, I'm gonna now turn on bind and then voila, my muscling starts coming back. You know what's important about this? It is binded. So I, as an artist, can actually switch to something like rotate. So now I've switched to rotate up here by hitting the shortcut R. I'm gonna come out of symmetry mode now and I can actually rotate the model and look what's also moving with it. The Z sketch, right? Look at that. Oh, I broke his arm, <laughs> broke his arm. Take right? it easy, Jeez. Yeah, take it easy. And now I can go back into this so people like Steve Lord, an artist like him, right, would want to be able to do this because he would work more asymmetrical. And then I can still build in this form even after I've moved it. And then I still have the ability, right, go to the mesh. And I have the ability to actually bind it, right, and then go through. What well, the other thing that I can do now, when I'm looking at this mode, when I hit A, look what I get. Now I get the adaptive skin. This is the difference, right? So now I have completely different topology. I get the whole Z sphere cage with the Z sketching now happening on it. And now I'm getting some like buildup on an actual Z sphere rig. So instead of also just going Z spheres and then turning it into the mesh, you guys could go to Z spheres, turn on this Z sketch start sketching on this and start building some volume for you, okay? And then there you go. You can start, so you can either do a unified skin. Again, if I'm if I'm not in bind mode, I'm in edit sketch mode where you literally can see the sketching, like you can see this sketching right here. Oh, that's real big, okay? You can see that. Let's go a little bit smaller. There you go, okay? This will give you a unified skin. What's the only thing you get is the actual Z sketching part. If you go and turn off and turn on your bind, right, which now you're going to be able to rotate, and you can see even after the fact, I'm drawing more and more, I can move it. And when I'm looking at it this way, I hit the A key, I now get an adaptive skin, right? And so that's what you're going to start to get in there, right? It's stuff like that, okay? So this is a great way to start playing with this and messing around with this, okay? So this, I think, is a little old hidden feature that I just, you know, especially an artist like a, like someone like a, a Steve Lord, which some of you are, this might be a great way to give you an in to go from your used to doing traditional. And now this is the way I would say, if I was sending an additional artist, this would be one of the first things I probably, in the middle of talking to them, show them. Because it might have a light bulb go off, right? Okay, there you go. So there you go, using mine is just wonderful. <laughs> masterpiece masterpiece. chef's kiss <laughs> right masterpiece all right so russ you don't have anything right so we're gonna Not move this on one good video. yep we're gonna move on to the next video which is gonna be nelson ty let's go on and just check a look at what he's got for us hey guys i'm nelson ty i've been using zbrush since uh 2014-15 uh it's still one of my main tools for doing 3d concept designs and uh, today I'll be showing you just some uh, how I would approach to make something like this uh, a handguard. Mainly it will be Boolean techniques on how to create these shapes. So, oh, and uh, also I'll be using my custom UI setup. You can always grab that on my uh, website or ArtStation. It's free. So, but I'll try to explain what I'm pressing and where the buttons are as I go along. So let's start with a cube. Uh, first thing, just uh, pull it back, make it a bit longer. 
So one of my hotkeys is uh, Control One, which makes it into uh, 1K resolution DynaMesh, which I think I'll just increase it a bit to Control Two, which is 2K. It's a bit more to work with. So turn on symmetry. X Y would be what I'll be using. Just make some cuts to kind of get the main shape. Well, so I'm using clip curve to kind of make these cuts and rounded edges. So just gonna go with something simple. Maybe just something like, actually, let's go something simple like that. Uh, mask outside so that it dynamesh again to clean up the kind of ge geometry. So now we'll start making the, how to make the Boolean shapes to make those key cuts. So I would use mask lasso. So. You just kind of draw and explore the shapes that you want to, you would want. Hmm. Let's make something like that. So it's just a lot of masking, unmasking to cut this mask into something that you would want. It doesn't have to be super clean, we still have a chance to clean it up when we extract this. Okay, let's try something like that. So I would bring up my custom menu, Control shift a to extract. If you don't press it here, I th it would be in your subtool palette under extract. So I would extract this in a... so that's very thin. You don't need to make it thick or else it distorts the shape. So extract, accept it, it'll create a new subtool. The area you want is mass, so usually I press uh, Control W to polygroup. Click uh, Control Shift, click on it to remove the stuff you don't want. Delete it in, auto group it, because all we need is just one side. So delete the rest. So you see how the edges are really jagged. We can clean that up with polish by features. This is also just down in deformation. There's a bunch of polish features here. So it looks okay. And also one important thing when doing Boolean, it's also usually useful to, for it to be flat. So turn off symmetry, flatten it. Just drag it towards the middle so that's now all flat cool turn symmetry back on we don't need X just uh, the Y and press uh, Z remesher let's see how, what that gives us it's still a bit too dense so usually I just go down by half click it again it's still too dense one more time mm, one more time should be okay yeah, something like that. Okay, so you see how some edges are still a bit wobbly. We can clean that up when we give it a bit of uh, thickness with panel loops. So just uh, polish zero, bevel zero, just one edge loop so that doesn't distort the shape. Click it, see, it'll give you a bit of thickness. So now you can use click curve oh, also increase polygroups so that it creases the edges and when you turn on dynamic subdiv it's a bit more clean now you use clip curve to kind of clean up these edges so that it's not wobbly for concept it's not super important to be clean super clean but if you've got the time it's always nice here. Okay, so now after cleaning it up, 
you can just isolate this face again delete the rest same Z remesh so that it gives it cleans up the topology a little bit repeat the step again panel loops increase PG increase uh, poly groups now mask and uh, mask this invert pull the rest to the so that it can punch a hole through the middle. So I also have another hotkey is Alt X, which centers the the mesh to zero here on X. Also, so set this to subtractive. Turn on live booleans, and you can see how it looks. So punching a hole straight through might not be the most interesting. Usually, it's nice with a bit of take our bevel for me. So how, how I would do that is uh, slice curves, something like that. Slice curve. Let's see. Okay. Slice curve. Make this whole section one polygroup. Go to your Z modeler. Let's see. Uh, Q mesh, polygroup all. Basically, we want to kind of extrude this whole section out so that there's like a step. Now, with that step, we can use maybe uh, edge slide. So just slide it back a bit. I think a bit more would work better. Let's try and make this a bit bigger. Okay, so to make it on the other side, use a mirror and weld. I'll put it back into zero x position. Turn on dynamic div. Increase. So you see how now it gives a bit of the kind of bevel taper. I think it would look better. Just just imagine how the light would catch on. It will look nice with that kind of rim. So now to make the pattern to the back, I usually use the gizmo hold control. Just pull it back to the position you want. Let go of control and drag back to duplicate this kind of pattern. If it looks good, then now try to figure out how to punch the hole through the middle. So how I would do that, polygroup it would be the fastest way, but I can also show you another way. So you duplicate this mesh, then you go down, um, then you use polygroups. Uh, hit group binomials. You can play around with the max angle. It really depends how your your shape is. So now, depending on the normal, it would give you polygroups, and all you want is this uh, end. So same thing. Delete hidden. Now we hit Z remesh. We now bring this polycamp down. Uh, we can also use polish a bit just to clean up those edges. It will be easier for Z remesh to work. So just press this, keep going down in half. Mm. Oh, that should be enough. So now I would use Z modeler, polygroup, part of the loop. I want to trim off the end by this much. Just control shift, click the middle, take out to isolate the rest. Delete hidden, this is all we need. Same thing again. I'll set all these down. Panel loops just to give it a bit of thickness. Increase polygroups. Mask, invert, pull it back just so that it can punch through the entire mesh. Increase PG. Back your sub tool, make sure it's subtractive, and you can now see the result.
just like that. So if you're happy, now you're ready to make your Boolean mesh. And this button is right here at Subtool, Boolean, make Boolean. But for this, make sure you turn this on so that it recognizes the colors are using dynamic subdiv. Then you press this. I'll work it out. And you would get the new subtool here. So you can insert that into your current tool. You can turn off the rest, you don't need. So the best thing about uh, doing this kind of Boolean cut is everything is polygroup. You can make use of these polygroups, but for this kind of quick demo, I won't. If you're happy, uh, just dynamesh this whole thing. I would just fill it with the one color. Or I have a, also a hotkey for fill object, which is Alt F. So it looks good. So usually my last step with a lot of the hard surface stuff is if I'm happy, I would want to bring the poly count down because there's no reason to keep it at this uh, 2 mil. That's just as you go on, it really uh, it really clutters or brings down your performance and increase your file size. So the best is to use decimate the decimate plugin, which I have a hotkey is Control Shift A, and do the to uh, press decimate current. I mean pre-process current. ZBrush will take some time to analyze this. Oh, also, I should mention, sometimes there may be issues where Decimate uh, is stuck. It just can't figure out the mesh and calculate. And usually, 90% of the time of fixing this to make Decimate work is these two buttons, Check Mesh Integrity and Fix Mesh, which is down uh, here in Geometry. Basically, click Check Mesh. You will, it will find some faces that have problems with your mesh. Then you click Fix Mesh. It, it just fixes it somehow. I have no idea how it works. But usually pressing these two before Decimate would just speed up or make Decimate work for sure. OK, cool. It's done. Control Shift A again and press Decimate. Now it brings it down to 400,000 polys. See? For hard surface, you can really go down a bit more. So for me, I usually do it again, pre process. It'll be faster because it's lighter already. In my experience, usually hard surface stuff, you can repeat this process twice and still not lose a lot of details. So. Yeah, now it's now down to 90,000, which it's pretty good for in terms of ZBrush. So yeah, that's how I usually have it at the end before shifting this over to Keyshot for just rendering. So yeah, that's it. I hope you guys find this useful, and uh, I'll hopefully see you guys again soon. We're back. Back at it. We're back at <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, so cool stuff from Nelson. Definitely, uh, he's got some awesome uh, hard surface models and stuff he does. Definitely check him out. Uh, he does some really cool conceptual design stuff. And uh, he, it was a pleasure talking to him in for a ZBrush Masters, too. If you want to see more of his workflows and process, um, definitely do a search for that on our YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. 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 You're gonna you're gonna show I, I lied. I got one thing, but you go first. Yeah, you, you have you have one that you were talking about before. I'm not gonna do that, so you can do that. Ah, okay. Okay, well, but I am gonna go first. So okay. you're going first. I'm going first. Ooh, look at that per <laughs> all right. So as Nelson was showing, um some of the stuff he was doing involves the Boolean, and the live Boolean is awesome for this kind of stuff, like super awesome. And so here we have just you know a garbage pile of, uh, of different primitives are just intersecting each other. And as soon as I turn on live Boolean, now I've got this kind of weird sniper rifle uh, generated. 
So the process of this is, you know, just you're taking parts and you're just using them as subtractive or positive elements and you keep adding and adding and adding. And so you see this one is a crazy, uh, here we got 81 different subtools uh, through here. And so you see all these little parts that I have is what's generating this final result. And then after you press that Boolean button, you can set these up to be broken out into different parts. You end up with your final model and these are all, you know, broken down into these little pieces. So it's really, really nice workflow and process. And so I'm going to show uh, when Nelson was doing his, he was coming through and he was, you know, masking and generating some uh, areas and stuff. So I just want to show another workflow you can use um, that I find handy for doing these kind of uh, designs. And this design was all done uh, with the process I'm about to show. So just an example, I'm just going to take a starter shape and you just need just a piece of geometry. So I'm just going to isolate this one. I've got a few of these. These are just done, you know, with the Z Mahler brush just for the shape. So I'm going to isolate a few of these out. Oops, wrong button there. Let me let me get to the right keyboard. There we go. And then I'm just going to split this out to its own part. And then I'm just going to clone it so it's isolated by itself. And so now I just have a new tool that just contains this little bit here. And just for the giggles, we'll, uh, we'll unify that back to the center of the world. So now I got this part. So Nelson was going through and he was making this like high-tech rail, right, for some sort of weapon or his, he was working. And so I just want to show a few things for this. So let's just say this is our starting shape. We're just starting with a piece of geometry that's been done easily with Z Modeler. We've got a little taper dead at the top, and then it's just extruded to a length. So the first things that we want to go through is we want to make it hollow, right? We want a thin piece of metal that's going all the way through. And then we want to add some intricate designs to the side of that rail. So air vents for where the barrel would be cooling. So things like that. So I'm going to take my shape first. And I know I already like this shape here. And basically what I want to do is I want to cut in that center part. So to do this, I'm going to use a process inside of Spotlight. And this is called Snapshot 3D. And Snapshot is going to allow me to take alphas so basically black and white images, and I can take these and then use these as pieces to carve and cut into my models. So it's a very fast process. Now, since I already have this shape right here that I like, and I just wanna cut the inside out, um, I wanna copy this and turn this into an alpha really quick. And to do this, I go to the alpha palette over here, and over here we have a firm brush option. So if you have any mesh that's on your screen, the subtool that's selected, when you click from, from mesh, it's gonna pop up this little window, and you're going to be able to see that part in this little window. So I can now grab an alpha from this. So if I wanted to make an alpha that looked like this, right, I can just reposition it and grab that alpha and make it look like this. So I want to cut that hole out basically at the same kind of size and proportions I already had. So I'm going to frame it like this. I'm going to click on this frame option, which is going to make it big. Down here at the bottom, I can set the resolution of this. So if I wanted it to be, you know, 512 or larger, you know, I can change that size. And after I'm happy with this, if I hit OK, it's going to throw it right into that alpha palette. So it's just made an alpha from that mesh. And you can do this with anything. So if you have an object and you just want to quickly make an alpha, the one thing nice about doing this versus say like a grab dock where you're grabbing the entire canvas is that you can manipulate the shape after you've clicked that button and it's going to pull up that little window and then you can change it and modify it. So it's, it's really handy for getting alphas like this. Now, after I have this alpha out, I want to put this into spotlight so I can use that spotlight projection button or use that uh, Snapshot 3D. So there's a little Add to Spotlight. So just make sure you have it selected. Click Add to Spotlight. It's going to come in like this. Now that I have this in here, I can now manipulate this with the Spotlight. So I'm going to just take this and just snap it to the center. And I can scale this down a little. Then I can drag this. And you can see it's going to allow me to snap to the center of my mesh too. Now when you do this, you want to make sure you have Perspective off, because definitely Perspective is going to come into play here. And I can hide my Spotlight. Let's make this a little bit bigger here. And I'm just pressing Z and Shift Z to bring it back. And so now I can take this, make sure it's snapped onto my alpha, and then I can snap it to my mesh. Now I can scale this up. And what I'm doing here is I'm just, this is basically a clone of the depth of the mesh I had. So this proportion matches. So now I can manip manipulate this alpha using Christmas in the corner over here, Paul's favorite. And I can extend this up. I can extend this left and right. And I can get it to that dimension where it's sitting inside of my initial shape. Now, after I have this done, if I have live Boolean active, what ZBrush is going to do is if I have the subtool selected, it's going to look at the depth of the subtool I've selected. And then now I come down here, and there's this little snapshot camera button. Now, if you click this normally, it's going to take this alpha I've selected, and it's going to generate a new subtool based on that alpha at the same length of the subtool I have selected. So if I click this here, it would give me a positive shape. 
Now, what I want is I want this to cut it out. So I'm gonna hold down the Alt key and then click this. And now it's gonna generate that shape and it's going to automatically set it as subtractive over here. So it's generated a new subtool from that alpha I created and it's set it as a new subtool. Now you'll see everything vanished here and that's because I had this little solo button on. So if I turn this off, you can see this is the result I have. And if I hide Spotlight now, this is what I got. So it's taken Bam. that part I just had and just cut it through the middle. Now, if I turn Live Boolean's off, you'll be able to see what this did here. So I had my main shape and the Snapshot 3D created this shape, the second subtool right here, and that shape is cutting all the way through. And now if I turn Live Boolean on, since this subtool is set to subtractive, I'm now gonna get that hollowing. And you can change this, you can modify the shape, you can turn it on off. It's a non-destructive workflow at this point with the Live Booleans. So I can actually manipulate this if I don't want it to go you know, in the middle, maybe I want the bottom to hang out, all I have to do is drag it, and it's gonna change that shape on the fly. Now, the other thing that uh, Nelson had in his design was he had these crazy you know, little elements going down the side for cooling, right? So we're gonna go back into Spotlight here, and I just have the same shape. Now, another thing you can do in with this process is you can manipulate the alpha that's in here. I could paint a new one, I could also just change the one I have. So this is just the one that I grabbed originally from that gun. And so now what I can do, let's say I rotate this. So I'm gonna rotate this nine degrees. Let me try that again. Make sure I don't get my sticky fingers all over the place. I can scale this down. I can now extend it so I can manipulate the alpha. And so if I want it wider, I can come over here and use this extend and I can grow it out that way. I can grow it out well, this way and get that size to change. I can also manipulate it with this extend to change how it looks. So right now the extend is gonna happen wherever this crosshair is on the spotlight dial. So wherever I have this crosshair, that extend is gonna go from. So if I take this and move it and hold down shift to snap on an angle, I can set it to here. And now any of the extrude processes are gonna happen from this edge. And so if I do that and now extend, you can see now I'm changing that alpha and getting a different shape. So I can move this down maybe a little bit more, maybe I don't want it all the way. Let me zoom in a little bit here on my model, get back to my little alpha here. So maybe I didn't want it, you know, I want to taper a little bit more and go all the way down to the end a little bit more, then do that extend in that opposite direction there and get that shape. And now I have this object, right? I can take this any number of ways here. I can keep manipulating this. There's also an option that will allow you to get the frame of that alpha too. So if I want even a more ornate shape, I can click this I can start generating a framed version of that. And this is just all manipulating that single alpha I created initially. Now, after I have this, I can now make sure I have a subtool selected that I want to base that depth on. So I probably wanted to base it on the original depth because I want to cut it out of those outsides as well. So I'm gonna make sure I have that subtool selected. I'm gonna hold down that Alt key and click the Snapshot 3D button there, Shift S to hide it. And now you can see I've cut that part out of my model. This is now its own subtool, so I can position it around. I can scale it up and down. I can increase the length of it. And if I turn off live booleans, you can see this is what I'm doing. I'm just adjusting that subtool there. Now, after I have this, I can hold down that control key, duplicate this, then repeat it. I can move this around. I can clear my mask, add another level of this. I may want two levels and come through and drag that out. Now I've got two of those. And now you can see I have this really complex shape that was created very easily. Now, another nice thing about these little parts here is when they're created with Snapshot 3D, you're gonna get this nice polygrouping. So we have this outer polygroup and this inner polygroup. And this is really nice for using with that hidden feature we showed yesterday of the bevel, so the crease bevel. So if I go to geometry, come down here and I go to crease, there's this bevel slider down here. If I hold down control and drag this bevel slider, it's gonna look at the polygroups that are on my model. It's gonna split where those polygroups happen and it's gonna generate geometry in between them and when I do this, it's gonna give me beveling on any areas that kind of have that convex structure to them. So now I've gone through and now I've got this beveled shape. And if I change my Mac app here, you can see that a little better. You can see that's the result I got. So this is what I had before. And then just using that, I've now got that nice beveling happening. And then I can use these as my subtractive parts. And as Nelson was doing, he had that nice kind of taper. So you can taper that part out. And now I can get that little beveled edge going around the sides there. So you can see now it has that nice little bevel like that. And then if I hold down control, I can duplicate that part to get the other side. And so you can use this in just this non-destructive workflow of going back and forth and manipulating your shape. 
So all sorts of cool stuff you can do with the booleans. And then after you're done with those, let's go back to this one here that I've turned into a mesh. This was the Boolean result. So you can see these are all those different parts of that other weapon there. And you can see this was all done with that process. And if I turn on my geometry here, you know, there's my polygroups that I got after those Booleans were created. So nice and clean polygrouping there. I can also turn on my lines here. You can see the topology. So the topology is going to remain the exact same as it was, except where those connection points happened when the Boolean kicks off. So the mesh geometry on all these shapes are going to remain the same. Uh, only at the connection points will that geometry change. And then at this stage, you can DynaMesh this. You can do whatever you want. It is now a solid piece of topology. So there you go, Paul. That was a good one. My turn, my turn, my turn, my turn. All right. So let me just answer the question really quick that's coming through. Someone was asking a lot about the resolution. So resolution is really actually controlled by two things. It's controlled by your alpha, and it's also controlled of how large the alpha is in the actual document. All right. You don't need to go any higher than 512 by 512. Okay. That's really... I wouldn't go bother going any higher than that with the images unless you just want the images to visually, 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 <laughs> visually look better. Okay. So for example, you can see this 512. Here, we'll turn this on and I need to turn off my spotlight radius. Okay. So if you're looking at any of these shapes, let's grab this little guy right here and let's size it up. Okay. So you see the size, what I mean, this, the larger it is in, the more resolution you get. So, so for example, I'm going to click on that little camera. Bam! And I made a mesh now, right? So I turn this off. You guys can see my mesh, right? There it is. You can see this is 116,144 points. If you want to be exact with this, right? So now if I do that same thing, okay? So let's let's turn it back on, right? And let's turn off my magnifier and let's just make it smaller. Little bitty living space. Any living space, okay. And then now you hit snapshot. Now it's created a new sub tool. And if you look, that sub tool is only nine thousand five hundred and eighty-two, even though it's the same image. So it's a combination of both things. It's a combination of your your resolution of your image, which honestly don't go any higher than five twelve by five twelve. Okay. Don't ask me why. Just trust me. Just follow follow the brick road right to Joseph's house. Okay. And then. That is your big thing. Now, the other thing you guys got to be aware of when you're doing this, there are controls, okay? So by default, we're going to be smoothing this off so we can get a clean mesh. But you guys have preferences. I know it's cool, right? Preferences, preferences. <laughs> it's on these braces. Okay, so in here, there's going to be some preferences for you for Spotlight. So right here, these bottom controls right here from snapshot smoothing snapshot retain corners snapshot border triangles and snapshot detect corners those settings are for this feature in spotlight right so the smoothing is how much smoothing do you want to be done on the mesh when you make it okay how much do you want to retain the corners because if you're if you're using something that's a little more sharp besides just me and joseph how sharp we are looking today <laughs> ah, man my jokes are getting worse <laughs> all right so if you look at these, right, this has got sharp corners. So right now, if you make camera smile, right, it's going to get a little bit of a rounded corner right there, right? See that? There's a little bit of roundness happening on the corners, which I actually like because in hard surface, I wouldn't want to have a little bit of that, right? So if you don't want that happening, then that's where you want to come and play with these settings. I personally, Dress, you can jump in on this. I personally prefer snapshot detect corners. And I personally drop the smoothness down to something like 10, 15 ish. And when I click that, then you pretty much start getting what you see is what you get. See that? I don't know about you, Drus. What did you find for yourself for your workflows? I just use the defaults. See that just sharp? Default corner? it up. Default it up. Guys, just default it, Joseph says. Just default <laughs> it. Okay. So, really quick before we move on to the next video, and guess what, people? I know I saw it in the chat. This is gonna go up again. Don't worry. The zeros, it's not yet. It's not yet. Paul keeps adding time. Keep adding time. I love the power. All right, so one, one thing I'm gonna interject in here too. So we had a question about uh, importing in, say, SVGs and stuff from uh, other applications. 
I'm not, I'm not going to show anything, but if you go to the uh, Z plugin tab and you go to the text, 3D, and vector shapes, yeah, you can import in SVGs right here. So if you have files from Illustrator, you can input it right in. Mm -hmm. If you want to use them as alphas, you're going to need to rasterize them. So they're not going to come in as vectors. Uh, but you can definitely, you know, take your image inside of Illustrator, inside of Photoshop, uh, generate it basically as a black and white image. If you want to come in the alpha panel, make sure it has a depth of 16. Um, if you want to come into the texture palette, make sure it has a depth of, our, of 8. And then after that's in, you can then just come up to the alpha tab up here and click add to spotlight. Or if you bring it in as a texture itself, you can click the add to, add to spotlight uh, button right here. And so there, you definitely can get it in from any of those applications. It just depends how. If you want to keep that vector, then you can do it through I can text show, 3D I can and it. vector shapes. I can show it. I have an SVG. I can show it if you want. Back to the sure. back. I'm taking it back. I'm taking them all back. This one right here. This one right here. This was my tip. Okay. So, <laughs> go ahead. Name the movie. Um, do you want to? Do you want to show the uh, the decimation one too? Yes, I'm going to show this. One. This is these are really quick because we got more videos to get to, right? So, like Joseph said, I'm clicking on an SVG, and I've got an SVG of of our logo. Oh boy, look at that, people! So it brings in the SVG. And then after the fact, I can even edit this. I can start adding a little bit of a bevel there. Oh, that's 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 crazy bevel that's happening now. And then you can keep, oh, you know what? I need a little more resolution. You got to get that P looking good, right? Get that P looking good, right? So this is all you do. And I just hit new SVG. You guys are going to see this because it's on my other monitor. Here's another example of another one. And then there, I got a Mauser logo, right? No. And you can cut all these out with a live boolean. Once they're in, you can use live boolean with any piece of geometry. God, Joseph and I are so good together. That's exactly where I'm going. He <laughs> is the master. I'm just along for the ride, people. Here we go. Okay, so me, I already showed my uh, my uh, Rocketeer. So I made his gun as well, which actually is a Mauser. That's why I have the Mauser logo. And like Joseph said, here is a prime example of it being used. I did not sculpt that. Are you kidding me? I'm not wasting my time sculpting that. That's crazy. It literally took me to five seconds to do this part right here. It's got the SVG, imported it, live boolean, done. Same thing on the top of the gun. There's numbers, right? Look at all that. Like, I don't even, I didn't sculpt it. I live boolean, non-destructive. Oh, man. So good. So, good. okay. Because I think you got those numbers out of order. That's a good thing it's non-destructive. Because I think, I think you got 100, 200, 300, 700, I, 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 you no. messed those up. You know they gotta go in order, Paul. You know 700 doesn't come before 300. Where do you see a 700? I'm just kidding, I'm All just right. kidding. I'm right. I'm this is how it is on the actual gun, but, right? <laughs> so I looked at a reference, right? And I built all this inside of ZBrush too. This is all Z Modeler and live billions. That's it, that's all I use to do all of this gun. Okay, so far as decimation, one thing I wanna add to what Nelson was talking about with decimation, when you guys decimate, so here's a model of mine because somebody was asking about, well, what are you going to do? Here's my resulting mesh, right? It's dense. It's 1.5 million polygons. This is a guy that I plan to 3D print, right? So this guy's got to hollow out so I'm not wasting material, okay? Now, the one thing you guys want to be aware of, and I think a lot of people forget this about Decimation Master, there's a lot of things you can do besides just clicking the button. One big thing you guys can do is mask. If you guys mask off any area, the decimation master will use that as that section is really important and try to maintain that more than anywhere else. And in essence, put more of the polygons in that mask area. So if you look at my version here, right, this right here, I want to be able to tell it, hey, I want this and I want to be able to decimate, right? So you can use this. And I thought I did it, but I think I reloaded something. I might have gotten rid of the one that I made. Let me see. I want to move on to the next video. Oh, there it is. That's beautiful. Yeah. So anyways, you would mask off like this, right? And then you would tell ZBrush up in the decimation master. Besides masking, you can use painting. You can keep your UVs and you can freeze your borders. So when you guys click this pre-process current, when you guys click that, you only have to click it once. That's it. As long as you don't close ZBrush, you never have to click that pre-process again. So you can actually decimate, change the numbers, and hit the decimate again. Change the numbers and hit the decimate again. You don't need to keep pre-processing and pre-processing if you don't want to. There's a file being created on your computer, and we are remembering that file. 
When you shut ZBrush down, we delete that file. Okay, if you want to save that file, by all means, you can tell ZBrush not to delete that file when you shut down. Just keep in mind, if you're using decimation a lot, those files are going to be gigs, right? And they're going to start eating up your hard drive without you even knowing it. Okay, and if you take something like what Ty and Joseph are doing, if you're doing something hard surface, it doesn't need to bend, right? So it can be really triangulated, actually. Okay, so that's the one benefit of hard surface and using decimation with it. And that's why Ty went into that talking about this. So now when I decimate, right, it'll decimate and start, you see even how low it is, look all the base and see all the gorilla, like you guys didn't know what it was, but you know, I wanted to make sure you knew what it was, <laughs> right? So if you look, right, the face has got more density. So I can go here and say, you know, give me 30%. I can type in numbers that I want and then it'll go back and pull the file and keep adding. So we can go crazy low so this gets to be a disaster and then there you see look oh yeah guys this is modern art all right those that live in miami i just there you go i just made a sculpture art basil i'm in let's do this make okay fifty thousand done making money okay so let's move on let's move on to our next video i know he was in here are you still here mr steven anderson we're gonna move on to his video we got a couple more videos we're going to come back and you guys are going to see how much time is actually left. All right. You don't know yet how much time is left in our stream. So let's move on to the next video. Hello, my name is Steven Anderson. You might know as me as smartest online on any of the social media platforms. Uh, I'm a live streamer with the ZBrush live uh, stream team. It's kind of fun. It's a really great experience and I love working with these guys. Uh, I want to talk to you today about a quick tip and trick that I developed as part of my uh, my strategy, my sculpting strategy for the ZBrush Live Sculpt Off in 2016. You can see here with this model of the fish bot that I made as part of the beta team on ZBrush 4R8. Uh, one of the cool features that was rolled out with that section of ZBrush was live booleans. And the booleans were really nice because it allowed me to cut pieces out of diff about, out of larger pieces. And I was able to use ZRemesher to get a nice clean mesh. It works really well with open meshes and it was able to respect a lot of those holes really well. Well, I want to go through and show you a couple of those tricks today. In our scene, we have a few pieces that we're going to go ahead and put together in the live booleans process. Now I have, you can see I have several things. I have one large central piece here, uh, this sphere. I have these other sphere bits right here that I'm going to be using to, oh, let me get my right hotkeys here. Uh, these other spheres, so here's my main sphere that I'll be keeping. This sphere, which I'm gonna turn to negative like I've done with the other pieces. So now what's going to happen is that if I come up here to live Boolean, turn that on, you'll see this is what I'm getting. I'm getting this this interesting kind of uh, looking looking piece, and you can do this with all sorts of different, very, very sculpted and, and specific um, controlled pieces as you as you wish to. But I'm going to use just very simple simple geometry here for the sake of the trick. Okay, what I'm going to do, I'm going to come up and I'm going to select in my booleans. Uh, let's actually make sure we have. Um, dynamic mode turned on for all of these. That way we get the smoothest, uh, the smoothest shapes possible. Okay. And I'm going to come up and I'm going to say Boolean with dynamic subdiv. And once that goes through and runs, you'll see it's created this new piece for us. And you can see all the different poly groups from where it is that the different pieces were intersecting. Okay, that's great. I only, I only care, for this particular technique, I only care about this red polygroup. So I'm just going to select that. I'm going to go down to Geometry, Modify Topology, and Delete Hidden. So now I have just this piece right here. What I want to do is I want to come into my Z Remesher. And by default, these are your settings, okay? Very simple little, uh, little settings here. I'm going to turn off Adapt. That's one of the things I almost always do. Uh, Adapt will go through and kind of make your polygon sizes different depending on where it, what it is that it's modifying. It'll bring edges closer together for peaks and it'll spread it out for flat areas. Um, this tight area would get a lot of edge flow going through there and I don't really want that, so we're gonna turn that off. 
I want to take my polygon count, um, this target polygon count, I'm going to put one. Um, what that, that's saying is just aiming for 1,000 polygons. And if we hit Z remesher, you see it gives us a much, much better result. So you can see it's going through and it's establishing loops, which is great. Okay, that's something that we want. Uh, and you can also see that uh, really, I mean, it's, 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 it's establishing loops around these holes. It's keeping our corners tight, okay? It's a really, really fantastic thing for us. So now what we can do, uh, we can keep this or we can modify it if we wanted to. I like to have my, uh, my five-pointed stars all in the same row, so it's something really easy. This is offset by one. So I'm just gonna go ahead and say collapse poly loop. And just collapse that down. So now my five-pointed stars, they're all in that same loop. Really simple. Um, now what I can do is I can come over, I can say masking, I'm going to say, I'm just going to say mask by features. Um, if you want to control this, you can, you just go over here and you select, you know, border groups, crease, you know, however you want to uh, control it. I'm just going to make sure I mask out areas that I don't want to have smoothed out. And now let's go ahead and say deformation, polish, and now we have nice, smooth, clean mesh. I might make my brush nice and big, maybe bring my Z intensity down. Okay, and just kind of do a little bit of relaxed smoothing through here. Okay, through here, I mean, we have some areas, since we deleted that extra edge loop, we're just going to go ahead and use our slide function with Z modeler, bring it over, bring this over. That way we're just kind of, you know, cozying out these, uh, these little spots. Okay, really simple really nice and now we have topology that we can we can work with uh, in order to make some uh, some shell and we have nice clean topology that will allow us to you know say for instance maybe i wanted to add uh, let's do this i'm going to say with the select lasso i'm going to come over here maybe select these two pieces uh, control a oh you know what one more control a uh, let's go ahead, control W right there. So what I'm going to do, let's grab this poly loop right here. I'm going to scale it together. Yeah, let's turn on local symmetry so that it scales in its spot. Kind of bring it out a little bit so that it's following that curvature on the top. And then we'll just kind of smooth out around it so that way we get the, uh, the nice even topology with a better arc. Even this out here at the bottom and uh, we should be good. So what I can do now is I can use my Z, uh, my Z modeler stuff to be able to go ahead and create extra detail. I can say extrude uh, polygroup island. I can just kind of pull that out um, I don't like having this, uh, say, delete uh, polygroup island here on the inside so that it's so that it remains single-sided. Okay, and so you see, like, we're able to go through and add some cool details really pretty quickly. Um, <clears throat> we can come through if we wanted to. We could say split point. Uh, say maybe we want to add a cool. Um, ridge running along through here. Maybe we just go through, we select these. Now, I mean, it looks, it looks really weird going like this. Now, don't get me wrong, it's, it's, it's really kind of interesting. Here, here's what we're going to do. We're going to say collapse edge. And by collapsing this down, we are able to start to create this trench that runs between the pieces. Uh, that's that's not where I wanted that to go. Let me see. Here we go. Okay. Oh, it looks like we got something happening here. Let's go do this. We'll do this. We'll do this. We'll do this. And we just collapse this down until it's. So you see, by by going through and collapsing it down, we're getting this straight line going across and maintains the width from span to span. Okay. So just you know, all all these. Oh shoot. 
we're going to go through and, and turn this to do nothing so that it doesn't bother our polygons. Oh, now here's a here's a spot that's going kind of differently than I'd like. So what I'm going to do is I want to think about the the flow of these polygons here. So if I go ahead and I collapse down to here, you see it's eliminating that extra cross there. Okay, so let's go ahead and we'll do it this this way instead. Yeah, you know, just being aware of if you see issues like that. Understanding what it is that's creating that issue really helps to be able to problem solve it. <clears throat> so that's good. So right now, we don't want to get this to come down to here to make that, that a, a crossed area right here. We want to go ahead and, and collapse that down that way so that we can get rid of that crossed uh, topology, make sure we don't get any weird triangles in there. We're going to get this, we're going to get a, a triangle here if we collapse it up that way. So we're going to bring this down to here. Yeah, little by little. So here we go. This up to here, this up to here. You can see now we've got this trench uh, that we can that we can build out. Let's see, let's go ahead and we'll say geometry crease. I want to uncrease all. Uh, but then what I can do is I can say crease PG to be able to make sure that I have creases just around these polygroup changes. Okay, so really important, really useful too. So what I'm going to do, let's go ahead and let's say extrude. We're going to say polygroup island. And there we go. Okay, so either we can do things like that, or we can go ahead and we can get rid of those. Um, one of the things I like to do too is I'll go ahead and I'll add like little spots like that for a, for a little light. And then I'll come in with my custom made insert, insert mesh primitives brush. Okay. And I will bring my brush to the right size and then control, click and drag. Well, not control, click and drag. Click and drag and then hit control and then it snaps to the size of the brush. So now it's like you have your own little LED light inside of this piece. So whatever it is that you go through and create, you have nice even topology that's going to play well when you smooth it out. Okay, this is, this is really, really nice. And if I wanted to, I could even go ahead and say... Let's, let's come over here to this piece and we'll say let's delete oh, delete a single poly just because we're using the uh, temporary poly group it acts like a single poly delete that now that we have this we can come over and we can say let's say extrude I'm going to say extrude all polygon oh let's extrude island because that'll be a little bit better We'll extrude that and we're going to extrude it inward. You'll see that it's like, <laughs> it's essentially looking kind of weird. Um, I want to fix this by going through either I can come over here with my, this is going to be easiest way, by the way, uh, flip faces island and you just flip it. Uh, or you can come down here to your, to your display properties and use flip, but you only want it. It's going to affect anything that's visible. So it's really important to keep that in mind. So now that we have this, I can come over here and I can say, well, let's, let's check this area. It looks like we have some interesting creasing issues. So we're going to say crease, 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 crease. So now it's going to hold that shape. And it's going to hold that shape. And that's looking great. Uh, let's get over here. Let's get this as well. Get these. Okay, now I don't like having creases be that sharp. So I can go through and I can say, um, let's bring my crease tolerance down to down to two or three or something like that. And then we can take our smooth subdivisions up, you know, just higher than that. So you get a nice little rounded bit to it to the edge. Or if you wanted to, you could also play with your Q grid. You can play with uh, other different features, the bevel, things like that, to be able to get that crease to look the way that you want it to. So yeah, it's a great, it's a great tool to play with, super flexible, and it's, it's applicable to a wide range of things from robots to vehicles to props to even characters. Uh, it leaves you some cleanup, 
but it's okay. And don't be afraid of cleanup. It's it's important to <laughs> to be able to clean it up when you need to. So hope you hope you enjoyed that tip, and I hope you can find good use for it in your personal production workflow. I'm Steven Anderson, and I'll see you around the summit. Uh oh, you're singing! You're singing the theme music now. We've got to that stage. We've gotten that stage, right? Uh -huh. Okay. So, um, by the way, Drust, we're going to add even something more to that tomorrow. Uh, just that's all I'm going to say. You want to? You guys want to be? I don't know how many. I guess I don't know how many times I have to say this. Do you guys want to miss? Don't miss 4:30 tomorrow with me and Drust for the Pixelogger presentation. I'm just saying. Just saying. All right, show my screen real quick because I someone was asking a distinct question. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is why the heck happened to my what happened to my timer, Drust? It's going down. You didn't pause it. Okay, good. I'm just making sure. Okay, so the unified question somebody was asking for in deformation. This is doing uh, two things. Okay, number one, it's going to move the mesh back to the center of the world. Oh wow, let me unmask this. I'm hiding my mask, right? So when I click this, it moves it back to the center of the world, but it also resizes the mesh physically inside of ZBrush. And what it's doing, it's using this preview window. So this model, when you're getting bigger and bigger and bigger and getting it away, right? This is this preview window here, right? You can see the models. There's the world right there, that little red, that red cross right there. That's the middle of the world. You see the models now nowhere near it. So when you hit deformation, unify, okay, and now I got to update this, right? You can see now it's back at the center, right? So this is what unify is doing. It's putting it back in the world and then it's resizing so it fits within this, okay? The other thing you guys can do, you can actually click on this preview window and do that. And then you can hit store and you'll see the model will actually turn. Like, I don't think, this is an older feature that I don't think you need as much anymore. While Why this is important, this is actually what's being used for UV mapping, when you come down here and you hit these, you hit this you you hit the uh, box UV, planar UV, spherical UV. It's looking at this, so that's why it's of relevance to you and importance to you. But that's all the unify is. Doing. Yeah, go to go to the uh, geometry menu too, and go to the size. And so the the unified button, when Paul clicks it, you'll see that the X Y Z size will be two, which is a radius of one. And that will be the size that the model is going to go down to. And at that scale, a lot of the functions inside ZBrush are going to work optimally. Um, there's also the function for to unify multiple subtools, and that's in the Scale Master plugin. And that will go through and take the entire bounding box of all your subtools and then unify it down to that size. And then it's going to put any excess scale that was on your mesh, and it's going to translate that to the export option. So you can then export your model back out. So that allows you to bring a large model into ZBrush. If you do this through import, it does it automatically. And it basically takes that model, it'll set the scale to be ZBrush optimal, and then it'll take all the rest of the size and make put it in the export area. So that way it correlates when you export it back out and that stale, scale holds. So Yeah, this one's very different. This unifies holding the actual value of the mesh's values. This unify doesn't. This is literally resizing your model. Yeah, so it re it'll resize your internal ZBrush size, the one in deformation, and the other one will try to keep your scale while doing that. Yeah, and then and it'll also allow you to do multiple subtools. And someone brought up the brush. Don't forget, you can make your brush size twenty times larger. You can also make it smaller too. So the one below it will also you can change that scale slider down lower. So if you have a really tiny model and that draw size is too big, you can also adjust it the opposite way as well. So you can work, you know, with a larger radius. Yeah. Right yeah, there. there's a magnifier right yep. down here, right? So you can go a lot smaller, right? Let's see, I can keep going smaller and smaller. Like, look how tiny I am. Yeah, and that will give you a larger range to play with as you're doing it. So there, you can definitely change that whole size of your brush. It's your world, man. I'm just here trying to live it. And then you can show the dynamic option, too, since you're talking about brushes. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so Do you want me to talk you through it? So, right here. <laughs> yeah. So dynamic, if it's on, it's going to hold the brush scale based on the size of your mesh. So when you move the model in and out, that brush scale is always going to be the same. If you turn dynamic off, it's now going to do based on your canvas. So you have the ability to control your brush size based on the screen or control the brush size based on the model. 
There you go. And then you can have it be remembered with this if you guys want certain brushes to work certain ways and things like that. Some people like dynamic on, some people like dynamic off. I like it on, doesn't bother me, right? So, but you can also store it. That's what this button is. And this yeah, and there's, the there's, if you do an Ask ZBrush video uh, search for dynamic, there's some videos on it too. There you go. Uh, I, uh, I, and then as far as the transpose, I meant, what was the part of that tie uh, with the transpose? Someone's asking about the transpose. I'm assuming, was it the flattening ability? Was it this? I, I miss it because I was I'm talking and texting. I can't remember. I don't remember in the video what he did. What you mean by transpose flattening? I'm assuming maybe that's what for you Nelson. Mean. Yeah, Nelson ties. You can. Do yeah, the only, he did the slice to flatten areas too. You can do that. The flatten. And that'll work with the gizmo too. Yeah. So whatever one you got, whatever whatever one you want. You, just gotta, you can do this, right? You can do this. Right, and then you can clip it as well. This is the control key clipping it, right? And then this is the alt. No, whoops, whoops, whoops. This is the alt key, right? And then you have just normal wee 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 wee, right? We have destroyed my gorilla, like we didn't know what he was. Okay, so I know my man, the red beard, was in here. We're gonna move on to the next video, Matt Tharop. And his video, The Big the Red Beard. Well, hi, I'm the Red Beard Matt Thorup, and I've been a ZBrush user for I think about 10 years now, nine of those prof as a professional character artist. And I'm currently a senior character artist at Epic Games. I also teach ZBrush courses. You can find my courses at redbeard.gumroad.com. And what I wanted to talk about today are some of the quick tips that I find myself in. So ZBrush is such a fluid and dynamic application that I've found over the years that, you know, especially now as I, my life is completely different from when I started off. Um, I have, you know, I had from zero children to now four children and the free time that I have to just play around and sculpt is getting more and more tight. So I've had to find ways to speed up some of the workflow that I've been doing. And so this is one of the things that I've been experimenting with as of late that's really, you know, really increased my workflow and just getting a little bit more gestural, organic expressions out of some of my characters with just a little bit more speed. Okay, so let's jump in. And so this is actually a hand that I made in one of my courses. Um, so if you followed along in the courses, this is roughly one of the outputs that you would have on that. But this was really good to help me bridge the gap on some of my T poses. But when I wanted to get a little expression, I wanted to go that extra step. And, and ZBrush has got this great, you know, it's not a new it's not a new thing, but it's something that I've found that I've been able to use this in many different ways than I thought I would initially, especially for block-ins. So what I want to do is make poses out of this hand that I could use in several different ways. So let's go ahead and just pose this really quick. And we'll do, you know, a fairly simple pose out of this hand. This is more just for example. So let's just grab this index finger here. I'm going to do a blur. And then with this 3D gizmo, I'm just going to point it right where the knuckle is. So if the knuckle is going to be here, I'm going to hold Alt, click, and I'm going to drag this down. And the 3D gizmo will actually follow along the axis where I'm pointing if I'm dragging. So this is a cool little tip, just holding Alt and dragging, click and dragging. So I'm going to have it point down the finger and then just holding Alt. I'm going to simply change the orientation a little bit and then move the pivot point to be actually where the knuckle would, would move. I'm going to move that just a little bit and then slowly start positioning this finger just a little bit. And I'm using mask lasso for this. 
and just getting more of I'm just getting more of a so I want something a little bit more gestural out of this so I'm just placing this this 3D gizmo right where the joint would be and I'm just doing you know little little posings little poses and I kind of want to have like a hmm kind of thing oh, this is the that's the technical term for this hand poses of mirror and these ones I actually kind of want together I'm gonna do a kind of a broad stroke pose with this you see just holding clicking alt and dragging down I'm gonna able to position that and then holding it alt again I can just move the placement of that gizmo into the hand a little bit more And I'll just pose the rest of this hand. Okay, so now I've done my rough pose, and I can do some things like I'll go back and I'll inflate some areas that kind of get squished, you know, when the transpo when you're, you know, moving things around. But it actually creates really nice pinch points by just using the inflate button and just, or not the inflate button, but the inflate brush, and just inflating some of these areas. You know, and this is the great thing about this is like I've already gone through the hard work of, you know, sculpting this hand out. And so if I go back up in subdivisions, I really don't have to sculpt too much on it. I mean, I'm sure there's a couple folds and wrinkles that I would put in there, but not too much. Um, the one thing I want to make sure is I want to make sure I keep that standard hand and it looks like I, I didn't duplicate it. So I'll just duplicate it now. And go back in my history to the point where I'm, it's, you know, it's back to to not moving. Good. So I have this hand, and I've already gone through and made several other sets of hands. So this hand, my casual hand, another casual hand. Kind of a funky hand that's ugh, my whatever kind of hand, my fist hand, and then my holding something type of hand. Um, so I've got, you know, seven hands here or so. So I just want to make sure I've got these named. This will be hand zero one. I have that. And then my base hand. So now what I want to do is create a insert multi mesh brush, which is out of all of these hands that I've made. Which is this is going to be really easy. The first thing I want to do though is make sure I have the orientation correct. So first thing I want to do is just go to my my base hand, 
which is this one. And then what I am going to do is make sure, because when you click and draw it on, it's going to happen like perspective wise. So this will be, this will, this will be the point that it will make contact with whatever surface is away from you. So that's knowing that I'm going to orient this. So it's pointing, the fingers are pointing towards me. Hit B, create insert multi brush. Then it will go through, make my brush, which it just did. Now let's go ahead and test this out um, just on a sphere here. See if it works. Oops. I got to make polymers 3D and I'm going to click and drag. Ah! Isn't that great? Look, I just made my gun. Then the cool thing is I can actually switch through, if I hit W, all the different hands that I have. So now I have my hands. So let's go ahead. Now I want to add this to my block-ins that I want a little bit more life out of. Okay, so now let's say we want to add a little bit of life to this block-in, but um, first what we want to do is just make sure that we can add these hands. Um, these arms, I'm, I'm going to add them to, they don't have any subdivisions, so it'll be quite easy. Click on my hands, and what I'm going to do is just click on this point here, and start clicking, and oh, make sure symmetry is on, click and dragging them out. Now, I could play around with a few different settings here to make it a little bit more seamless. Let's do that. Let's just make my brush depth go in a little bit deeper, just a tiny bit. So that way they'll just be a little bit more flush. So I'm going to quickly draw them, and then I need to position them. This is why this 3D gizmo is awesome, because I can just quickly get the placement. And I'm not going to, you know, worry too much about the exact position and scale just yet. It's like, this is all meant to be block-in. But it will help give me a sense of, like, proportion and life, but let's say, okay, this is cool, but he's still feeling really stiff. I just want to bring a little bit of life to him. So I'm just going to hit my W again to go back to my 3D gizmo, and let's just circulate some of these hands. Hmm, okay. That's fun. Another casual hand. Great. Ooh, these ones are funky. Nice. Oh, and because... The way that this brush works, it kind of sizes things to a bounding box and because these are a little bit different. But anyways, I can quickly see, okay, good. So what if what I want is actually, let's have, I don't want them both to be the same. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mask off, go to symmetry, mask off that hand. And now I want to switch this hand to maybe the fist. You know, that's a little bit big obviously so I'm just going to scale it manually position it so now for a block in that's like actually giving me a lot of information um, yeah I, I think the hands are probably small so what I would do is because I've built them with good topology, I can split hidden, and I can actually just re-make my subdivisions. So now I have, I still have a high and a low of each of these hands, and so I can quickly, you know, mask off these things. and I can scale them uniformly to like adjust. So if the wrist is you know closer to the right size, but now the hand's gonna be more the right size too. And all, all of a sudden, just in a T-pose, like there's nothing 
really that's been done and he already has a lot more attitude and so now what i would do is i would actually go into like a quick block pose and i would use these hands as a base and then start sculpting on top of those when i'm really posing a character and giving it a lot more life but having this brush and just knowing that i've already put in the work to make this brush work um, speeds up my workflow a ton so i hope that this has been helpful to you. Uh, learn more about hands. And if you found this helpful, then I have many more courses at redbeard.gumroad.com. And always feel free to follow me on Instagram at the underscore redbeard. Happy sculpting. Can't get the music out of my head now. Okay. You're still, you're still humming it, aren't you? Still humming it. All right, that was the last video, people, for tonight. But I want to show one more thing that might be handy, for, especially for opposing hands. Okay, so that's going to be the last video for tonight. We've got more tomorrow. And don't worry, we still got prizes to give away, so don't go anywhere. All right, that was a great one by the Red Beard himself, Mr. Matt Thoreau. Okay, so as far as posing hands, he was showing some great stuff. The old school tool here, though, right? The transpose line, which some people are still really using instead of the gizmo. So one thing that I want to highlight about this is when you guys hold the control key and click and start dragging with this. All right, we're going to get your screen. Hold on. Oh, Hold on. Jump in the gun. What the Jump in the gun. Jump in the gun. Okay, so again, when you hold control and click, you're masking based upon the topology. Right? So you guys can do this with either one. The gizmo right, also has it. Okay, and so just like Matt was talking about the gizmo snapping, so does this, right? So if I mask off something like this, I can snap, snap, right? And I've got this transpose line. So I like doing the very small tertiary finger movements, especially with this. This is, again, this is a personal preference that I just like because there's a hidden little gem that I find in here that I like. So I use this as like a bone. I think about this thing as like a bone, like that's the bone of the hand. So I quickly just take a look, make sure I'm sitting somewhat in the middle of that hand for myself. And then I come down here. And instead of doing this, wee, right? If I switch to rotation, so let me undo and switch to actual rotation up here on the top by hitting the R key, rotation, right? You can do this, wee, right? It's perfect. My hand does that, doesn't yours? Okay, so really, obviously, the better way to do that is this. Look at that. That's so much better. So what I'm doing is actually, instead of rotating like this, where ZBrush is, this is the pivot point that is rotating around. So you guys can see that, right? So you see, wee, and you gotta do the wees. It's mandatory, okay? You can see it's using this as a pivot point. What I'm gonna tell ZBrush to do is do the alternate, do the opposite, and use the, the circle I'm clicking on as the pivot point. So to do that, the opposite key always in ZBrush, besides me and Joseph, okay, is the Alt key. So you got to click on the Alt key and then now click on the circle and there you go. And because uh, Louie's been here, Bob's your uncle, okay? There you go. That is me. That's how I kind of like to do that because then now I just continue this process, right? I can just come down here, right? And I'm going to say, okay, right about there. And then now, boom, like that. And then I can even rotate it now a little bit more like that. See, I like me personally. Everyone's got personal preferences, right? I like doing that. I like using that alt key for alternate ways to be using the transpose line. So that's just the thing I wanted to cover on top of that because I think Matt did a great job of really talking about that. And of course, you can use layers to have all that once. Okay. So there you go. Boom, 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 boom. Right. So that's it. That's it for the segments today. Right. So what we got to go over is tomorrow, right? Don't forget about tomorrow. Can you show my screen again, please? Taking it down. Thank you. Right? So tomorrow, we got the sculpt off announcements. Mm -hmm. Okay? So for those of you that are watching that we're in it, okay? You should be here tomorrow at 4 p.m. Los Angeles time. 4 p.m. Los Angeles time. Okay? And let's not forget, I we've been dropping hints to you guys all these days. <laughs> about our presentation tomorrow at 4.30. So tell your friends, tell your aunts, tell your uncles, tell tell the, flea, the fleas on your pets. Just let them all know. 
Come watch the Pixelogic presentation tomorrow. Get everyone involved. Be a happy family. Put us on the big screen. You'll put a smile on our face, okay? So don't miss out on that. And then we're going to go right into some more ZBrush top tips. We got more videos to show from artists, okay? And we've got, obviously, me and Joseph's rants being on top of that. Always. Don't forget, tomorrow we've got more exciting stuff. We got Will Huff that's going to be showing all of his robotics and how he uses ZBrush. And we've got another toy presentation from Jack's Toys with Ellie, right? Ellie Carmelli. So <clears throat> definitely don't want to miss tomorrow. It's another really fun day. Tomorrow's the last day of the summit, okay? So get in there 4 p.m. Los Angeles time. And don't forget, you can get reminders on YouTube, right? You scroll down here to our YouTube channel and you can get a reminder right there for day three. Just click on day three and you can set yourself a reminder. And then, of course, on our calendar itself, on ZBrush Live, you can get reminders here. Okay, so don't forget about things like that to be able to see the schedule, see what's coming up, right? You can see tomorrow's schedules right here. All right, and then you guys can see this. the streams are happening. You know, Spicer, Ashley, you know, there's people streaming on the, there's Anna, who we watched one of her videos today. There's Shane Olson, right? There's Pablo, we watched one of his, his videos. Thomas is going to be tomorrow. Right. So definitely don't want to miss this out. All right. The last thing is, guys, if I, I don't know if we've been doing a good job to get you excited to get into the ZBrush world. And if you're not, I definitely need to retire and go into another field. So <laughs> if you don't have ZBrush, I, this is I, this should motivate you want to get in and get your get your pens out and get going. Right. So we having a, a summit special. 20% off the perpetual license. Guys, we don't do sales often because we give free upgrades, right? Mm -hmm. So you have till tomorrow. That's it. Take advantage of this sale. If you got a friend, you got a colleague that's been wanting to get ZBrush, here you go. Okay, here's the time to do it. You're getting 20% off a perpetual license. You're also getting 20% off your first payment for the subscription of the six-month subscription or on the month-to-month -month subscription. It's only the first billing period that you're going to get that 20% off. Okay, and then Core is also got a, a show special. So we're giving 20% off the perpetual license of Core, or you can just jump right in for $9.95 per month right now. And then those, again, that are in Core, you have already, if you're already a Core user, we give you $100 off for upgrading to the full version. We're throwing another $100 at you. We convinced Joseph to allow it. We twisted his arm. He said, Let's do it. <laughs> so you're getting $200 off right? To upgrade from core to the full version. Don't worry. You're not going to lose that core. So if you want to have that core, if you're like Joseph has 15 computers, you now have got more licenses. You've got some licenses of core and you got some licenses of the regular ZBrush. Okay. So don't forget that. Okay. So there you go. There's the options. And then Joseph and Daisuke's little baby ZBrush core mini. This is a, this is a, a great way to get into ZBrush. It's free, free, right? Way to get in for that. Joseph, do you want to add anything while I pull up any of the, the pull up the prize giveaway stuff here? Mm -hmm. No, I'm just putting the uh, presentation times in the chat as well that Paul was showing. Yeah, let's not forget, people. It's Pacific Standard Time. Tomorrow's a late one. Tomorrow, mm -hmm. we're going to have to give Joseph some coffee in the veins. Some coffee snacks. in the veins for drugs. All right, so let's give away some stuff. Let's see, today is Monday. <laughs> so ZBrush Core Mini is always free. ZBrush Core Mini is the free version, and then we have ZBrush Core, and then the professional version. So there's yeah, three get, SKUs of a ZBrush. Yeah, you cannot get one version of ZBrush Core Mini, but you can get two version, a two for two sale. I don't know what you're talking about right now. Don't just buy one, get two for the same <laughs> price. Two for two sale. What are you talking about? They're free. Forget it. We've been here for eight hours. <laughs> get my jokes anymore. Fine. All right, let's do this. All right, you got three away. minutes according to your, your timer behind you. you. Better hurry this up. Okay, because we haven't reset that timer three times or twice today already. Okay, so Keyshot Pro, the $2,000 version with the Keyshot Bridge. Here you people go. This is what we're talking about. Giving away some stuff. Thank you again to all of our sponsors being involved. They're all been here. I've seen some of them coming in and out. This has been a lot, a lot of fun, fun, fun. 
So let me give this one away. Let me draw my winner. Um, all right. And let's see who we got here. Mm, I like this one. Wait. Uh, da, 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 da. Hold on. I'm getting it over here. Hold on. I'm sorry. I'm going to put it in the chat. Okay. Here's who we're looking for. Oh, it bounces on me all the time. Cat. Catuzard? Catuzard? I'm always trying to figure out how they really want it to be spaced out. Cat? Is it cat? And then Tozard? Or Tozard. Yeah. Tozard. There you go. Cat Tozard. You are the lucky winner of a P Shot Pro with the bridge. That is a Oh, a 21, over a $2,100 value right there. Oh, you're here. You're welcome. Thank you for being part of the show and being involved. Look at that. Not only do you guys get just an insane amount of information, but you also won something. I'm telling you. You know, it's the gift. It's Joseph. He just keeps giving to you guys. It's really, <laughs> really good stuff. Okay. Let's see what we got here. Let's get another one going. Hold on. I'm, I got to get I got to get it over there. Give me a minute. Give me a minute. Here we go. Another space mouse, which tomorrow. Space mouse. Go ahead. Do it. No, it's it Don. Did it once. Tomorrow is going to probably be a ton of it, though. It yeah, tomorrow we'll be showing it in action. Yeah. Because the next version of ZBrush will support this. Okay. Here's our winner. Here is our winner. This is who we're looking for. Once again, we're looking for GG Concepts. GG Concepts. That's who we're looking for. Can I get a GG? Can I get a GG Concepts? Yeah, that's who I want to see right now. Get in that chat. Why are you here? Why are you not here for like eight hours? We've all been here. Come on, get up in here. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I'm sorry. You just kept going. going. It, it, it's because of that timer. You just didn't stop it. If you would have stopped it, it would have been fine. You just kept adding time. I'll be honest. We're to blame for the extra time. You know what? I got to thank the, the boys in the booth, the rest of the crew at Pixelogic. Also, it's not just me and Joseph, right? There's a lot of people involved in this in the back, in the back behind the curtain with Oz. You know, they're all staying extra too to go back. We were supposed to be over, what, two hours ago? Yeah, two hours ago. Sorry. <laughs> I warned though, I did warn that this is going to take longer than expected. That's it. That's all the prizes I got. That's it. I don't have any more prizes for today. Tomorrow we do it all over again, wash and repeat. But don't forget, tomorrow's stream starts way later, starts at 4 p.m. And you have to re register for prizes tomorrow. We're going to wipe the board of these people that registered today. We're doing all new registries tomorrow. You got to be here, you got to be involved. I got to see you. You guys, you don't think I'm remembering things? Oh, I remember people that are in the chat. Okay. <laughs> All right. Look, look at this timing. Double zeros. Look at that. Perfect. Perfect. You couldn't have planned that better. It's like you added time or something. Where do you register? I don't know. Right there. There you go. Giveaways. I'm just kidding. There's your link right there. There's your link for when you register. But don't do it now because we're going to be wiping it. You got to come tomorrow and then register. We don't, and don't register until we start streaming and we're on camera. There's no point in registering until we're on camera, people. Pointless. Don't do it. Okay. Right. So, got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Great. Anything, last parting words from you, Mr. Joseph, that Remember I. Remember to get your battery out of the remote so you can get into your car. Got it. I'm ready. There you go. That's, that's the last go. words I got. Ready to go. All right, everybody. I'm Paul Gabry. You got Joseph dressed over here. Thank you for watching. What is it? Day three. Day four tomorrow. The last day. Tell it. Don't miss our presentation tomorrow. Dan. <laughs> you, also, you also promised wearing something different. You, you've said you've done something different every day. So remember, uh, you got to do something tomorrow, too. I got something. I'm not saying I'm going to wear it the whole day, but I got something for tomorrow. But I'm not wearing it the whole day. It's not happening. Okay, I'm not going that far down the rabbit hole. Okay, but I will change it up for a second. Tomorrow the stream starts at 4 p.m. 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, Los Angeles time. If you're not sure, okay. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye bye.
Hello everyone, this is Michael from Pixelogic's social media and marketing team. I want to introduce to you a small fun segment we'll be showing you throughout the ZBrush Summit this year called 2020 ZBrush Highlights. Throughout the day, we'll be showing you some of the most popular ZBrush creations from throughout the year from ZBrush Central, our Instagram, Facebook, and more, while telling you a little bit about the piece, the artists behind it, and where you can see more of that artist's work. Be sure to check out the link in each 2020 ZBrush highlight video to visit our exclusive ZBrush Central thread cataloging all of this year's highlights. Enjoy the summit! The Form 3 has helped bring people's wildest dreams to reality. But sometimes you need to dream bigger. We designed the Form 3L to bring the biggest dreams to life, so we wanted to put it to the ultimate test. Could we use the 3L to print our flagship 3D printer? Introducing Form 3L, so you can print a dream within a dream maker.